This is the tenth book in the How to Train Your Dragon series. There are three to four CDs in each book. I will release one audiobook at a time to build up suspension. Subscribe and turn on notifications to be notified when the next audiobook will be ready. Tune into them next time. Side note. I do not claim by any right to say that I published them. But give full credit to Cressida Cowell and David Tennant. I hope you enjoy the wonders of these books that I have enjoyed over the years. How to Seize a Dragon's Jewel by Cressida Cowell Read by David Tennant Any relationship to any historical fact whatsoever is entirely coincidental. You have been warned. About Hiccup Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III was an awesome sword fighter, a dragon whisperer, and the greatest Viking hero that ever lived. But Hiccup's memoirs look back to when he was a very ordinary boy and finding it hard to be a hero. Prologue by Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III Courage You will need courage to listen on. This is not the last of my memoirs, but the story has become darker now. So dark that I need all my courage just to write it. I'm looking back to that time when I was 13 years old and an outcast. The red rage had taken over all the dragons in the land and the dragon rebellion had begun. The great war between humans and dragons had started. The Vikings were being led by that dreadful villain Alvin the Treacherous, guided by his even more dreadful mother, the witch Excelinor. The Dragon Furious was in charge of the Dragon Forces, and his aim was nothing less than the extinction of the entire Viking race. And the Dragon Furious was winning. The Vikings' only hope was for a new king to be crowned King of the Wilder West, a king who, according to ancient prophecy, would have all ten of the king's lost things. Nine of the lost things had been found. Only the Dragon Jewel, the most important, remained lost. The Dragon Jewel had the power to destroy dragons forever. It was the only thing the Dragon Furious was afraid of. Alvin the Treacherous had eight of the lost things. I, Hiccup the Outcast, had only one, my little hunting dragon called Toothless. But I also had Grimbeard the Ghastly's map that showed the way to where the jewel was hidden. And so I, enemy traitor number one, was being hunted through the archipelago by both humans and dragons alike. A proclamation calling for my death hung on hundreds of burnt-out tree trunks. My thirteen-year-old self was all alone, apart from three dragon companions. My tribe had been driven out of their home on Berk by the Dragon Rebellion. My father Stoic and my friend Fishlegs had been turned into slaves and sent to the Amber Slave Lands. You see why I call these my darkest times. I had to have hope that things would turn out well in the end, that the small things and the happiness of peacetime would return. I had to remember this through the teeth and fire and talons. I had to have courage. The Prophecy of the King's Lost Things 
The dragon time is coming, and only a king can save you now. The king shall be the champion of champions. You shall know the king by the king's lost things. A fang-free dragon, my second best sword, my Roman shield, an arrow from the land that does not exist, the heart stone, the key that opens all locks, the ticking thing, the throne, the crown, and last and best of all the ten, the dragon jewel shall save all men. One, the warrior. One cold moonlit winter night in the forgotten forest, a gigantic warrior sat high and still in a treetop like an angel of death. The warrior was out hunting. It had been in the trail of the outcast for many days. It was intending to kill this outcast, this enemy of the Wilder West. Its metal visor was down. Its sword was ready in its hand, looking for the kill. It was still as a statue only its bright blue eyes looking down on the path winding through the woods far below it. In those times, the humans and the dragons were at war, so it was strictly forbidden for humans to ride dragons anymore. But surprisingly, this warrior was seated on the back of a dragon, lying lazy but alert along the length of the tree branch. The dragon was an air dragon of the purest silver, very, very rare and very, very dangerous. It, too, looked down at the snowy path below, only its pointed tail moving slowly and rhythmically like the tail of a cat. All was quiet. After a little time, a noise was heard. The warrior had closed its eyes, but now, buried in the black visor, they snapped open. Way in the distance, a human was moving along the path through the woods. The human was the outcast, the enemy, exactly the person that the warrior was waiting to kill. The warrior gave a grunt of satisfaction and sat up a little straighter. When you looked at this outcast close up, which the warrior couldn't, not from that distance, he was not at all what you might imagine an outcast to be. He was very different from the clever, confident figure he cut when he was releasing dragons from right under the busy thug's noses two hours ago. He was a young boy, called Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III, about thirteen years old, very skinny and ordinary looking, with the dark purple mark that the humans called the slave mark, a tattoo in the shape of a dragon burning blue-black on one side of his forehead. Hiccup had been sleeping rough for six months now, in treetops or in caves, and all he'd had to eat in that time was berries and nuts and food stolen fearfully from sleeping Viking villages. Risking his life day after day, undoing the dragon traps the Vikings had been setting for the dragons and constantly running away from the humans and the terrifying hunting dragons of the Dragon Rebellion had really taken it out of him. So there, in the moonlight, Hiccup looked like what he was. Afraid. Alone. He was dressed from head to toe in a dragon-skin fire suit, ripped and tattered by brambles and branches. He was muddy and dirty the strain and fear of being hunted showing in the stiffness of his body and the anxious tick in his eyes. He had a black eye and he was limping, as was the riding dragon trotting along beside him. The windwalker was exhausted, which was why Hiccup wasn't riding him and puffing out great wafts of tired steam. Around Hiccup's head fluttered two tiny hunting dragons, one very old one, the warden's fang, with wings all tattered and torn, one very young one, toothless, a bright grass green, the naughtiest, most fidgety dragon in the whole of the archipelago. They were talking together in soft whispers in dragonese. I'm telling you, Hiccup, the warden's fang was saying in a light, quavery voice, your quest is very simple. You have to find the dragon jewel, go to tomorrow, get yourself crowned king of the Wild West, and then the tomorrow men will tell you the secret of the dragon jewel, and you can stop this stupid war and save the dragons and the humans from extinction. Did you uh, see me? squeaked Toothless. Did you see me dive bomb in that visi thug? Wasn't I clever? Wasn't I brilliant? Wasn't I uh, marvellous? Yes, you were marvellous, Toothless, replied Hiccup. But can you keep it down a bit? 
The forest dragons are hibernating at the moment and we don't want to wake them up. He rubbed the back of his neck and sighed because he was missing everybody so much. Being an outcast was very, very lonely. The thing is, Wodensfang, nothing is ever that simple. People actually have to want me, a slave, an outcast, to be king. You have to have actual human followers, not just you three. And I have to have all of the lost things. And Alvin the Treacherous already has eight of them. You've got me, me, squeaked Toothless, landing on Hiccup's arm. I'm one of the lost things, and I'm the best one. Manners, reminded the Windwalker gently. Don't forget, Toothless, no boasting. OK, said Toothless, his brow furrowing. Toothless is the best one, please. The map says that the jewel is in the amber slave lands, said the wooden swang. Why aren't we there? Because, instinctively, I don't think the jewel is there, replied Hiccup. That is because your heart is not yet in that quest, replied the wooden swang, solemnly. At the moment, you are on a different quest. The quest to find your friend Fishlegs, admit it. That's why we're here. It was why they were there. The hooligans were supposed to have hidden out in this country after Berk was burnt out by the Dragon Furious. OK, admitted Hiccup. I am worried about Fishlegs. He's always sort of relied on me. Fishlegs was a runt who had been washed up on the beaches of Berk 13 years ago. He had no parents, so it was Hiccup who looked after him and stopped the other hooligans from bullying him. And this is getting in the way of your true quest interrupted the wooden swang, which is to find the dragon jewel. Not entirely, said Hiccup, because I still don't think the jewel is in the Amber Slave Lands, whatever the map says. They had walked such a long way now that they stopped right underneath the tree the warrior was sitting in. Hiccup got out the map. The map was quite complicated. It showed a nice distinct picture of the Amber Slave Lands, and there was a maze of mirrors and prison dark heart, and there, in the heart of it, was the dragon jewel, helpfully pointed out with a large arrow in capital letters. The three dragons peered at it over Hiccup's shoulder. So too did the warrior and the dragon perched high, invisible and menacing in the treetops above Hiccup. Look, said Hiccup, pointing to a large fish at the top of the map, a fish so long that it took up the entire space from left to right. What is that? Trust seafaring creatures like dragons and vikings to know their fish species. It's a member of the herring family, said the warden's fang. And what colour is it? Red, red, said Toothless proudly. Ask me another one. I know all the colours, he confided to the windwalker. You see, said Hiccup, in the human world, a red herring is another way of saying a false start or a wrong direction. My knowledge of Grimbeard the Ghastly is that he was a tricky man, and this is his way of saying that the jewel isn't in the slave lands at all. What do you think, warden's fang? The Wodensfang was the only one of the four of them old enough to have actually met Grimbeard the Ghastly more than one hundred years before. So now he looked back through time to remember that dreadful man, and what that look told him was that Grimbeard was the trickiest trickster since the great trickster god Loki put his particularly tricky hat on. Hmm, said the Wodensfang. It did seem exactly the sort of thing that Grimbeard would do. And suddenly, a maze of mirrors seemed an unlikely thing to be finding in prison Darkheart, which was probably furnished on the basic side. Then the Wodensfang raised a cunning eyebrow. But it could be a double bluff. So, said the gentle voice of the raggedy Windwalker, if the dragon jewel isn't in the amber slave lands, where then exactly is it? That's why it's not so simple said Hiccup, waving wide his arms. It could be anywhere. At that moment, there was a definite rustle from above as the hidden warrior and the hidden dragon craned forward with interest to see what was written on Hiccup's map. The effect on the four companions below was immediate. The warden's fang shot up a foot in the air, its tattered ears turning electrically rigid and purply red and pointing first west, then south, then east, then north. Danger! squeaked the warden's fang in the loudest whisper he could whisper. Danger! Quick! Hiccup, get your helmet on! Oh, no, guys, really? It's far too big. I find it easier to fight without it. But the dragons ganged up on him, three to one. You need it! whispered the warden's fang. 
Remember back on Danger Brute Island when you nearly lost your air, and that poison dart that just missed you when you were undoing the Visithug dragon traps? And what about the head-lopping incident with the head-loppers over in nowhere? The Windwalker padded anxiously back and forward. A helmet wouldn't save you from having your head lopped off, argued Hiccup. The Warden's Fang is right, agreed Toothless, who was agreeing with the Warden's Fang more and more these days. Squeaking, the Warden's Fang and Toothless lifted the detested helmet from the back of Hiccup's rucksack and tenderly jammed it on his head with their wings. It was an old Visithug one they had burgled a couple of weeks ago, and it was a very bad fit. It's really uncomfortable, grumbled Hiccup. Plus the big feather thingy makes me very memorable. I'm supposed to be undercover, you know. An outcast has to melt into the background. Shh! The Warden's Fang put his wing to his lips. I told you, said the Warden's Fang. I've had this really bad feeling that the Dragon Furious has sent some new dragon to assassinate you. Something really terrifying. Yes, Warden's Fang, said Hiccup. You're always getting these feelings, but listen, it's all gone quiet. That's the thing about this new dragon, though, whispered the Warden's Fang. It's almost undetectable. It's one of those tracker dragons. The four companions stretched their ears out into the white, muffled world of trees and snow. Nothing. Maybe it was a false alarm, whispered Toothless. Up in the treetops, the warrior and the dragon sat still as stones. Not a leaf moved. The forest seemed to hold its breath. And then... With a scream as loud as a charging baboon, the warrior, hidden in the tree canopy above, exploded into action, erupting from the foliage and descending from above in a shower of leaves and broken branches like some swooping noble nightmare of revenge. Spow! Zing! If Hiccup and the Windwalker hadn't been living on their nerves for the past year, they might not have dodged backward so fast, and Hiccup would have been deader than a dodo, for the zing that zinged past Hiccup's nose was the zing of an arrow that missed him by inches and buried itself in a tree trunk a couple of feet behind him. The dodging backwards brought his visor clanging down, where it jammed tight shut. Uh-oh, thought Hiccup, who was an intelligent boy. This person wants to kill me. Three more arrows came raining harmlessly off the detestable helmet. Thanks, guys. The helmet was a good call, thought Hiccup, as he jumped on board the Windwalker, who shot off through the trees. And then he couldn't believe his eyes when he looked over his shoulder and saw the dragon that was following him. Oh, for Thor's sake. You couldn't mistake that particular dragon. It was the Silver Phantom. Even though it was the dead of night, every silver scale was lit up and shone brighter than was strictly possible in real life. The silver phantom seemed to give off its own light, like the moon. Its scream was so high and so loud that it felt as if it was setting fire to your ears. And as it screamed, it poured out a jet of bright blue flame that blasted the trees in front of it, burning their leaves as bright as green stars before dropping to the ground in powdery black smithereens. The Silver Phantom was absolutely unmistakable. It was unique. It also just so happened to be the riding dragon that belonged to Hiccup's mother. Which meant that the warrior, currently reloading her north bow and taking careful aim at Hiccup while guiding the screaming phantom by the strength of her warrior knees alone, that particular warrior was in fact Hiccup's own mother, Valhalla Rama. Silver Phantoms Statistics Fear Factor Score 10 Attack Score 10 Speed Score 10 Size Score 10 Disobedience Score 10 Total Score 50 Some of the air dragons fly at such high altitudes that humans have never even seen them. A Silver Phantom is one such dragon. Glimpsed very rarely at astonishingly high distances, these sorts of dragons are sometimes known as ghosts, and some people doubt they exist at all. 2. A few little communication problems. Stop! Mother! It's me! Hiccup! shouted Hiccup. 
But of course, the visor on the beastly helmet was down, and so it came out more like... <coughs> Hiccup grabbed at the visor and tried to yank it up, but it was jammed absolutely tight shut. It would not budge. Oh, for Thor's sake. This was not a good situation. Apart from anything else, Valhalarama was a truly magnificent hero. One of the very, very best. So they were in big trouble if he couldn't tell her who he was. The thing was, Valhalarama was away questing a lot. Hiccup was never quite sure what she was questing for, exactly, but his father, Stoic the Vast, always assured him it was very important. As a result, Hiccup hadn't seen her in a very long while, perhaps for as long as two years now, so she very well might not be aware that her only son was the one who was now known as the outcast and the enemy of the Wilder West, let alone that Stoic was now a slave, and Hiccup had the slave mark himself, and a whole load of other things Hiccup was hoping to explain to her gently, in a quiet moment. He had hoped that if he ever did get a chance to explain the whole thing to her about how what he was really trying to do was save all the dragons from extinction, she might be one of the few people who would actually be on his side. Hiccup had a hopeful nature. Because Valhalarama loved dragons. Hiccup knew she loved dragons. At least he thought he knew she loved dragons. It suddenly occurred to Hiccup in that moment as they were screaming through the forest at breakneck speed in the dead of night with his mother shooting arrows at him almost continuously that perhaps he did not really know his mother all that well. She had been away questing a lot. The Wodensvang and Toothless were both exceptionally speedy, so they were flying not at their top speed, but on either side of Hiccup's head, like twin dragonly guardian angels. You have to admit, he is a marvellous warrior, quavered the Wodensvang admiringly. How big do you think he is? Six foot three? Six foot four? I don't think I've seen a better warrior since Squidshanks the Frightening. It was a bit before your time, maybe six hundred years ago. She's a she, not a he, Hiccup shouted back. But through the helmet it just sounded like, mm, mm, mm. We've all been in this situation. Well, maybe not precisely in this situation, but we all know what it's like to have something important to say to a loved one, but something seems to be getting in the way. The truth is... It is often difficult to explain things to a parent, and most definitely it is particularly difficult when your mother is hunting you at top speed through a dark forest under the impression that you are the enemy of the Wilder West. The Windwalker had grown into an exceptionally fast dragon, and it was smaller than the Phantom, so its more manoeuvrable size meant it could just about keep ahead, flicking through the maze of trees. But still the Phantom was gaining. He's going to catch us if we stay down here, said Toothless. Why don't we go up? Over the past three months, they had often eluded dragon pursuers by climbing up into the higher air, too high for other dragons to follow. Most dragons prefer shallow air, the air nearest the ground. Very few can operate in the higher atmosphere. Apart from the silver phantom. Hiccup wanted to tell them that this would be pointless. The Phantom was an air dragon. They were among the best flyers in the dragon world, and they flew the fastest and the highest. Valhalarama had trained herself not to pass out, but of course he couldn't tell them that because of the jammed helmet. The Windwalker slightly mistimed a slalom, swayed crazily, and the pursuing Phantom caught him by the leg, but didn't quite get a good hold, so the Windwalker wriggled desperately out of the grip and shot upwards in a blind panic. Oh no, breathed Hiccup, desperately trying to get him to fly downwards again. But the Windwalker was crazed with fear and panicking madly, so he just climbed up and up and up. Hiccup looked down. The forest was already a dark smudge beneath them, and out of that smudge burst the silver phantom, shooting upwards in a glorious silver arc. Up, up it soared with two mighty swoops of its silver wings. It was way too fast for the poor Windwalker and leapt over their heads in an athletic silver leap. And as it leapt, Valhalarama leant over and plucked Hiccup from the Windwalker's back with her left arm. Down swooped the phantom with Hiccup swinging from his mother's arm back through the canopy of trees, landing on the forest floor. Still holding Hiccup by the scruff of his waistcoat, she bounded from the phantom's back, leant Hiccup against a fallen tree trunk, removed the map from within Hiccup's waistcoat and threw it to the silver phantom. Oh, for Thor's sake, thought Hiccup. I really should have hidden that map a bit better. What was I thinking? Some undercover outcast I am. In a pouring silver motion, the silver phantom caught the map in mid-air and then shot up, up, out of the trees and away. 
While Valhalarama was momentarily distracted, Hiccup wriggled out of his waistcoat and ran out of reach. Valhalarama drew her sword, the mighty Nevermiss, with a great swaggering swish. Hiccup drew his own sword. He was beginning to feel a little hurt that she still hadn't recognised him. He was her son, after all. You'd have thought some kind of mother instinct might have kicked in by now. But then, Valhalarama really hadn't been around that much, thought Hiccup, bitterly, trying to ignore the rising lump in his throat as he remembered how many times he'd written to her as a child, asking for her to come back home for some reason or another, and how many times she'd written back to see how important her quest was. More important than me, thought Hiccup. No wonder she doesn't recognise me. I haven't seen her in two years. Valhalarama lunged at him. Hiccup met the lunge directly and replied with one of his own, rather more courteous and less deadly, but a joy of sword work nonetheless. He could see the surprise in Valhalarama's bright blue eyes above him, which was a source of satisfaction, however difficult the circumstances. It is always gratifying when your mother realises you are a worthy opponent, because sword fighting was the one thing he was really gifted at. And over the past year, he had had pretty much twice daily practice against people and dragons who weren't just fooling around. They really and truly hated him and wanted him dead. So it was a hymn to the gods of war to watch him now, like listening to a singer with the voice of an angel. Plus, he was left-handed, and a good lefty always has an advantage over a good righty. However, his faithful dragon companions weren't leaving anything to chance. They had now arrived on the scene, and the Wodensfang, his eyes lit up with surprising excitement at the battle, considering his great age, shouted, Number four, guys! Number four! Number four was one of the many manoeuvres they had worked out during an exciting year of fighting in forests, among other places, and it was one of the more successful ones. <coughs> shouted Hiccup desperately which meant, guys, please no, guys, we don't want to kill her. This is a big misunderstanding. She's my mother. But his dragons had absolutely no idea what he was saying, so they put number four into action. The Windwalker bounded around the two fighters, barking excitedly to confuse them, and then Toothless dive-bombed Valhalarama's head, biting into her metal arm, giving himself a gum ache, while the Wodensfang set fire to the bottom of a tree just behind her. Even Hiccup's incredible sword-fighting skills were challenged by this, because he was having to defend himself from Valhalarama while trying to manoeuvre her into a position out of the way of that tree when it fell down on top of her. Oh, for Thor's sake, this was impossible! That six-foot-three female metal mountain would just not budge. He parried her lunges with a grim beard's grapple, flashburn fancy and two points of order before realising she was never going to move. And for such a very small dragon, the Wodensfang was making good progress with that tree trunk. It was already beginning to wobble and visible flames were lighting up the grass at the bottom. Desperately, Hiccup defended himself from the Nevermiss's most brilliant fencing work with his left hand while trying to yank off that horrible jammed tight tin can of a helmet with the other. Tim! <laughs> sang the Wodensfang and Toothless in joyful chorus together. The burnt-through tree was swaying madly. Hiccup gave one last beyond-hope pull, and the helmet finally shot off his head with a violence that made his ears tingle. He shouted at the top of his voice, Mother, don't attack! It's only me, your son, Hiccup! And get out of the way of that tree, which is about to fall on your head! But, most unfortunately, totally unconsciously, he shouted those words in the tongue he had been used to speaking in for the last year. He hadn't had any human companions, you see. Not in Norse, but in Dragonese. Me mama, na bitey, it's a lonely me to disappoint a hiccup, plus out of the way da leaf dangle which yap and low down to brain boxer. So much for letting her know gently in a quiet moment. Life is sometimes much more messy than that. Valhalarama's blue eyes practically fell out of her visor, popping with amazement. She went absolutely rigid with shock, in the slightly ridiculous and undignified pose of mid-looping loot bubbles, one of Flashburn's more showy-off moves, which should really only be attempted by someone about ten years younger and half the girth of Valhalarama, formidable action woman though she was. No wonder she was surprised. For in one gobsmacked, sword arm freezing second, she had learnt one, that she had just been attempting to kill her only son by accident, 
too, that said son was in fact the outcast and enemy of the Wilder West, whom everybody, not just the witch, said was the one who set free the dragon furious and started this war between dragons and humans. Three, that the same son appeared to have the slave mark on his forehead. Four, that the same son appeared to be fluent in Dragonese, a language that had been banned. Not that anyone but Hiccup could speak it anyway. This was a very great deal to take in, in just one moonlit moment. The one piece of information that she wasn't able to take in, because it was spoken in Dragonese, was the one that would have been most immediately useful to her. The information that a tree was about to fall on her head. The tree snapped off at the trunk and... It landed plumb on Valhalarama's metal head and then bounced off it onto the ground. Valhalarama stood absolutely stock still for one second. She rearranged herself into a more dignified position and then she swayed gently on the spot and... She went down like the tree trunk itself. No! Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Hiccup hopped anxiously from foot to foot. Baba bingo! shouted Toothless. Good choice, a shot, Wogan's Fang! And then he flapped down and shouted insults down her visor. You baba big human bully! Hiccup tried to wave him out of the way, and Toothless thought he was reminding him about manners. Sorry, you great metal m- m- mollusk. Pardon me, you lumping lard, l- l- bottom lead belly. Excuse us, you terrifying tin of t- t- testosterone. Manners, said Toothless, smugly to Warden's Fang. Yes, well done, Toothless, congratulated the Warden's Fang brightly. Lovely apologising. Hiccup pushed Toothless off and snapped open his mother's visor. Oh, thank Thor, she's breathing. She was breathing, but she was out for the count, and there was a big fat lump on the front of her forehead. Unfortunately, the Windwalker, seeing that the terrifying warrior was still breathing and whipped up into a state of hysterical panic by the fighting, tried to get Hiccup to ride him out of danger. And when Hiccup wouldn't listen, he lost it entirely and picked Hiccup up in his claws, despite him desperately struggling and shouting, No! It's my mother! It's my mother! Woden's Fang and Toothless flew on either side of his head, making soothing noises, thinking that he was the one who had taken a funny turn on account of all the fighting. It took him ten minutes to get through to them what had happened, even without the helmet to shout through. After catching their breath, Hiccup insisted that they went back to where he thought the fight had taken place. But there was no sign of any unconscious mother, just a deep indentation in the snow where she had fallen beside the still smouldering tree trunk. Where had she gone? Had the razor wings got her? Or had the silver phantom returned and carried her to safety? They searched the forest for the rest of that night. But they never found her. Eventually, in the early hours of the next morning, Hiccup pushed aside some brambles and crawled into a cave he had been using as a hideout for some sleep. The warm, wet, shaggy body of the Windwalker beside him and his two friends, Toothless and Wodensfang, snuggle on his chest were always a source of comfort. He might be an outcast, but at least he had his dragons with him. Not like Fishlegs, who was entirely alone. Just as he was falling asleep, Hiccup remembered something. He no longer had the map. Three. Hiccup must die. The Woden's Fang had in fact been right about the Dragon Furious sending a dragon to kill Hiccup. A few weeks earlier, in the endless night of winter on the little Isle of Berk, where the air was so cold it stung the skin like bees, the dragon furious lay in the smoking, ashy remains of what had once been a hooligan village. The dragon furious was a sea dragonus giganticus maximus, and he was in command of the dragon rebellion. His aim was nothing less than the extinction of the entire human race. The hooligans had escaped from the last terrible dragon attack, fleeing to the islands of the south, which were still holding out against the relentless progress of the dragon invaders, but leaving the island of Berk to a triumphant dragon furious. The island of Berk was a new and important conquest for furious, and yet 
And yet there was one hooligan who had not been among the hooligans who escaped from the island on this day. One hooligan whom the Dragon Furious and the entire Dragon Rebellion had been hunting without success over seas and forests and mountains, through ice caves and volcanoes. Hiccup, horrendous, Haddock the Third. So many times had the little hooligan slipped through Furious's talons at the very last minute, double-backing, sneaking past, and streaking away on the back of his windwalker, with a whole howling pack of dragons after him, like a tricksy little fox fleeing the hunt. Kneeling in front of the dragon Furious was a rare triple-header deadly shadow dragon. You could not see him for a deadly shadow was one of those chameleon dragons whose skin can mirror any background or passing object, so at that moment he appeared to be invisible. Hiccup must die, said the dragon furious to the deadly shadow. We have to catch him or our cause is lost. Can you do it? Can you find and kill Hiccup where all others have failed? Slowly, the camouflaged skin of the deadly shadow turned back to its natural colour, and it was as if the terrifying creature was suddenly materialising out of thin air. You could see him in all his splendour now, gleaming, muscled, panther-like strength, frighteningly efficient-looking claws and jaws that could shoot forth both lightning bolts and flame. The three heads of the shadow smiled. The poison ducts in his six cheeks pulsed yellow for a second, out of their secret hiding places crept a bright, slitting talon or two that shone for a second and then slid back. My Lord Furious, said the middle head of the deadly shadow dragon, once my brothers and I loved a human, and this human died of grief because of the actions of her family. Now we hate the human with a hatred strong as acid. If you ask us to kill him, the boy is as good as dead already. Ah, said the dragon furious with satisfaction, I knew I was right to choose you, for you are so like myself. I needed one who hates like I do, and who will not weaken. For the hiccup boy with his antics releasing all the dragon traps has even been gaining sympathy among the weaker members of my rebellion. Follow him and kill him. Hiccup must die. And Hiccup shall die, hissed the three heads of the deadly shadow. He folded back his wings like a bat and leapt into the air, turning white as the blizzard as soon as he hit the sky. The dragon furious watched him go, the quiet snow falling. Sea Dragonus Giganticus Maximus Statistics Fear Factor Score 10 Attack, score 10. Speed, score 10. Size, score 10. Disobedience, score 10. Total score, 50. The largest of the dragon species, C. dragonus giganticus maximus, live in the open ocean. 4. One of Hiccup's less brilliant plans. A few weeks later, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III was lying crouched in the reeds on the edges of a tiny little island right in the middle of the bay that stood in front of Prison Darkheart, the bay called the Dragon's Graveyard. With him were the Windwalker, the Woden's Fang and Toothless. They were crouching down beside Hiccup, wings shivering, cat's eyes peering fearfully over the ferns at the horror of the landscape all around them. You are the, the not going in there, squeaked Toothless, pointing a horrified wing at Prison Darkheart. Please tell Toothless you are not going in there. I don't see that we have any choice, said Hiccup bitterly. Now that my mother has betrayed us, I must say, I know she's always been a bit absent, but I never thought she'd actually fight against me. Hiccup swallowed. The whole world was burnt to ashes, and here he was, feeling like crying over a wayward mother. But there was no other explanation. Valhalarama must have got her phantom to carry Grimbeard the Ghastly's map to the witch, because the witch was now in Darkheart, hunting for the dragon jewel. And so too were the Meathead, Murderous, Visithug, and Hooligan tribes. 
Hiccup had seen all the ships sail in over the past two weeks, which meant that Hiccup's friend Fishlegs was in there and Hiccup's father, Stoic the Vast, and Hiccup was determined to get them out now he knew where they were. It's my fault they're in there, so I'm going to get them out. Oh, shiver my turd, talons, wept poor Toothless, so terrified he fell off Hiccup's shoulder and into the sea Hiccup was crouching in. Look! He pointed a wing at all the dragon corpses lying in the sea around them. The dragon, for, for furious, has been trying to get in every night. How are you going to get in if even he hasn't managed it? At one end of the bay was the gigantic prison that formed the only entrance to the great walled hunting grounds of the Amber Slave Lands. The walls that encircled the Amber Slave Lands were not, perhaps, as long as the Great Wall of China, but they were certainly much higher and a similarly miraculous construction of the ancient world. In front of the prison, the tide was slowly sinking and gradually revealing the grotesque and pathetic shapes of thousands of dead dragons. Ancient dragon skeletons jutted from the waters of the bay like airy, melancholy cathedrals, with seagulls shrieking through the long-dead ribcages. And there were fresh dragon corpses too, smelling to high heaven and leaking green blood into the water. Because every night now, the prison was attacked by some of the most ferocious forces of the Dragon Rebellion. This is a terrible plan. The witch and Alvin will catch you, squeaked Toothless in an agony of fear. Nobody's going to catch us, said Hiccup soothingly. We'll just sneak in, see if we can find my father and fish legs and the jewel, and sneak out again. Us outcasts are good at sneaking, and if anybody spots us, I've got the slave mark, so they'll just think I'm another slave. And also, he raised an eyebrow, I'm going to be wearing my cunning disguise. Hiccup had changed quite a bit after six months of living as an outcast. He was thinner, taller, and his voice had deepened and was unsteadily sliding all the time between a gruff and a squeak, so that was a disguise in itself. Now he took off his helmet and brought out a rag from his rucksack and wound it round his left eye like an eye patch. He fixed a piece of pinkish candle wax right on the tip of his nose and it made a rather convincing wart. And he smeared himself with some stink dragon stink that he had been keeping in a little pot after carefully extracting it from a hibernating stink dragon in the forgotten forest a couple of days earlier. The smell would stop people coming too close. How do I look? Toothless made his yuckiest, yucky face. The Toothless not want to come near you is very, very yucky. Yes, well, you don't have to come, Toothless, if you don't want to. It may be better if you didn't, because it's very dangerous for dragons in there, said Hiccup, and I want you to be safe. You can stay here with the Windwalker. The Windwalker protested. What do you mean, stay here? I'm coming too. But Hiccup shook his head. I'm afraid you can't come, Windwalker. The Woden's Fang and Toothless can hide down my waistcoat, but you're far too big to hide, and they'll kill you if they spot you. The Windwalker shut his eyes and put his tail between his legs. All of his spines drooped. Hiccup hugged him affectionately, holding on to that warm, shaggy, familiar neck, smelling his lovely smell as if it might be for the last time. The Windwalker smelled of drinking chocolate. Now, Windwalker, you must stay here and guard my helmet and the hideout in the forgotten forest so that nobody finds it. We'll be back before you know it. Hiccup had been dreading this moment for a long time because he knew that he might be about to see his father again. For Hiccup had inadvertently caused Stoic to be made an outcast from his own tribe and turned from a chief respected by all with a comfortable life shouting out orders and eating a lot to a life as a slave in the Amber Slave Lands. Hiccup loved and respected his father, and it was almost unbearable to think of Stoic the Vast in this position, particularly when it was all Hiccup's fault. Had the experience of slavery changed Stoic? What must he be thinking of Hiccup? And what about Fishlegs? Was he all right? Thoughts like these were a kind of torment. But sometimes the bravest thing a hero has to do is not fighting monsters and cheating death and witches... It is facing the consequences of his own actions. Hiccup had to do this. Toothless, are you coming or staying? Toothless will come, 
said Toothless, grandly, pointing his wing at Hiccup. Because you need my help. And what would you do without me? Can Toothless wear an eye patch too? You don't need to wear an eye patch, Toothless. Nobody's going to see you. It's quite cool, though. Toothless! Toothless dived down Hiccup's waistcoat with a squeal. A slave ship was making its way through the reeds, delivering fresh slaves to the ravenous maw of the slave lands. It was hurrying, for the tide was sinking fast, and as soon as it was in, the Dragon Rebellion would attack, and if the ship was still there, they would all be dead men. Hiccup took a deep breath, sank beneath the water, and swam after the ship. It was picking its way like a slalom through the dragon corpses. Hiccup swam after it, the warden's fang puffing into his mouth to give him oxygen every now and then. Hiccup surfaced at the back of the ship and hitched a lift by driving two daggers into the wooden sides. He could hear the snap of the whips of the slave drivers above, the moans of the poor, tired slaves as they groaned with the weariness of the long journey and the splash of their oars. The ship stopped, and someone shouted up to the tiny figures way, way up on the battlements. With a protesting shriek of wheels and pulleys, the terrible door of Traitor's Gate opened slowly. Above the door, these ominous words were carved into the stone, each letter the height of a man. Forget all those who enter here. The slave driver snapped the whip again and screamed the command, To row! Exhausted, the slaves rode themselves through the door and into their own oblivion. Slowly and with dreadful finality, the iron door slammed. <laughs> Shut! The windwalker crouched in the reeds, let out a whine of anxiety as he saw it. He stayed there shivering and alone, until a sentry on prison Darkheart must have spotted him, because there was a mighty blaze from the battlements, and something huge and heavy rocketed past the poor Windwalker's head and exploded into the reeds beside him. What was that? What were these terrifying new weapons the humans were using against the dragons? The Windwalker did not stay to find out. With a terrified squeal, he launched out of the rushes and flapped for his life on sad, raggedy wings, flying north to the Forgotten Forest. He looked mournfully over his shoulders at the horror of prison dark heart. But in the fear of the moment, he left the stupid helmet with the feather on it behind in the reeds. Many hours later, something came winding through the melancholy cathedrals of long-dead dragon's bones and landed next to the helmet and drank in the smell of it. You couldn't see them, but the three heads of the camouflaged dragon smiled and its talons sprang out like flick knives. Hiccup, hissed the middle head of the dragon with satisfaction. Hiccup, 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 he must be in there. All three heads turned towards the prison dark heart. And now, hissed the third head, now we have him trapped. He seems, said the first head, sniffing the helmet again and wrinkling his nose in disgust, to have had an encounter with a stink dragon that is going to make him laughably easy to track. The dragon took off in the direction of the prison, slowly flapping its wings and circling it like some greedy, disguised vulture. And we know who that dragon is, don't we? Because there aren't all that many three-headed, invisibly camouflaged dragons in the archipelago. It was the deadly shadow. Five. The wrong side of the door. Hiccup's not-so-brilliant plan went wrong right from the beginning. The slaves on the ship on which he had hitched a lift were disembarking. Slipping from under the gangplank of the boat, Hiccup intended to melt into the shadows and explore the prison on his own. As an outcast, he was now an expert at this kind of sneaky behaviour. But as he tiptoed away, the warden's fang sneezed from his waistcoat. It was quite a quiet sneeze, but unfortunately, Toothless called out, Blister! which is Dragonese for bless you, very, very loudly. 
And then, Blishta! 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 As Woden's Fang sneezed three more times. The prison guard on the gangplank heard the noise and looked under the gangplank. Where do you think you're going? yelled the guard, assuming he was an escaping slave. The guard gave him a crack of a whip sharper than the bite of a squirrel serpent and invited him to join the long line of slaves sinking ankle deep into the sand as they disembarked from the ship. Toothless! whispered Hiccup furiously, holding on to his stinging shoulder as he shuffled down a maze of corridors into the dark belly of the prison's central courtyard. Please be quiet. Remember we're outcasts, spies. Oh, toothless was being polite, protested Toothless. Yes, I know. Politeness is good. Politeness is very good. I'm really impressed by your politeness. It's just if you could keep your politeness quite quiet at the moment, I'd be very grateful. Chaos reigned in the prison courtyard. Hiccup looked around with his mouth open. It was as if he had stepped through the door into another, grimmer world. Long lines of tables with people sitting eating at them seemed to suggest that this was some sort of open-air dining room. The people were of all ages, from six or seven upward, and had the S of the slave mark on their foreheads. But around these people eating was the manic din of war, and the sheer mad noise of it caused ears to ring as if an orchestra in Valhalla had turned up the volume to extra loud. Screaming warriors ran hither and thither, hammering swords and spears out of molten red-ended metal. Above Hiccup's head, continuous rocket explosions sent out huge clouds of yellow smoke that stung his eyelids and crept inside his nose like sulphurous slugs, gagging his throat with the smell of rotten eggs. Lying around the place were enormous evil-looking dragon traps, Weird, crazy inventions, such as catapults that launched 35 spears at once, and north bows that did the same with arrows. It was all so noisy you couldn't hear yourself think. The guard shoved them all in there before hurrying off, bellowing at them over his shoulder to, Eat well for the sea king begin soon! Whatever that might mean. To Hiccup's horror, the courtyard was absolutely packed to the brim with people he knew from tribes all over the archipelago, and as he was the most wanted person in the Wilder West right now, he thought it would be wise to slide away into a side corridor. But things really weren't going Hiccup's way this morning. Hoi, you over there, smelly boy, come and join us at our table, shouted a large fat man from a table nearby. Hiccup jumped guiltily, and then he realised in total amazement, that the large fat man shouting at him was in fact his own father, Stoic the Vast. It was the moment Hiccup had been dreading. The wart and the eye patch and the smell were doing their job, though, because Stoic clearly hadn't the faintest idea who he was. Hoi, smelly boy, yelled Stoic again. Get over here quick or all the food will be gone. Slowly, Hiccup walked up to the table where Stoic was sitting. As he sat down, all the others at the table moved gently away from him like a sea parting, their noses wrinkling. This must be what it's like to have a highly infectious disease, thought Hiccup. Stoic grunted and pushed a large chunk of bread and a big handful of mussels at Hiccup, trying not to breathe in Hiccup's particularly ripe and luscious stink. Eat up, boy, before I change my mind. At least his father was looking well. He looked a little sad around the eyes, perhaps, with a few streaks of grey in his magnificent moustache, and he'd lost a bit of weight. But he could still be described as a hugely fat man with a beard as red and out of control as a forest fire. And to Hiccup's passionate relief, Stoic seemed to be in some sort of position of importance and respect among the slaves, or at least in the group seated at this particular table. Once a chief, always a chief. New boy, eh? said Stoic, as Hiccup helped himself. What's your name, kid? Hiccup forced himself to look his father right in the eye. This was awful. He was in two minds about this, because he was undercover, of course, and it would be deadly dangerous if people started recognising him, but surely, surely, Stoic must know who he was. Valhalarama was away questing a lot, so she had some sort of excuse. But Stoic and Hiccup had sat together every single day at the breakfast table for thirteen years. How unmemorable exactly was he? For Thor's sake, he knew he'd grown up a little, but it wasn't as if he was wearing a large curly false moustache or anything. But no, 
Stoic clearly hadn't a clue, not even the merest smidgen of an idea that the boy he was sharing his supper with was his own only son. "'My name is Warty McSmelly,' said Hiccup. "'Good name,' said Stoic, approvingly. "'What tribe were you before the slave mark?' "'The Lost Tribe,' said Hiccup, thinking fast. "'Welcome to the company of Amber Hunter's Warty McStinky,' bellowed Stoic, giving him a hearty slap on the back. "'McSmelly,' Hiccup corrected him, choking slightly on his muscle. "'You have to belong to a group here, McSmelky.' "'Smelly! Oh, for Thor's sake! His father couldn't even remember his fake name. He was going to forget it himself at this rate. "'Otherwise you won't last a day out there on the sands,' bellowed Stoic importantly. "'We are the Amber Hunters. Listen up, Amber Hunters. We have a new boy here. This is Portly McSpelly, late of the Lost Tribe.' Hiccup looked at the Amber Hunters and then around him at the courtyard, and his heart sank right down into his sandals. Everything was back to front and upside down. All the wrong people were in charge. Up at the high table were the warriors of the Wilder West, swaggering around in their purple and yellow sashes, and amongst them Hiccup recognised some of the more unpleasant hooligans from his own tribe. The new chief... Snot face, snot loud, and his cronies, dog's breath, the dirt brain, and clueless. And down here in the slave pit were many, many noble, respected men and women who eight months earlier were proud warriors of their tribes and were now wearing the slave mark. Many were peaceables, grimbods, quiet lives, but here on Stoic's own table, in his company of amber hunters, among the silence and the basham oiks, were one or two hooligans that Hiccup knew well. The Vicious Twins, Hodgepodge the Looney, and Gobber the Belch, Hiccup's old teacher. Gobber the Belch was a most respected warrior who had fought bravely for his tribe on numerous occasions and was, once upon a lifetime away, in charge of the pirate training programme on Berk. Hiccup had a great lump in his throat as Gobber looked up and wished him a kindly hello and he saw the horrible S on his teacher's forehead. Who had done this to him? How dare they? And to make matters worse, even Gobber didn't recognise him. Had he really changed that much? Lonelier even than he had felt as an outcast, Hiccup looked around the table and around the whole courtyard. He was looking for fish legs, and fish legs didn't seem to be there. Um, Stoic the Vast, sir said Hiccup politely. Is there a boy called Fishlegs in the company of the Amber Hunters? Stoic looked uncomfortable and sad. Fishlegs, he said. No, I've never heard of a boy called Fishlegs. Have you, Gobber? Gobber the Belch shook his head. No, I've never heard that name before either. Never heard of Fishlegs? What were they talking about? Fishlegs had been memorably bottom of absolutely everything in Gobber's pirate training programme for about five years. Bashy ball, bad spelling the lot. Gobber used to say that he was going to get Fishlegs up to warrior status or die in the attempt. Hiccup's father had spent most of Hiccup's life a little annoyed that Hiccup had such a little weirdo as a friend. How could they possibly say they'd never even heard of him? There was something very odd going on round here. Hiccup was about to ask another question when snot Face Snotlout, the new chief of the hooligan tribe, came strolling up to the table. Snotlout was looking in excellent shape. If he hadn't been such an unpleasant character, it would have been a pleasure to see him come into his own like this. Snotlout had always wanted to be a chief, and now that fate had given him his dearest wish, he was loving every second of it. In the sunshine of everyone's admiration, he seemed to have grown about a foot. He swaggered around, joking with his friends, glowing with a new, relaxed confidence. Nice fighting against the dragons yesterday, Snotty, called out one of Snotlout's mates, Vandal the Visithug. How many did you kill? Was it nine? I think it was eleven, beamed Snotlout carelessly, but everyone did well. So when Snotlout strolled over to the Amber Hunter's table, his words were not, at the start at least, deliberately intended to offend, because Snotlout was in a very good mood. It was just that Snotlout was not accustomed to thinking about the feelings of anyone other than a certain snot-faced Snotlout. Eat up there, guys! 
was all Snotlout said, smiling, offhand. But Stoic and Gobber and Baggy Bum did take offence. They flinched at the casual command given by one who was so much their junior, one who was Baggy Bum's son, Stoic's nephew and Gobber's pupil, and who should be showing them considerably more respect, particularly since the reversal of fortune on both sides. Hiccup could not really look at the hurt expression on their faces and the sad sinking of their shoulders. This was the world turned upside down indeed. It's not loud, asked Hiccup, hurriedly changing the subject. Have you seen a boy called Fishlegs anywhere here? It's chief Snotlout to you, slave, Snotlout corrected, instantly guarding his dignity, his good mood fading. He didn't recognise Hiccup either, flicking his eyes over him dismissively, wrinkling his gigantic nose at the smell. Yes, Fishlegs is one of the lost. He disappeared in the seeking a couple of weeks ago. Not before time. He was a total weed. Nothing worth bothering about. A bit of a weakling like you, but without the powerful pong. Nothing worth bothering about. Baggy Bum the beer belly carefully put down his spoon. He looked at his son and quietly said the words that Hiccup most dreaded his own father would say to him. Snot out, said Baggy Bum the beer belly. I am ashamed to be your father. Snotlout turned white, shocked. For just one instant he shrank in front of their eyes and became the small boy he once was, standing in front of his father, his uncle, his teacher, the three men whose approval he most desperately sought. And then Snotlout composed himself, put on his arrogance once again and narrowed his eyes for the fight. You have no reason to say that. I may have made that runt fish legs a slave, but I did not make you slaves. You did that to yourselves by not showing our King Alvin enough respect. We acted out of loyalty to Stoic, but you did not try to intervene with our so-called King Alvin on our behalf, did you, Snotlout? said Gober thoughtfully. Why should I, when you act like fools, snorted Snotlout. Ashamed of me, I should be ashamed of you, and you should be proud that I am a chief. You were never a chief, Baggy, were you? sneered Snotlout. You are not really chief material. He patted his father on the shoulder and sauntered off. OK, so this wasn't all right. This wasn't all right at all. Hiccup's hand was shaking as he picked up his muscle and continued eating. Lost in the seeking? What did that mean? Where on earth was Fishlegs? A little girl was sitting beside him with huge, doomy eyes, a bear suit with all the buttons done up in the wrong buttonholes and very dark, straggly hair that stuck straight out of her head at odd angles. She seemed to read his mind. Shh, said the little girl, a lot of her teeth had recently fallen out, and she was very serious for such a small person. We're not allowed to talk about the lost. It's not good for morale. Lost? What does she mean, lost? But now the little girl said in an interested fashion, What the McSmilly? Your waistcoat is on fire. Ugh! Hiccup looked down, and there, indeed, was grey smoke drifting out at the top of his waistcoat. Toothless, who had been scratching away at Hiccup's tummy in an I-need-food sort of way for the past five minutes, had given up waiting and was now resorting to the desperate tactic of sending up smoke signals. Hiccup clamped his waistcoat to his chest to stop more smoke coming up. What possible excuse could he have for his waistcoat being on fire? Eventually he spluttered. Must have got caught by a spark from one of those explosions out in the courtyard. Don't worry, I've put it out now. And then, in one desperate swoop, Hiccup picked up the last of the bread, cheese and mussels and pretended, slightly theatrically, to drop one of the mussels on the floor. Whoops! And dived under the table, where he took Toothless and the wooden fang out of his waistcoat, scolding Toothless in a furious, gritted teeth whisper. Toothless, you must not set fire to my waistcoat. If anybody found out I had dragons on me, you would be dead. What an accident! lied Toothless. Hunger makes Toothless's fire hose leak. Now, Toothless, whispered Hiccup, showing him the mussels and the bread that he held in his clenched fist. There's not much to go round, so before I give these to you, remember your manners. Be polite. Share. 
Leave some for Wodensvang too. In the darkness of prison dark heart, it is even more important than usual to keep up your standards. Toothless nodded his head, repeating, Oh, yes, eh, yes, eh, me coglet. Toothless will share. Toothless very p- polite. Hiccup opened his hand. Toothless opened his mouth so wide and moved so quick that he misjudged his lunge and wrapped his little gums not just around the muscles, cheese and bread, but around Hiccup's entire hand, which was, of course, too big for him to swallow. Hiccup looked down at him in disbelief. Goodness gracious, you wouldn't have thought that a dragon so small would be able to open his mouth that wide. Slowly, with his tail stuck between his legs and his huge eyes apologetic, Toothless backed off the hand, leaving the food there. Woden's fang first, said Toothless piously, pretending that had not just happened. And he let the Woden's fang have a couple of dainty little picks before charging in to gobble up the lot. Sorry, muscles, said Toothless, with his mouth full. Sorry, bread. Sorry, cheese. Yes, lovely apologising, Toothless, whispered Hiccup, but you don't really have to apologise to your food. Although it's a nice idea, Toothless, don't get me wrong. Suddenly, there was absolute dead silence in the great hall. All the chattering ceased in a moment, like when small, delicious furry animals freeze into quietness when wolves enter the wood. And then, as he was crouched under the table with the warden's fang and Toothless eating mussels on the ground beside him, there came a sound that made Hiccup's neck crawl with fear, as if beetles had crept underneath his collar and every single individual hair on his head spike upwards as though they were the quills of a porcupine. Step, tap. Step, tap. Step, tap. Step, tap. Along the floor of the suddenly silent courtyard. And with a cold trickle of dread, Hiccup saw from underneath the table the legs of a man come striding into view and stop right in front of him, so close that he could have reached out and touched them. To be more precise, one leg was made out of flesh, the other was made out of ivory. Sadly, Hiccup could not see the rest of him, for Alvin the Treacherous, king-in-waiting of the Wilder West, was a handsome sight indeed, a villain in the very flower and blossom of his villainy, blooming with warts like a tree in fruit, skeleton and snake tattoos writhing gloriously over his gigantic muscles and all the remaining parts of him that were still human. Which was not as many parts as the rest of us have, for Alvin was currently missing an arm, a leg, a nose and an eye, all replaced with splendid attachments made of the very best ivory, gold and iron that a king-in-waiting could lay his hook on in the middle of a war. Behind the tapping and the ticking of Alvin's progress across the courtyard was a horrible rustling sound, like rats scuttling, and there was something running across the floor like a big white bony dog. It wasn't a dog. It was a witch as white as bone, a witch that walked on all fours like an animal. The Witch Excelenor, Alvin the Treacherous's mother. Her poisoned iron fingernails scraping on the flagging made that rat scratch of a sound. She stopped dead in front of Hiccup. And then, slowly, like an automaton, she turned her head and stared right into Hiccup's eyes. Six, the witch Excelenor is a little annoyed. Oh, for Thor's sake! Hiccup's heart melted within his chest as the witch's hollow eyes looked straight at him. She was like a living skeleton, a shock of hair streaming out behind her, all human kindness dead within her. Twenty years of living in the darkness of a tree trunk had bleached all the light out of her, and she was whiter than a slug and meaner than a snake, and bowed into a hoop by the prison of the trunk. They were caught red-handed. She had been tearing up the Wilder West in her hunt for this very same boy for the past six months. And there Hiccup was, under the table not two feet away from her quivering white nose, frozen in the act of feeding two banned dragons, both of them hovering, petrified, in mid-air. 
The witch sniffed once, twice. Dragons, she hissed in horror. Dragons. She looked straight at him and barked like a dog. But the witch was so blind she could barely see a foot in front of her nose. She did not see them. At that distance, she could only sense movement. Don't move, toothless. Thought Hiccup, teeth gritted in terror. Don't move. The witch carried on looking at them for what seemed like a lifetime, and then her long pointed nose, sharp as a knife, sniffed in disgust. That's weird," said the witch dismissively. "I thought I smelt dragons, but it's just slaves. They smell disgusting." And scuttle, scuttle off she bounded, followed by the step tap. Step tap of Alvin, thank Thor for the stink dragon stink. Shaking with relief, Hiccup stuffed the wooden fang back into his waistcoat. The wart on the end of his nose fell off, and he only just got to it in time because Toothless was about to eat it. Thoroughly rattled, he fastened it back on, put Toothless in his waistcoat with the wooden fang, and popped back up to the top of the table. The girl with the black hair and the big eyes was now sitting where he had been sitting. Oh dear. Those big doomy eyes were rather alarming. They gave him quite a shock. You've been under there for a really long time," said the girl solemnly. "Yes, well, I was resting," said Hiccup, feeling a little desperate. "My name's Egingard," said the little girl. "Pleased to meet you, Egingard," said Hiccup, shaking her hand in a slightly frazzled way. "Egingard, what is this seeking thing, and how do you get lost?" Us slaves of the Ember Slave Lands go out on the seeking every day," said Egingard. She spoke in a very grown-up way for such a very little girl. At the first hint of low tide, the bugle sounds, and out we go onto the red sands to seek the Ember Jewel that the witch and her son Alvin are looking for, the one that is not there. For I have been out on the sands every day since I can remember, and I can tell you the jewel is not there. Oh, great! Then, the second bugle sounds," said Egingard in a scared, deep whisper, "and we return to prison, Darkheart, unless, unless, we are taken by the tide, or." Egingard stopped and opened her eyes even wider. Something else. Something about Egingard's doomy eyes reminded Hiccup of someone, but he didn't know who. Egingard asked Hiccup, "How long have you been in this prison?" "For as long as I can remember," replied Egingard. Poor Egingard, for as long as she could remember, that was a long time. "It's okay," said Egingard. "I'm not scared because I am a wanderer, and wanderers are wild." Egingard pulled up the hat of her bear suit, held up her ten fingers, and made them into claws, making a hissing sound. Hiccup pretended to be frightened, and Egingard looked pleased. She carefully pulled down the hood of her bear suit and whispered confidingly, "Sometimes I even scare myself." "I bet you do," said Hiccup admiringly. "You didn't, by any chance, have a very scary grandmother, did you?" "Oh, wanderer grandmothers are scary," replied Egingard. The witch leapt onto the top table, and when she straightened and opened her mouth to speak, it was as surprising as if a dog had suddenly got on its hindquarters and spoken like a human being. Fools! Screeched the witch. Ignoramuses, cowards, lazy bones. Where is my jewel, you numbskulls? As you can see, purred Alvin, polishing his hook. My mother is a little annoyed. Slaves of the Amber Slave Lands," said the witch, calming down with bewildering swiftness to the relief of her electrified audience. Now she put on her sweetest, most reasonable voice. "I have brought you Grimbeard's map." She pointed at the map, which Hiccup could now see had been hung very carefully in the centre of the courtyard. 
See how clearly it is marked? How the dragon jewel is hidden somewhere in between the maze of mirrors, the evil reaches, and the prison of Dark Heart. All I ask, and it is for the good of the Wilder West, is for you to find me the jewel. But I see you may need a little more motivation. Listen up, slaves! yelled the witch. Anybody who finds me the dragon jewel, or indeed that little outcast. Hiccup gave a guilty jump in his seat to hear himself personally mentioned, but luckily everyone was concentrating so firmly on the witch that they did not notice. Whoever is the jewel finder gets the most precious prize of all. The prize, crooned the witch, is freedom. The crowds leaned forward eagerly, as if her words were water and they could drink them in. Freedom, they crooned after her longingly. Freedom, just close your eyes, smiled that infernal witch, and imagine what freedom means to you. Close your eyes and imagine what freedom means to you. Such simple words. The tattered scarecrow slaves closed their eyes and to each one it meant something different, but somehow the same. A clear blue sky, flying on the back of a dragon, out in a ship on the restless wave, a small house in a quiet village on a small island with the smoke rising lazily from the chimney. Home. Somewhere far away from these chains, these desperate sands, these dark prison walls. What about the slave, Mark? cried out a slave, forgetting his place. It can be burnt off, said the witch craftily. It's a slightly painful operation, but a small price to pay for freedom. You're lying, aren't you, mother? whispered Alvin the treacherous. Of course I'm lying, the witch whispered back sweetly. The slave, Mark, can never be removed. Once a slave... Always a slave. She turned back to the crowds of slaves. At the seeking tomorrow you shall bring me the jewel. I know you shall. And she bounded off the table and out of the room. Oh, that witch. She and her son were not nice people. Not nice people at all. 7. A truly scary bedtime story. Do not listen to this if you are about to go to bed. The little dark-haired girl called Egingard showed Hiccup where to sleep, in a corner of one of the dungeons of Prison Darkheart, which served as the slave's dormitory. It looks like someone's already sleeping there, said Hiccup, doubtfully. No, the little girl shook her head firmly and mournfully. It used to be a loser kid's bed, but he doesn't sleep there anymore. Hiccup settled the warden's fang and toothless in the bed underneath a tattered blanket he had brought with him in his rucksack. He then had a whispered argument with toothless under the blanket. What have I said, toothless, about not eating inedible objects? Look, you've eaten a large hole out of my shirt. Toothless widened his green gauge eyes and innocently batted those preposterously long eyelashes. Wasn't the to toothless? He mumbled in between a large mouthful of shirt, and he pointed a hopeful wing at the warden's fang. Must have been the warden's fang. I can see you eating it right now, whispered Hiccup in exasperation. You might as well own up. Toothless protested. No, 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 no. But as he did so, he accidentally spat out one of the buttons. Both Hiccup and Toothless looked at the button. Even Toothless had the grace to look slightly guilty. Sorry, shirt, said Toothless. Look, Toothless owned up. Toothless swallowed the remains of the mouthful of shirt. Sorry, belt. Sorry, top of trousers. Sorry, waistcoat pocket. Oh, Toothless is good at this owning up business. Hiccup sighed. At this rate, he was going to have nothing left that didn't have bite marks in it. Hiccup popped up from underneath the blanket to ask Egingard a question. Where does Loser Kid sleep now, then? asked Hiccup. Egingard frowned. 
She didn't answer the question. She just counted on her fingers the previous occupants of the bed Hiccup was about to sleep in. And before Loser Kid, it was Goggle-Eyed Gertie's. And before that, it was the funny-looking kid with the big ears. And then there was Bobble Hands. That's his candle you're holding on to there. Hiccup took his hands off the candle as if it was poisoned. And Little Arms the Brave. And what happened to all these people? asked Hiccup in horror. Egingard did not answer. Are you quite sure there was never a boy called Fishleg sleeping in this bed? asked Hiccup. Egingard looked startled. Was Fishlegs a tall, skinny boy with curly hair, smashed glasses and a face like a haddock who wanted to be a bard, just like me? Yes, said Hiccup eagerly. That's Fishlegs. No, said Egingard. I don't think I've ever seen anybody like that around here. But if I had, she added wistfully, I think I would have liked him. Egingard, you just described him, said Hiccup in exasperation. You must have met him. Please, you have to tell me. He's my very great friend. What happened to him? Where is he? Anxiously, Egingard shook her head. Shh, I can't tell you. I'm not allowed to tell you about the lost. It's bad for morale. She looked over her shoulder at the dungeon filled with whispering that was dying away as people settled down for the night. Egingard put up the hood of her bear suit and peered out from underneath. But I can tell you a story, said Egingard determinedly, drawing down her thick, dark eyebrows into a straight line and sucking in the air through the gap in her teeth. A very scary story. This story isn't about your friend Fishlegs. Egingard shook her head violently. No, 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 no. It's about somebody else. The story is called... The slave boy, the slave girl, and the monster of the amber slave lands. Poof! Someone blew out the last candle in the dungeon, and in a doomy, alarmed, and alarming whisper, the little girl insisted on telling the story. You have to imagine this story being told in the huge, echoing dungeon, with the whispering voices in it sounding like spirits of the dead. You have to imagine Egingard lying back in her bear suit, conjuring up the story with wild wavings of her arms and the moonlight making shadows of those arms on the dungeon walls. The story of the slave boy, the slave girl and the monster of the amber slave lands. Once upon a time, a poor slave boy and a slave girl were paddling their sand yachts in the most evil of the evil reaches deep in the heart of the amber slave lands, began Egingard. Oh, no, no, don't let her tell this story, moaned Toothless from under the bedclothes. Toothless is worried that this might be a scary story, and this is really quite a scary dungeon already. But Egingard was not to be stopped. She told the story as if she could not help herself from telling it, as if it was something that she could not keep to herself. And Hiccup wanted to hear it, because he was worried that Egingard might be lying and that this was a story about fish legs after all. For someone so little, Egingard told an excellent story, as if she were a grown-up. Maybe it was the amount of time she spent with adults. Or maybe it was just that wanderers are wonderful storytellers. So low was the tide, whispered Egingard, that the dreaded red sands stretched as far as the eye could see to the north, west, south and east. Nothing but sand. Sand everywhere. Sand and a sinister silence. No birds called over those dreadful red sands. No seagulls screeched. For something terrible lurked beneath something truly awful, and the birds knew to stay away. The slave boy and the slave girl paddled their sand yachts out on the eastern sands, looking around with wild eyes, paddling as if witches were after them, though not a human soul could be seen in any direction. They kept looking left and right, and every now and then they stopped reached down with their curious long nets and bent to pick up a piece of amber lying on the beach. These pieces of amber, revealed by the low tide, were amber jewels of astonishing richness and variety, 
some the color of honey and the lightness of air, others milky drops of yellow-green, others red as coral, warm to the touch and flecked with insect wings. The amber slave lands are the best amber hunting grounds in the whole of the Viking world, and many a slave has died there in the quest to find the amber jewel that would be fit for a warrior Viking princess or the sword hilt of a king. Low tide was best for finding amber, and lowest tide the best of all. But it was also the most dangerous. On, on they paddled wildly, on and on and further out, the willow baskets on their backs nearly full now. The red sand made a sludgy, swishing sound as the rims of the yachts splashed through it on, 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 for there was no turning back. And suddenly they stopped, both at exactly the same time, as sharply as if they had been hit by arrows. In front of them, in the soft, wet, red sands, were deep, scarlet indentations appearing out of nowhere, and stretching out for miles, the sea puddling in the imprints, shining in the early evening sunset as if it were blood. The footprints were so large that the slave girl's yacht came to a dull squelching stop right in the middle of one, and it was as large as the yacht itself. They were the footsteps of a gigantic dragon. Toothless, let out an unhappy whine. The slave boy and the slave girl felt their hearts almost die within them. Oh, their luck had really vanished now. They knew that they were doomed. They looked at each other, and then they both hid their heads in their hands, curled up in the yachts, and the slave boy pretended he was back home in his village, and the slave girl would have pretended she was back home if she had known where home was. But then, the slave boy remembered that he had been a Viking in training once upon a time before he had been a slave. And the slave girl remembered she was actually extremely brave. And the slave girl and the slave boy made fists out of their hands and shook them at the footprints to show defiance. Egingard made a fist out of her own hand and shook it furiously in the air, and her shadow fist shook larger still on the dungeon wall. Toothless not liking this story, whispered Toothless. Yes, I don't think I like this story either, said Hiccup out loud, forgetting that Toothless wasn't supposed to be there. I don't have to tell you the end of the story if you don't want me to, said Egingard, dropping her arms. Oh dear, Hiccup had to hear the end of the story now, although he did not really want to hear it. No, carry on, said Hiccup. The slave girl and the slave boy knelt to examine the footprint, said Egingard, and very, very quietly as they knelt, something moved in the sand behind them. It made no sound, just a little light spurt of sand, like a tiny bubbling upwards waterfall. Up it rose a little more. What was it? Something very curious. It was an eye lying on the sand, blinking there quietly for a moment, like it had been discarded by a giant. Slowly up it rose, and there were four more eyes, burrowing out of the sand like periscopes, curiously attached to the end of long dragon fingers, and the five together made the gigantic dragon claw. The claw held still, the eyes horrifyingly attached to the fingers, focused in on the boy without blinking. And kneeling in the sand, they sensed a presence behind them. The hairs on the back of their necks tingled and prickled with alarm. Slowly, they peered behind them. You're freaking me out, Egingard, said Hiccup. She's freaking me out too, said the warden's fang, peering out from under the covers. And uh, the toothless, said toothless, whose wings were over his ears. Can't you make her stop? B -b bite her or something. Manners, said the warden's fang. Just a little, little bite, pleaded toothless. A sweet one to make her stop. But nothing was going to make Egingard stop now. Ah! They screamed, said Egingard, and she sat up and screamed. Ah! herself so loud that Hiccup was astonished that none of the other slaves woke up. 
but they had obviously had a hard day out on the sands, for they snored on. And the slave girl and the slave boy got on their yachts and propelled them forward with the oars as fast as they could. Wildly they oared the careering yachts, crying and splashing across the scarlet sand. They could not stop to blow their whistles. They could not stop, for the dragon was after them, and if they stopped it would already be too late for someone to save them. The dragon claw eye periscope had disappeared, but over their terrified shoulders they could see five little humps of sand following them, keeping pace with them, unhurried. Egingard's hands got more and more excitable as she conjured up this nightmare, as if she were conducting a savage piece of music, faster and faster. The slave boy and the slave girl oared on, and the five little humps of sand followed, always keeping pace, patiently, waiting for them to tire. The slave boy and the slave girl oared their yachts for what seemed like hours. There was nowhere to go, no trees to climb, no one to hear. The sands went on forever, and then... And then Hiccup and Toothless and Woden's Fang leant forward in horror. Egingard swallowed, her arms momentarily frozen before carrying on, her voice even deeper. Out in the most eastern part of the evil reaches, right by the rock that looked like a witch's finger pointing upwards at the sky, the boy's yacht caught on the metal edge of a dragon trap lying half covered in sand, waiting to catch dragons. The dragon trap snapped shut and caught the rim of the yacht and held it fast. The boy's yacht tipped over and smashed into the sand, and the boy gave up. He lay down on the sand and curled up into a little ball. The sands around him were quiet. Slowly, carefully rose the dragon claw with the dreadful eyes on the end, burrowing out of the sand by the boy's foot. The boy did not move. And then the claw closed around his ankle and gently pulled him down below the sand. There was a long, long silence as Egingard's arms slowly dropped down to her side. What happened to the slave girl? asked Hiccup, horrified. She carried on back to the prison, sighed Egingard. Egingard pulled down the hood of her bear suit. Underneath the bedclothes, Toothless and the Woden's Fang gave soft, unhappy whines. They obviously hadn't enjoyed the story either. That's a very, very sad story, said Hiccup. Doesn't the boy get away? Couldn't you make the boy get away and give the story a happy ending? If I was living in a happier place, said Egingard, I might tell stories with happier endings. Hiccup was getting a very, very bad feeling about this story. It wasn't a true story, was it, Egingard? asked Hiccup. Please don't let it be a true story. Egingard said nothing. It wasn't about fish legs. The slave boy and the slave girl, they weren't you and fish legs, were they, Egingard? The dark was filled with silence. I can't tell you that, said Egingard. It's bad for morale. Hiccup begged her and begged her, but she would not say another word. It was dark. It was quiet. Everybody else was sleeping now. A few moments later, snores came from the bed beside Hiccup. It was all very well for Egingard. She had got her story off her chest. But Hiccup and his two little dragons lay awake in that darkness, listening to the sound of the dragon rebellion attacking the prison. You don't think that story would be uh, uh, true, do you, master? whispered Toothless, his two eye beams shining like torches in the darkness. Oh, how Hiccup hoped not. I've never heard of a monster like that one, Hiccup whispered back. Although there are said to be some weird things under the sands of the Amber Slave Lands, things that have been cut off from the rest of the world for so long that they've developed in their own peculiar way, like brainless leg removers, shooters and slither fangs. But I've never heard of a dragon with eyes on the ends of its claws. So maybe it's not true, said the Woden's Fang, to Toothless's relief. But although the little dragons eventually went to sleep, the Woden's Fang's arms clasped rather sweetly around Toothless, protecting him. Hiccup could not sleep. What if Egingard's story is true?
thought Hiccup. And what if it happened to fish legs? Please don't let it be true. Then Hiccup spoke sternly to himself. Fish legs is somewhere out there, and he is relying on me to stay hopeful. Hiccup was young and optimistic, and eventually he persuaded himself that Egingard's story was just a story, but a very good one. And he, too, fell asleep. Eight. Hunting for the Amber in the Amber Slave Lands. Very early the next morning, the slaves gathered in the prison courtyard for the seeking. Toothless was very tired and very scared, peering out of Hiccup's waistcoat. Toothless not want to go on this seeking, nor did Hiccup. Open the doors to the Amber Slave Lands, cried Alvin the Treacherous. C -c -c creak The great doors opened on the east side of the courtyard of Prison Darkheart, and Hiccup got his first view of the sands of the Amber Slave Lands. It was the volcanic rock that had turned them that extraordinary bright scarlet red, like blood, and with the sinking of the tide they stretched out for miles, encircled by the arms of the slave land walls as far as the eye could see and beyond. Dig for your lives! Hunt till your eyes drop out! But take care of yourselves for Thor's sake! We've been losing a lot of slaves recently, cried Alvin the Treacherous, and the cold, clear note of the bugle rang out. The seeking begins! All around the edges of the courtyard, tucked away behind the crazy jumble of weaponry and dragon traps, were rows and rows of sand yachts. The crowds of slaves rushed and jostled for them now, for the witch's prize of freedom was far more precious than her punishment of death. Calmly, Amber Hunters, said Stoic the Vast, holding up his great hand. Calmly, there is plenty of time. So the Amber Hunters got to the sand yachts after the first undignified rush. Egingard showed Hiccup his sand yacht. This one hasn't got an owner, said Egingard. Hiccup swallowed. What happened to the last owner? asked Hiccup, although he already knew the answer. I really can't say, said Egingard, but her eyes seemed to say, Lost. Don't tell me. It's bad for morale, Hiccup finished for her. The sand yacht was a wobbly, skew-whiff thing, with a basket balanced on one end to put the amber in, and a long pole, again slightly skew-whiff, to pole along the sand with. In his mind, Hiccup called this little yacht the Hopeful Puffin too, because it reminded him so much of the Hopeful Puffin, the little boat he used to have on Berg, long ago, before the war. To give himself courage, and to remind him of that happy time he hoped would come again, he took out a piece of chalk from his rucksack and drew a picture of the hopeful puffin on the side of the sand yacht. You have to take care of your sand yacht, explained Egingard, because if your sand yacht breaks a mast or something, there's no way you can get back to prison dark cart without the tide catching you. Every team had a prison guard. Alvin had put Snotlout in charge of the Amber Hunters. But I'm a chief and a dragon fighter, complained Snotloud furiously. I'm not a slave or a guard. I should be out there, beyond the prison walls, killing dragons for you, king. I'm way too important to this war effort for you to lose me on the sands. Silence, yelled Alvin. Are you disrespecting my orders, Chief Snotloud? Snotloud was silent. He was not a fool. He knew what happened to people who disrespected Alvin's orders. Thank you, purred Alvin. We've lost a lot of prison guards recently, and we have to find that jewel soon. My mother has seen it in her dreams, and mother's dreams must be obeyed. So it was Snotlout who addressed the Amber Hunter's party before they left. Right, you are of a lot. You heard what Alvin said. Hunt until your eyes drop out, and Stoic, Baggy and Gobber, please keep up. I don't want you old guys holding up the whole team, he sneered. So they followed the great army of yachts onto the sand. 
Every now and then, one little team ahead of them broke off to begin working on one of the pointless holes or hunting for the amber. So as they travelled farther and farther east across the sand, the army of yachts grew smaller and smaller until it was just the amber hunters. For hours and hours they sailed. They had long left the islands and the land behind. The tide made a strange kind of sucking noise as it sank, and it seemed as if it was bubbling, bursting, and maybe it was Hiccup's imagination playing tricks on him, but it seemed as if there really might be something down there, something that was incubating, that the sands were about to give birth to something dreadful. There could be brainless leg removers down there. There could be rocket rages. There could be something even worse than these. The scary thing was that all the other slaves seemed to think the same thing. They were very, very jumpy, looking over their shoulders all the time. Toothless and the Wodensfang peered anxiously out of Hiccup's waistcoat. Do you think Egingard is right and there is that monster down there? asked Toothless querulously. No, Toothless, said the Wodensfang. If there is a monster, we shall just have to try and reason with it. Us dragons are just as capable of evolving into more civilised beings as humans are. Yes, that was all very well, thought Hiccup, but I would put a bet on that dragon not being very reasonable. Chief Snotlout found it hard to keep up with the Amber Hunters. The prison guards had wider, bigger sand yachts, and Snotlout hadn't yet mastered the rhythm of his. Even Hiccup was faster than Snotlout, despite the fact the falling apart, the hopeful Puffin too, was impossible to steer in a straight line and wobbled its way forward in desperate zigzags. And in this, it was very like the hopeful Puffin 1, a valiant little boat, but it tended to go round in circles. Stop! Slow down! Wait for me! shouted Snotlout, waving his whip. But nobody bothered waiting for Snotlout. He fell further and further behind, so when they finally reached the most evil of the evil reaches, way, way to the east, it was Stoic who addressed the team with the customary team leader address. Ahem, Stoic cleared his throat. Company of Amber Hunters, we may be slaves, but we can still be the best slaves that we can be. Even the droopiest little wanderer straightened his back at this. Present your kit for inspection ordered Stoic. There was something heroic about the pathetic little yachts that arranged themselves in a line out there on the desolate horror of the red sands, and the raggedy human backs, ramrod straight, presenting themselves proudly for inspection. Stoic walked calmly up the line as if he were inspecting a war party back on Berg. Snotlout came panting up. How dare you! He flapped his whip in an exhausted way. This is an outrage! I'm in charge here, not you, Stoic! We want to get as much amber as possible, you lazy slaves, so let's get you working as widely as we can! Puffed Snotlout, reasserting his command. I'll stay here where it's a bit safer, with a few of you as bodyguards, but the rest of you guys spread out as far as possible. Your lives don't matter. Stoic, when we get back to the prison, I shall put you on report. Snotlout pointed a shaking whip at Stoic. And then something unexpected happened. Gobber the Belch stepped forward and calmly wrestled Snotlout's whip from him, broke it in half and gave it back to him. We are not in prison now, Snotlout, said Gobber the Belch. Out here, Stoic is in charge. Crossing his arms, Gobber looked sternly down into Snotlout's eyes, as Snotlout swallowed, realising that these words might have a sinister significance. It was true. They could not even see the prison out here, just the red sands that stretched out forever in all directions, and the little group on their sand yachts standing silently in the wilderness. Many of them passed their prime, but still old warriors whose fighting ability Snotlout knew well. And there were fifteen of them, and only one of Snotlout. We have to go back some time, hissed Snotlout, shaking his broken whip. We cannot stay out here forever, and when we do, I'll have you killed as a revolutionary. Gobber gave a dismissive snort, as if a fly was speaking, and turned to Stoic and gave the hooligan salute. What are your orders, Chief Stoic the Vast? Thank you, warrior Gobber. 
said Stoic the Vast, very dignified, straight-backed, every inch a chief, the warrior he had been before he got the slave mark. He saluted Gober back. Hiccup grinned in delight as the amber hunters broke into applause, and Stoic bowed solemnly to them all. It was so lovely to see his father back in command, even if it was only temporary. Stoic the Vast, oh, hear his name and tremble once again, considered the situation. It was much safer for all of them to stick together in case you-know-what attacked. Stoic would not allow his mind to dwell on you-know-what, whatever that was. But then perhaps it was worth taking a few risks, because if they found the jewel, they would win the ultimate prize. They would be free. Stoic thought longingly of the idea of freedom. Freedom. Dignity. Maybe, perhaps, he could be a chief again. And then he'd never have to tell Valhalarama about this whole unfortunate episode. She didn't come home much after all. He could just hide the slave mark under his helmet, like Hiccup used to do, and she'd never know anything about it. Stoic closed his eyes and enjoyed this happy, unrealistic little fantasy for one blissful moment. And then he opened his eyes again, and he was still there on those blasted red sands, with a wind trying to blow him out of existence. He looked up at the sun. It's a lovely bright day. Good visibility. OK, perhaps we should split into smaller groups. We'll cover twice as much territory that way. I'll be hunting with Egengard and... Uh, Macbelly here, announced Stoic to hiccup surprise. Let's see if we can beat that streak of bad luck you've been having, eh, Egengard? Stoic gave Egengard a tired, encouraging smile. Egengard pulled the hood of her bear suit down so low she was a bit muffled. I'm not scared, growled Egengard. That old monster better be scared of me, though, because us wanderers are scary. Roar, roared Egengard, making her fingers into claws. Everybody pretended to be scared. Wow! said Gober, feigning falling over. Careful there, Egengard, you nearly gave me a heart attack. What you could see of Egengard under the bear hood looked pleased. Has everybody got their whistles? Everybody nodded their heads. Around each neck was a whistle made out of an elk horn. You blow that as soon as you are in any kind of danger, and we'll all come and help you. Keep your eyes out for you know what at all times, and I'd say we have... Oh! Stoic squinted up at the sun. Four hours before the tide comes in. Now remember, if anyone finds the jewel, other members of the team must stay together to protect the winner and keep working closely in pairs so that if anything happens to your partner, you can call for help. If we find the jewel, our prize will be the greatest prize of all. Freedom itself. Freedom! cried the company of amber hunters, lifting their nets on their long poles. We hunt for freedom! Hang on a second! spluttered Snotlout as they all made ready their yachts. Aren't you even going to leave somebody with me? We all know there's something out here! Snotlout's eyes flicked nervously over those endless scarlet sands. Something that takes the slaves! And my life is too important to the Wilder West to lose! Oh, you don't need somebody with you, Chief Snotlout, grinned Gober. You're far too tough. Nothing is going to want to eat you. You're too chewy. I order you to stay here, roared Snotlout, red in the face. I order you or I'll... I'll... Or you'll what? Gober raised an eyebrow. In answer, Snotlout turned his yacht around and sailed back as fast as he could in the direction of the prison or I'll report you for mutiny and treason. The older warriors on the sands threw back their heads and laughed. Gobar let Snotlout get a little head, and then, in a few leisurely strokes of his yacht, he caught up with a furious, enraged chief Snotlout of the hooligan tribe, sledging for all his worth out there in the middle of nowhere. Gobar reached out a bear-like paw and flipped the yacht over, like he was flipping over a sea turtle. Down, tumbled Snotlout, somersaulting over and over. His yacht smashed and he somersaulted over the top of it and got a mouthful of red sand. How dare you! You've broken my yacht! spluttered Snotlout, spitting out sludgy red sand and bits of little eels. Yucky! 
I have broken your yacht, said Gobber calmly, and now I'm going to break it some more. With one big galumphing soldier step, he put his foot right through the bottom of it. Smash! Swoosh, swoosh, swoosh. All the other yachts came swooshing up and halted in a grinning ring around Snotlout, desperately showering him in arcs of sand. Father, said Snotlout, desperately, are you going to let them do this to me? Am I your father? said Baggy Bum, grimly. Snotlout winced. I thought I was just Baggy, an old slave. Not really chief material, I think you said. I, said Gobba the Belch, standing over the fallen Snotlout with his hands on his hips, was once your teacher. And you, difficult as I find it now to believe, were once my star pupil. Snotlout flinched. Talking of mutiny and treason, you yourself have betrayed most of the people standing here now on this sand. People who relied on you as their protector and leader. And so, I am now about to become your teacher again. I hope you're not too old to teach, for I am going to teach you a lesson about being a chief. Snotlout swallowed. He didn't think he was going to like this lesson. We are out here in the middle of nowhere, said Gobber. Your yacht is broken. It is too far to walk back on foot. That is why they gave us yachts in the first place. You will be overtaken by the tide before you reach the prison. Your only hope is that one of us will save you by giving you a lift back on one of our yachts. The dreadful nature of his present situation began to dawn on Snotloud. We are about to leave you here alone, said Gobber calmly, so you will have plenty of time to think. And what you should think about is this. What have I done as a chief that will make someone here want to come back and save me? Silence. Absolute silence. Snotlout looked up at a ring of cold, hard faces. Because, said Gobber conversationally, it will have to be something good. That person will really have to want to save you. Your extra weight will slow down their yacht. Goodbye, Snotlout, said Gober. Think about it. All the yachts shot away, leaving Snotlout alone, with his sword drawn, lying in the sand in the wreck of his broken yacht. Thinking. Nine, the evil reaches. So Hiccup and Stoic and Egingard set off to the east, and within a surprisingly short time they were on their own, the other members of the Amber Hunters team merely specks on the distant horizon. Oh dear, already this was really spooky. No birds called over those sands, not one. Why was that? It must be because they sensed the danger that was below. It was a horrible feeling, racing over those sands, because any minute Hiccup felt that something might reach out of them unexpectedly and grab him by the ankle, like Egingard's story. Egingard didn't help his nerves either, because every time there was a perfectly harmless sucking noise, which was probably the draining of the tide or the glopping of a scallop, she would roar at it, roar, with a loudness and a suddenness that made you practically fall off your sand yard. It probably rather alarmed the scallop, too. The hood of her bear suit was so low down over her face that she couldn't see where she was going. Hiccup would be sledging along, and he'd suddenly realise Egingard had sailed off in the other direction, so he'd have to go and collect her and put her back on course. Eventually, Stoic slowed down and started looking for Amber. Hiccup leaned out and scooped up something glinting in the sand, and then brought the net up to examine what it was. No, not amber at all, just a big old bit of crab shell. He threw it over his shoulder. He sighed, looked warily around him at those bubbling sands to check there was nothing horrible rising out of them, and moved forward. Half an hour passed, and he had found only three pieces of amber, all quite small, and none of them the amber jewel. He was suddenly bowed down by the hopeless ambition of what he was supposed to be doing. How am I? In this whole vast wilderness of sand, supposed to find one single jewel, whispered Hiccup. 
Your heart must be in your quest, said the Woden's Fang, which was all very wise and supportive, but was actually also, to be honest, a little vague and not particularly helpful. Hiccup sighed and carried on hunting. It was quite an odd situation to be out there on the endless wilderness of the Red Sands with a father who doesn't realise you're his son. Go on, Hiccup, whispered the Woden's Fang encouragingly from inside Hiccup's waistcoat. Talk to your father. Tell him who you are and why you are here. Tell him about your quest. It isn't so easy, Hiccup whispered back. He tried to push out of his mind the memory of Baggy Bum saying to Snotlout, I am ashamed to be your father. Stoic wouldn't say that, would he? Perhaps he would, thought Hiccup. He felt slightly sick. First, I'll just try and get a sense of what he's thinking, Hiccup decided. I'll just check that he's not too angry with me. Egingard was off at a little distance, roaring at scallops and picking up the amber with a pole nearly twice as long as she was. But Stoic was examining some amber a couple of feet away. Hiccup walked up behind him and said, as casually as he could, as if he were just interested in an off-hand sort of way. So, Chief Stoic, are you really the father of Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third, the boy the witch is searching the Wilder West for? Stoic threw a piece of amber over his shoulder. He sailed on, checked the sands all around him to see that there was nothing alarming rising out of them, and Hiccup followed. Why do you young people ask all these questions? grumbled Stoic the Vast, putting out his net and scooping up amber, examining it and throwing it over his shoulder again. OK, gulped Hiccup, his voice sliding up from a gruff to a squeak because it had been behaving in that uncontrolled manner quite a lot recently. I've changed my mind. You don't need to answer my question. But Stoic seemed to need to get something off his chest. When I was young, I never asked questions, boomed Stoic. I just did what I was told. I followed the traditions. I stuck to the barbaric code. I walked in the path of my own father and my father's father and my father's father's father. For five minutes he worked in silence, seeking the amber grimly. I tried to bring up my son by the same code, said Stoic, even though he was so different, and he always asked so many questions. Stoic sighed and shook his head. But it is not always easy being a parent. You do your best, of course. I know what he means, thought Hiccup, thinking of how hard it was training Toothless. So when my son asked the question, Father, if you were king, would you free the dragons? I told him the right answer. The only answer, the answer a king should give. Free the dragons? Nonsense. It strikes at our very livelihood, the world that we grew up in. Stoic shook his head incredulously. But what does my son Hiccup do? He rejects my answer, beats his father in a sword fight, and goes over his father's head and asks for freedom for the dragons on his own. Stoic was waving his arms around furiously, walking so fast that Hiccup found it hard to keep up. And see what happens. The archipelago is in flames around us. My honour, my reputation is gone. The ships I sailed in turned to ashes. My chiefdom lost. All our villages burnt. The dragon furious rampant. The old order broken. The world at war. And all... All, said Stoic firmly, coming to a stop and looking deeply into Hiccup's eyes. All because of my son Hiccup and his questions. Silence. Can you blame me for being angry with my son? Hiccup did not say anything. He just walked forward miserably. Is it going well? whispered the warden's fang, hopefully, because he couldn't quite hear through the wind in the waistcoat. No, it wasn't going well. His father blamed him for everything. His father would never forgive him. He was ashamed that Hiccup was his son. And yet, said Stoic, looking into the distance, and yet. The pause that followed was very, very long. If you were to ask me now the question, if I were king, would I free the dragons? I might answer you quite differently, said Stoic at last. The experience of being a slave myself I strangely changed my mind. Stoic began to walk on, slowly. And now, I ask myself, was my son Hiccup actually brave to ask this question? Was he right to ask this question? Was it even a question worth losing a world for? So, 
the answer to your question, McJelly, is yes. I am the father of Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. I am hoping against hope that somewhere out there he is safe and well, and I am proud to be his father, said Stoic the Vast, even though I do not always agree with his questions, and I do not yet know whether they were worth the loss of a world I loved. It was the longest speech Stoic had ever made to Hiccup, and he did not even know that he was speaking to his son. For the first time in six months, Hiccup's heart was lifting with a tiny glimmer of hope. Is my father saying he might be able to forgive me? Is he even saying that he thought maybe I did the right thing? How typical, somehow, that Hiccup happened to be wearing an eye patch, an aromatic smell and a large fake wart on the end of his nose for this most emotional moment. Hiccup was about to say something. About to take off the eye patch and the wart, about to say who he was, when two things happened that interrupted him from doing it. came the very distant sound of a bugle. Roar! roared Egingard in surprise. Up beyond the horizon, where the prison dark heart was, one of those exploding things rocketed into the air to tell them it was time to return before the tide came in. At the same time, the sand crumbled below Hiccup's stationary sand yacht, and the yacht tipped into an indentation in the sand. Hiccup looked down, saw what it was, gave a start of horror and said, Fa I mean, stoic the vast, I think we should be making our way back to Darkheart, don't you? And he hurriedly picked up his yacht and turned it around and started sledging as fast as he could in the direction of the prison. Thank Thor, Toothless and Egengard hadn't seen that. Stoic shielded his eyes and looked out to where he could just see the shining glimmer of the tide on the horizon. We need to move fast now, said Stoic. They had plenty of amber, but no dragon jewel, but they had to return to the prison before the tide came in. Sailing as fast as they could, they met up with the other returning amber hunters. All of them pulled swiftly now, reaching astonishing speeds on those wet sliding sands, afraid that they might yet be caught by that incoming tide. They stopped only to pick up Snot Face Snot Lout, little though he deserved it. We left Snot Face Snot Lout all alone in the eastern sands, you remember, thinking. Well, he thought a great deal over the next two hours, and what he thought made him convinced that nobody was going to come back to save him. He had been running back through that sludgy sand, though he knew that it was hopeless, and even running as fast as he could, he would never be able to outrun the incoming tide. Only a yacht could do that. He was also attacked on the way by three brainless leg removers and two smallish rocket rages, which he had to fight off all on his own. So, all in all, when he finally saw the yachts returning to collect him, he wept with relief. Hiccup had never seen Snotlout cry. He wouldn't have believed it possible. Baggy Bum and Gobber stopped on either side of the weeping, exhausted boy. The lesson today, said Gober, was that you have done nothing to deserve us coming back to save you, Snotlout. Nothing at all. But we are going to save you nonetheless, because perhaps, just perhaps, you might do something in the future. Snotlout said nothing. The two warriors balanced Snotlout in between their two yachts, so that they could still go reasonably fast and paddled back to the prison. They did risk their lives for Snotlout, for he weighed down their yacht and the rest of the slaves were already back at the prison looking anxiously out at the incoming tide, worrying when they realised the Amber Hunters were not back yet. And when they spotted the Amber Hunters on the horizon, racing against the tide and cheered them on as one by one they reached the prison, moving so fast that they had difficulty stopping. Gobber, Baggy Bum and Snotlight were the last in, so late that the tide caught up under the yacht. The wave rolled in with the upended sled and carried them right up to the castle battlements, splashing against them with a wild swoosh. And now, where there had been red sand as far as the eye could see, there was water instead. Has Snotlight learnt his lesson yet? We shall have to wait and see. Snotlout did not speak to Alvin and the witch about the mutiny and treason as he had threatened to, and perhaps that was wise, because that unpleasant pair were not in the kind of mood to listen to complaints. The witch and Alvin strode up and down the bay with whips in their hands, examining each yacht returning from the seeking, and shrieking with disappointment as each one did not contain the dragon jewel. "'Where is it? Where is it? Where is it?' hissed the witch, bounding up to each and every yacht with greedy fury and tumbling the contents out upon the sand. 
when she found that they did not contain the jewel. I do not understand it, Alvin. I saw it in my dream. The dice told me I would be holding the jewel in my hands within the next few days. You will go to the evil reaches again tomorrow, shrieked the witch. And if you do not bring me the jewel, do not bother coming back. As Hiccup followed the slaves to the dungeon bedroom, he thought sadly of the ruins of his original plan. What was he going to do? Sneak in, rescue Fishlegs and his father, find the jewel and sneak out again. This is going to be so much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. He was trapped in the Amber Slave Lands and he had this terrible sinking feeling that he was never going to find the jewel or poor Fishlegs. But all he could do was keep on looking, even though he was more scared than he had ever been before. Now he knew what terrible dangers were lurking out here on the Amber Sands. Because Hiccup did not tell Egingard and Stoic the Vast one small important detail. He didn't even tell the Wodensfang. Back there, when the bugle rang out and Egingard roared, his sand yacht had tipped over, and he looked down and realised that the indentation in the sand was in fact the footprint of a gigantic dragon. And then when he looked up, he thought he'd just caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of his eye, something so unlikely that it seemed that it could not possibly exist. The gigantic hand of a dragon sticking out of the sand, and on the end of each taloned finger, an evil dragon eye, watching, waiting. Hiccup had never seen anything quite like this dragon hand. It was absolutely horrible, like something out of a nightmare. Hiccup did not tell Egingard, because he thought it might be bad for morale. Ten. The Deadly Shadow Hiccup was so tired, he fell asleep immediately. All around the castle battlements, the nightly shrieking and the screaming of the Dragon Rebellion had begun. The exploding weapons, the whine of the arrows being launched at the dragon attackers... But while the sentries were on duty up there on the battlements, the rest of the prison was sleeping. Witch, king, warriors, slaves and all. And that night, through the quiet corridors of the sleeping prison, something moved like an invisible mist. You could not see the shining mirage of the deadly shadow as he crept through the rooms like a silent doom. But he was there, nonetheless, like death himself. He knew exactly where he was heading. Outside the dungeon entrance he paused and his three heads sniffed with satisfaction, drinking in the smell of hiccup. If you could have seen the shadow, you would have seen a gorgeous, shining, invisible tail disappearing down the stairs going to the dungeon, like the tail of a beautiful imaginary cat entering a mouse hole. But you couldn't see him. Meanwhile, Hiccup woke up from a nightmare about the monster of the slave lands breaking into prison Darkheart itself, and then, when he sat up, sweating, he found nothing there but the slaves all around him, sleeping the sleep of those who had spent an exhausting day sailing their way across the sands. But what was that? He thought he heard a noise, a noise that was nearer than the constant, distant din of the Dragon Rebellion outside. There it was again. He strained to hear the noise once more. Nothing. Toothless and the Wodensfang were still snoring on the straw, they were sleeping so soundly. Surely that must mean it was nothing. Surely they would wake up if there was any real danger. But still Hiccup's heart beat as quick as a mouse. What was that noise? Was that the noise of nothing? He was just thinking that the entire thing had been all in his imagination when out of nowhere something jumped on him, wrapping itself tightly around his mouth so he could not scream, and he and the Wodensfang and Toothless were wrapped around like a parcel and picked up off the bed. The Wodensfang's ears were as purple as blueberries and jumping about, pointing to north, south, east and west, so violently they threatened to rattle themselves right off the poor Wodensfang's head. Danger! The Wodensfang was trying to squeak. Danger! 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 but Hiccup had already realised he was in a dangerous situation. Hiccup tried to struggle, but his arms and legs were clamped by his sides, as if by tentacles or some strange invisible force so strong that he could barely move as he was inexorably carried off. He was so scared he could hardly think. How could he be attacked from inside the castle? What could this be? 
his mind jostled with rocket rages, with piranha hermit dragons, with something worse than all of these, something that could not possibly exist, a thing with a claw that had an eye atop every single talon. But how could any of these things in real life sneak past the sentries that were currently blasting their way at anything that tried to get near the castle walls? Oof! cried Hiccup, trying to kick out. Oof! 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 Eleven. A genuine surprise. Hiccup could feel himself being carried up the dungeon stairs, could hear the sound of soft footsteps and whispers all around him, and then, as he struggled, he began to realise the voices he was hearing were not dragon voices, but human voices. He had a feeling of being dragged into a smaller area where the voices became more echoey and even colder than the dungeon, and then, more surprising still, he recognised the voice of someone he knew well, but just hadn't heard for a very long time. Don't panic, said the voice. We're friends. We're here to help you escape from prison dark heart. We had to cover your mouth in case you screamed, because you weren't expecting us. And then the hands unwound him from the sheet he was wrapped in and took the gag and blindfold from his head, and he was in what felt like some sort of drainage tunnel. And he was surrounded by faces, the nearest of which he did, indeed, know very well. Kamikaze, whispered Hiccup in joyful surprise. Kamikaze was a small, chatty and recklessly brave bog burglar with a lot of wild blonde hair that looked like squirrels had been breakdancing vigorously in the back of it. She also just so happened to be one of Hiccup's best friends. Kamikaze looked at him for a moment in puzzlement and then she pulled up his eye patch, took off his wart and exclaimed in gobsmacked, happy astonishment, Hiccup! Bog burglars aren't supposed to show when they're really pleased to see someone, so Kamikaze now turned bright red with the effort of not knowing what to do. She scowled furiously and pummeled Hiccup three times on the shoulder, and then she hugged him, and then she hit him again, a little harder this time, whispering ferociously, and if it hadn't been Kamikaze you might have said slightly tearfully, in between each punch, "'Where have you been?' I haven't been worried about you, she added hastily. No, no, I haven't been worried, because us bog burglars never worry. We're too cool. But where have you been? Ow, uh, grinned Hiccup, holding his slightly bruised shoulder. You're the first person who's actually recognised me. Not that I actually want people to recognise me in this place, but still, it's nice to know that I haven't changed completely in just one year. Kamikaze was still bright red and scowling more furiously than ever. Why didn't you come and find me? She hid her face in her elbow. Was it because I turned my back with everybody else when the witch got us to at the school? Because I'm sorry about that, Hiccup, and I've been wishing and wishing that I had stood up for you like Fishlegs did ever since. It was just a bit of a shock about the slave mark and everything. No, no, Hiccup assured her. It wasn't that. I knew all along that you didn't really mean to turn your back. You're sure, said Kamikaze, still a little muffled. Absolutely sure, lied Hiccup, awkwardly. Besides, I was watching you the whole time, and it wasn't really a full turn. It was just a sort of twist, a kind of sideways-on half-turn, if you like, and only for a moment. A half-turn? sniffed Kamikaze, hopefully. The only reason I didn't come and find you was that everybody's after me at the moment, and I didn't want to put you in danger as well, explained Hiccup. Well, that wasn't very kind of you, was it? grinned Kamikaze, who had cheered up no end. You know I love danger! She rubbed her hands together excitedly. Danger is my favourite thing. Yes. Well, said Hiccup, changing the subject. Speaking of danger, what on earth are you doing here, Kamikaze? We are the escape artists, explained Kamikaze, beaming. This is my team, Sporter, Typhoon, Harrietta Horse, Beef Burger. She introduced the four bog burglars who were sitting beside her in the drainage tunnel. They had been the ones who had wrapped Hiccup in the sheet, and they must have carried him together along the corridor. They were all considerably larger than Kamikaze, but dressed similarly in black burglary suits, with a lot of burglary equipment and weaponry dangling off them. To Hiccup's surprise, the other bog burglars blushed and looked extremely self-conscious as they shook his hand. "'This isn't the outcast, is it?' blurted Typhoon. That's right, said Kamikaze carelessly, but bursting with pride. This is my friend, the outcast Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. 
It was very nice to have somebody being so proud to present him to others as their friend. Wow, said Typhoon, pumping his hand. This is an honour. Kamikaze's been telling us about your work, hasn't she, guys? Releasing the dragon traps, standing up against those fiends, Alvin and the witch. Respect. Thank you, said Hiccup in surprise. Meanwhile, Toothless was delighted too. Slinking behind Kamikaze in the tunnel was Stormfly, Kamikaze's gorgeous golden mood dragon, who changed colour according to her mood, and Toothless was in love with Stormfly. Uh, hello, Stormfly, stammered Toothless, carelessly. Why, hello there, Toothless, said Stormfly. We're uh, uh, outcasts. You should see Toothless in an eye patch. I bet you look marvellous simpered that mischievous mood dragon, turning a little purple. And this is Toothless's sidekick, uh, Woden's Fang, the Desperado. Don't cross him, he's one tough dragon. The Woden's Fang was a little surprised to be introduced as Toothless's sidekick, but obligingly he tried to make himself look tough, which was tricky for a dragon who was thousands of years old, no larger than a biscuit tin and a little wobbly on his legs. There are p p posters up in the forest about us and everything boasted Toothless. "'Us escape artists are running an escape service, you see,' explained Kamikaze. "'As soon as I heard they'd taken fish legs to Darkheart, I put the team together. I thought, I've escaped from so many places myself over the years, why not go the whole hog and offer a truly professional escape service?' "'Don't tell my mother, by the way,' added Kamikaze, looking a bit guilty. "'You're a bit pongy, Hiccup, she said, conversationally. Kamikaze was always one to get straight to the point. Stink dragon, explained Hiccup. It's part of my disguise. Nice one, admired Kamikaze. Check out some of mine. She rifled in her rucksack and brought out the Wilder West prison guard costume, the dragon outfit, in case we get cornered by a dragon rebellion attack, the peaceable farmer get up. They're fantastic, Kamikaze, said Hiccup. I think the moustache may go too far, though. No, said Kamikaze, disappointed and trying it on. It's one of my favourites. I'm just astonished that you've found a way out of this prison, marvelled Hiccup. People have been trying to escape from here for centuries, not to mention the Dragon Furious has been trying to get in. It's amazing. Kamikaze had a few faults, like most of us, one of which was that she was not very modest. That's because I'm brilliant, said Kamikaze, smugly. You have to look for a building's weaknesses, you see, drainage tunnels, that sort of thing. Look at my collapsible ladder, made entirely out of broken oars. Oh, dear. That ladder did look perhaps a little too collapsible. You can't feed a bog burger in a breakout situation, I'm telling you, beamed Kamikaze. And fish legs, did you rescue fish legs? Hiccup asked eagerly, his heart lifting with hope. Kamikaze shook her head sadly. No, we got here about a week ago and we were too late for fish legs. Oh no, 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 no. What do you think happened to him? asked Hiccup. Kamikaze sighed. Well, when we arrived, we rescued this boy called Bobble Hands, she explained. Bug-eyed Bobble Hands, asked Hiccup. Kamikaze nodded. He showed us Fish Legs' bed, which is the one that you were sleeping in. He said that Fish Legs had gone missing the day before. Hiccup could not believe it. Kamikaze sighed. She knew what Hiccup was thinking. I know, she said. I didn't want to believe it either. Since then, even though we couldn't rescue fish legs, we've been trying to rescue a person every few days. Any more, and we reckon the witch will start realising that something is up. Well, that explained why the people in the bed Hiccup had been sleeping in kept on mysteriously disappearing. Hiccup felt relieved on Egingard's behalf, because she must have been terrified when every morning she woke up and another one had gone. No wonder she thought that the monster had taken them. But what had happened to fish legs? Hiccup touched the lobster necklace that Fishlegs had given him for comfort. As Kamikaze had said, Fishlegs was the only one who had not turned his back at the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. Fishlegs had always been there, believing in Hiccup. I'm so glad we set up the escape service, though, said Kamikaze. Now we can help you to escape. I don't want to escape, said Hiccup. I have to find Fishlegs. Kamikaze looked very serious suddenly. Hiccup! You are the only chance we've got. The whole of the archipelago is relying on you. We are, said Typhoon. You betcha, said Harriet a horse. You have to face it, Hiccup, said Kamikaze sadly. Fishlegs is gone. 
You should be out there finding the jewel, and I don't think the jewel is here. Yes, we've all been thinking that too, said the warden's fang. It's one of Grimbeard's red herrings. What did the funny little brown dragon say? asked Kamikaze. Never mind, said Hiccup, stubbornly and defiantly. I'm not escaping. I'm still looking for fish legs, whatever you might say. Kamikaze sighed. OK, then, in which case I am staying here with you. You are only a boy, after all, she reminded him condescendingly. You really need a girl to help protect you on this quest. You are not staying here, argued Hiccup. What would your mother say? Oh, she wouldn't mind, lied Kamikaze vaguely. She's got her hands full with the Dragon Rebellion. They're attacking the Bog Burglar Islands every single night now, a bit like you. No way are you staying here, Kamikaze, repeated Hiccup. You haven't got a slave mark. It's way too dangerous. Besides, he said hastily, remembering how much she loved danger, and so this would just be an encouragement, you have to lead your escape service. There's this kid called Egingard who sleeps opposite me, and I think she really needs to escape. The whole dark heart experience is getting her down. All right, then, said Kamikaze, thoughtful for a second, and then allowing herself to be distracted. Bog burglars! She addressed the escape artist in a loud, conspiratorial whisper. Let's put into action Operation Egingard! Operation Egingard, repeated Typhoon, Sporter, Harrietta Horse and Beefburger, giving each other the Bog Burglar high five. Twelve. Bear Mama. Meanwhile, the deadly shadow slunk through the door of the dungeon that Kamikaze had left open. You couldn't see it, of course, but the sniff, sniff, sniffing noise went snuffling across the floor like the sludgy trail of an invisible snail, and a light wind blew through the centre of the dungeon. The deadly shadow's talons were already out. Its broken heart was pure steel. The red rage had so clouded its invisible eyes that they had almost become visible with hatred. The snuffling stopped at Hiccup's bed. The bed was empty. The shadow gave a surprised snort, and its talons raked through the remains of straw and bedding. Nothing there either. The boy must be somewhere else. The deadly shadow was so steaming mad that for one moment he turned visible, and you could see the actual smoke that was drifting out of all six of his ears. The shadow silently exploded what remained of the bed, and it stalked out the door again on furious, silent tiptoes and woe betide Hiccup if the creature ever found him. Two minutes later, Hiccup and the bog burglar escape artists arrived back at the door of the dungeon. What has happened here? whispered Hiccup, looking at his bed, which seemed quite literally to have exploded, sending a rain of straw all round it in every direction. Wow, said Kamikaze, you're a restless sleeper. Hiccup started trying to tidy it up. You better get a move on, guys, if you want to escape with Egingard before morning. So Kamikaze and the bog burglars were about to do their normal routine of bundling up Egingard in her blanket while she was still asleep, but Hiccup wouldn't let them. You might worry her, said Hiccup. So Hiccup woke her up gently. Shh, said Hiccup. These are some friends of mine, Egingard, and they are going to help you escape back to your tribe and your mother. Egingard looked at him with her big, solemn eyes, and then she gave a huge, gap-toothed smile. Do you think I have a mother? smiled Egingard. I'm sure you do, said Hiccup, and I bet she's been really missing you. And he redid the buttons on her bear suit so they were in the right buttonholes so she'd look her best for her mother. Kamikaze, whispered Hiccup, I think maybe you should deliver Egingard back to her tribe, the Northern Wanderers. You'll find them up north somewhere wandering about. Now that... He added craftily, now that is going to be a really dangerous mission because you have to go through Dragon Rebellion territory to get there. OK, Kamikaze whispered back. Hiccup looked at her suspiciously. It was unlike Kamikaze to be quite so obedient. Bye then, Kamikaze. Bye, said Kamikaze, widening her big blue eyes innocently. Goodbye, Egingard, whispered Hiccup. Goodbye, Hiccup, Egingard whispered back. Goodbye, Stonefly, said Toothless, doing three elaborate somersaults in the air to show off, nearly knocking himself out when he bumped into a pillar in the process and then struggling to rearrange himself in the air to look glamorous. Goodbye, Toothless the Outcast, 
cooed the mood dragon, batting her eyelashes coquettishly at the slightly dazed Toothless as she followed Kamikaze and the bog burglar escape artists and Egengard, tiptoeing out the room. And that was how Egengard made her escape from the Amber Slave Lands and from this story, back to the safe, warm arms of her mother, Bear Mama, who had indeed been missing her, back to the magical stories of her scary wanderer grandmother, and back to the admiration of her little brother Bear Cub, whom she had never met. OK, so at least Kamikaze is going to be all right and out of danger for a while, thought Hiccup, dozily. It'll take the bog burglar escape artists quite a long time to locate the Northern Wanderer tribe. I wonder who did this, whispered the Wodensfang, looking at the rags and straw strewn all over the place, his ears doing that going purple and indicating danger thing. Wodensfang, you're paranoid, said Hiccup, yawning. It's only paranoia, whispered the Wodensfang, if things aren't out to get you. But Hiccup and Toothless were already asleep. 13. The past has a way of catching up with you. Very, very early the next morning, the first drizzle of sun rose over the dragon's graveyard. The red rage attack subsided with the first appearance of the sun, and the exploding things fell silent on the battlements. But who was this? picking his way in a little boat through the lingering smoke of the explosions, those grim cathedrals of dragon's bones where the seagulls are now shrieking. It was the hairy, scary librarian, an old enemy of Hiccup's. He was a tall, bent, sinister figure, with a beard so long it was dribbling after him in the water like he was taking it for a swim, and two amber nets on long poles that he called his heart slicers. The S on the librarian's forehead, proclaimed that he was a slave, but he was what was known as a trusty slave, which meant that the prison guards trusted him to go out of the prison for short tasks and expeditions, such as this one. He was collecting up the spears and ammunition so the Wilder West warriors could use them when the rebellion attacked again tomorrow night. The hairy, scary librarian pulled his way past the dismal, fresh corpse of a gigantic rhino back. He spotted something by a little island, hidden in the reeds. He stretched out his right hand heart slicer and picked up the something in the net and hauled it, dripping wet, into his boat. It was a helmet. The hairy, scary librarian tipped the helmet over, pouring out the water. Tick-tock went the wheels in his brain as he remembered the Visithug warriors returning to the prison several weeks ago, seeing how they had nearly caught Hiccup the outcast undoing dragon traps again. They had described Hiccup as wearing a very particular helmet, one just like this one, with that rather stupid broken plume on the top. So whispered the hairy, scary librarian, smiling a horrid smile. This is Hiccup's helmet, is it? Which means... Smiled the librarian, laughing wheezily to himself. That Hiccup is somewhere in the prison, and I can tell the witch and get my own back on that horrible little Hiccup who is the reason I am here in the first place, and get my freedom into the bargain. The librarian turned and pulled his way back to prison Darkheart, slaloming crazily through the corpses with all the eagerness of one who has waited long to settle an old score. Everything we do, you see, has its consequences and repercussions. Every kind act and every bad. Every friend we make and every enemy. Everything is connected. 14. The luck turns Alvin's way. Horribly early the next morning, even earlier than normal, the prison guards woke everybody up by banging their swords on their shields and yelling, Everybody up and in the courtyard! The witch Excelinor has called a crisis meeting! Blearily and half asleep, Hiccup staggered up the dungeon stairs to the courtyard with all the other slaves. 
And then suddenly he felt very awake indeed, nerve-tinglingly, eye-openingly, brilliantly awake as he tried to peer between the enormous guys in front of him to see the witch and Alvin the treacherous sitting at the table. The witch was tapping her iron fingernails, and in front of the witch was yet another someone who Hiccup knew from the past. They say that the past has a way of catching up with you, and the distant and not-so-distant past was certainly catching up with Hiccup big time in the two days in which he had been trapped in the great prison Darkheart. The hairy, scary librarian was holding in his hands Hiccup's helmet, the one that Windwalker had accidentally left in the bay because he was so upset. Arg! It was too late for Hiccup to get away now. He was so wedged in by the crowd, he couldn't even move. Alvin the Treacherous stood up, his wart swelling with revolting, gloating triumph, like he'd just won the barbaric games. Miserable slaves of the Amber Slave Lands, called out Alvin. We have a traitor in our midst. Murmurs of astonishment among the slaves. This morning, continued Alvin, one of our trusty slaves, Harry here, was out in the bay of the dragon's graveyard, cleaning up after the dragon rebellion attack when he discovered this helmet. My warriors tell me that this was the very helmet that was worn by that traitor, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III, when they last found him undoing our dragon traps. Oh, for Thor's sake, thought Hiccup bitterly. I knew I never liked that helmet. And we have also recently discovered a secret door that opens onto a drainage tunnel that leads directly into the prison from outside. Hang on, thought Hiccup, that wasn't me. It was the bog burglar escape artists. They must have left the door open. Which means, said the witch silkily, that somehow that tricksy little traitor of the Wilder West has sneaked into this prison, the imposter, and he will be somewhere here among you slaves. Sensation in the courtyard, with everyone looking at one another and wondering who the traitor was. Of course, purred the witch, we could get everyone to try on the helmet and see who it fits. In which case I'll be fine, thought Hiccup, slightly hysterically, because quite apart from being horribly itchy, that helmet never fitted. But I, smiled Alvin, have thought of a far neater plan. You see, said Alvin, the reason that this traitor boy Hiccup can never be a king like me is that to be a king you have to be strong and make tough decisions. Hiccup is weak, sneered Alvin. He is too soft to be a king. Hiccup horrendous Haddock the Third, cried Alvin the Treacherous. Give yourself up, or I shall kill this boy. Alvin the Treacherous reached out with one arm and grabbed the nearest member of the hooligan tribe that he could see and held his wicked hook to that boy's throat. Now, the boy he grabbed happened to be Snotlout. Alvin, you see, had forgotten that Hiccup and Snotlout were sworn enemies. He just knew that Hiccup was a member of the hooligan tribe and therefore would be sentimental about hooligans and therefore grab the closest hooligan he could find. Here I say, objected Snotlout in astonishment, I'm not a slave, I'm a warrior. And I'm your loyal subject, King Alvin. I was the one who told your mother about Hiccup having the slave mark. Snotlout had already had a very difficult 24 hours. His ego had taken quite a bashing out there on the sands yesterday. But you see... Alvin the Treacherous did not have a grateful nature. Alvin ignored this, and if anything, held the hook a little closer, so that blood dropped down from Snotlout's throat. You better be quick, screamed Alvin. This hook is hungry. Now this is what you might call a moral dilemma. Snotlout had been mean to Hiccup all his life. He was a bully, and a thoroughly bad lot. He was, indeed, the one who had thrown the stone that revealed Hiccup as having the slave mark, when Hiccup had been about to be crowned Champion of Champions and King of the Wilder West in the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. But how could Hiccup, in cold blood, let Alvin the Treacherous kill Snotlout? Snotlout was his cousin and a fellow human being. And maybe, just maybe, very, very deep down indeed, there was some good in Snotlout after all. And possibly there was some way out of this completely packed courtyard so he could escape even after he'd given himself up. Hiccup sighed. Maybe Alvin is right. Maybe I am too weak to be a king. I can't believe I'm doing this for Snotlout of all people. And then he put up his hand 
and shouted, OK, I give myself up. I am Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III. I am the outcast. After six months on the run, it felt pretty scary to be finally revealing himself. Aha! said Alvin in satisfaction, and he dropped a highly relieved snotmouth and looked out eagerly at the crowd of slaves. I knew it! crowed Alvin. Three rows back into the crowd, Stoic the Vast gasped in amazement and tried to peer round to see what his son might be. Whiffy McSmelly! Surely, surely you cannot be Hiccup! Yes! Hiccup shouted up through the large people who were boxing him in. It is me! But this is wonderful! cried Stoic joyfully, jumping up and down, trying to look over people's heads. Hiccup, you're alive! I can't tell you how relieved I am. My boy, I... I I'm so sorry I didn't recognise you. I can't believe I didn't recognise you. Well, I was wearing my disguise, Hiccup shouted back to make him feel better. He took off his really not very cunning disguise of the eye patch and wiped off the remains of the dirt with the end of his sleeve. He couldn't remove the smell, of course. And I changed a bit because I got a little older. I came to see if I could help. Less talking, yelled Alvin. Don't let the little rat talk. He's always talking his way out of trouble. Pass him up to the front there. The crowd around Hiccup picked him up and hand to hand passed him over everyone's heads up to the front where the witch and Alvin were standing. Oh, yes, Hiccup, said Stoic, trying not to breathe in as he passed over his head. You're looking well, but adolescence has hit you hard, my poor boy. The body odours can be bad in the teenage years. Stink dragon, Hiccup explained, shaking his father's happy hand as he went by. So you wouldn't look at me too carefully. Oh, that's a relief, rattled Stoic, so off his balance that he did not know what he was saying. Otherwise you'd have terrible trouble getting a girlfriend. But why are you here, Hiccup? The visitor at the front of the crowd put Hiccup down gently in front of Alvin and the witch. I came to see if I could help, said Hiccup. I came to see if I could rescue you. Well done, Hiccup, boomed Gobber, giving a supportive thumbs up from the crowd. Very brave coming here to rescue us. Yes, cried Stoic. Well done, son. I'm proud of you. Shut up, screamed the witch. Rescue you? How can a little rat this small rescue you? Search him, she screeched. Uh-oh, Toothless whispered to the warden's fang as the two little dragons crouched at the crack of Hiccup's waistcoat. We gotta go, uh, the warden's fang, the desperado, we're c- c- cornered. Fly, whispered Hiccup in dragonese, and the warden's fang and Toothless burst out of Hiccup's waistcoat like twin hummingbirds, Toothless giving out little bursts of fire, pew, 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 like he was trying to shoot his way out. But the hairy, scary librarian was standing just next to Hiccup, and he was just as fast with his left hand as he was with his right. He drew those amber nets from his belt quick as lightning, just as he used to draw his heart slicer swords. Frick, frick, went the hairy, scary librarian's amber nets, and he caught the warden's fang with his left net and toothless with his right, tied the ends of the nets up nice and tight, and presented them to Alvin with a low, cringing bow. Toothless and the warden's fang howled in horror, for dragons are wild creatures, and nothing upsets them more than being trapped. And then the librarian turned to Hiccup, and narrowed his eyes. Never cross a librarian, spat the hairy, scary librarian with venom, his voice like broken glass, for librarians are patient, and they can wait for their revenge. Dragons, screeched the witch triumphantly, pointing a dramatic finger at the warden's fang and toothless, all tangled and desperately struggling in the librarian's amber nets. I smell dragons, see? We are at war with the entire dragon race. They have reduced our villages to black dust, and yet the traitor carries dragons on him. The warriors of the Wilder West did not like that, under attack as they were every night by dragons, and they roared in fury. Don't worry, mother, said Alvin in delight. I'll just squash them with my foot. He flung Toothless on the ground and lifted his metal foot. No! shrieked the witch. The Toothless Dragon is a lost thing, remember? We need him so you can be crowned King of the Wilder West. Curses, swore Alvin the Treacherous. But I can still kill the other one. No! shrieked Hiccup, thinking very speedily. I don't know which one is the lost thing, for they both have no teeth. Quick as a wink, the warden's fang sucked in his teeth. Double curses, swore Alvin the Treacherous, looking down at the supposedly toothless warden's fang in a baffled sort of way. But I can kill something shortly. I can kill Hiccup, said Alvin, cheering up. Please let me kill Hiccup, mother. He's not a lost thing. 
He's the finder of the king's lost things, though, said the witch. Of course you can kill Hiccup, Alvin, my darling, and you'll do a lovely creative job of it, I know, but you'll just have to postpone that pleasure until he's found us the last lost thing, the jewel. The little rat draws the lost things to him like he's a little lost thing magnet, rot him. We just have to motivate him properly, and luckily I am very good at motivating children. Oh, dear, shivered Hiccup, now completely petrified. This doesn't sound too great. The hairy, scary librarian interrupted with an apologetic cough, cringing before the witch and wiping his mouth with the end of his beard. Talking of motivation, I believe you offered freedom to any slave who brought you the little thieving magpie who is the traitor of the Wilder West. My library is waiting for me. I have been gone from it for too long. Freedom, witch. Freedom. I claim my freedom. Freedom. Again, it was pathetic to see how the crowds of slaves leaned forward eagerly. Freedom, they crooned after the librarian longingly. Freedom. Freedom to the librarian meant being back in his library, lurking through the passages, guarding his precious books, and in his mind he was already there, wandering the labyrinth, happy in that darkness. But if there was anyone on this good green earth who was even less grateful than Alvin himself, it was Alvin's mother, Excelinor. Now she had Hiccup to find her the jewel, she no longer needed to motivate either the slaves or this librarian. Freedom! laughed the witch in surprise. What is this nonsense about freedom? Slaves can never be freed. The slave mark is a mark that can never be removed. But, spluttered the librarian, you said it could be burnt off. You promised it could be burnt off. I may have said a little white lie, but only because I care so much about winning the war for all of us, lied the witch. Throw this librarian back into the crowd. The hairy, scary librarian learnt the hard way, just exactly how empty is the promise of a witch. Now, said the witch, bounding forward and crouching down to Hiccup's level, I am going to give you a very clear goal, Mr Cleverclog's lost thing finder. I want you to find us the dragon jewel in... Oh, the witch searched her mind for a good number and settled on three. In exactly three hours, or I won't just kill the boy with the unfeasibly large nostrils. I'll kill everybody. I'll set the ticking thing. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Three hours, said Alvin in bewilderment, looking out through the open door at the end of the courtyard at the vast expanse of red sands, stretching out as far as the eye could see. You want him to find the dragon jewel in three hours. Uh, Mother, these sons have been scoured by the amber nets of thousands and thousands of slaves. If they haven't found the jewel, how is Hiccup going to find it in just three hours? And Mother, there are those that think that maybe the jewel is not here. Grimbeard had a terrible sense of humour, you know. Alvin gestured to his hook. Look at my hand and the coffin lid. Hiccup is the jewel finder, shrieked the witch. He found the crown of the Wilder West in just three hours, didn't he? When Flashburn had been looking for it for twenty years. Trust me, he's the kind of boy who needs a deadline. Oh, for Thor's sake, she'd gone bananas. I wish you'd let me deal with him right now instead, grumbled Alvin. He slipped through my hook so many times. Look what happened in the Flashburn school of sword fighting and in the forest of Berserk. We won't make that mistake again, said the witch. I've learnt my lesson. Last time I let him go down into the tunnels and the fire pit on his own. This time we will not let the little rat out of our sight for even one single second. Give the little horror the map, screamed the witch. Get the little worm his sand yacht. Get his nets. Get his poles. Put on his helmet. I don't need the helmet. Hiccup interrupted hastily, but the witch ignored him. Give the little nightmare all the equipment he needs. So the warriors rushed around, finding Hiccup his equipment and kitting him out for the seeking. And five minutes later, Hiccup found himself standing on the slightly wobbly platform of the hopeful Puffin 2, holding his amber net in one shaking hand and Grimbeard the Ghastly's map of the amber slave lands in the other, and the horrible, itchy helmet back, still not fitting, on his head. Poor old Toothless and the Wodensfang, still in the librarian's heart-slicer amber nets, were now hanging from the end of the royal sandboat, and they peered sadly through the nets at Hiccup. 
and huddled around Hiccup in a circle was a crowd of warriors and slaves of the Wilder West, hundreds and hundreds deep, all on their sand yachts, all heavily armed with knives and swords and daggers and axes and longbows and clubs, and all of these weapons were pointed directly at Hiccup. The witch wasn't taking any chances. One big guy was even aiming one of those massive rocket launcher thingamies at Hiccup, not to mention a whole row of soldiers with their machines that threw five spears at once and bows that launched twenty arrows simultaneously. Alvin alone could have overtaken Hiccup in three strokes of a heartbeat on his massive royal sand yacht with the cutting edges pulled by Gumboil and at least three others, and he had screwed the storm blade into his arm attachment just in case. Now, hissed the witch, no sudden movements, you little reptile, or we'll blast you to Valhalla and back again. Show him, Gormless. Gormless let fly the spear-throwing machine, and ching, 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 six spears buried themselves in a tight circle around the hopeful puffin too. Hiccup gulped. One spear would kill me, witch, said Hiccup. You don't need a hundred. Find us the jewel, screamed Alvin the treacherous. Fifteen. Hiccup sets off to find the jewel. Everyone was looking at Hiccup expectantly. OK, now this really was a tricky situation. He looked down at the map, hoping it would help, but he had looked at that map so many times in the last year and it had never been helpful. The red herring Grimbeard had painted on the top somehow looked like it was laughing at him. His visor fell down with a clang that sounded horribly like a death knell. He edged the hopeful puffin too out very slightly onto the endless red sands. Hundreds of warriors on their sand yachts followed. An outsider watching this would have seen it as ridiculous. Hiccup on his sand yacht, the hopeful puffin too, making its erratic way forward, followed by all these soldiers of the Wilder West on their sand yachts, all with their arrows pointing at Hiccup. Find it! shrieked the witch. Now! Hiccup moved the yacht forward a little and stopped. Two hundred yachts followed a little and stopped. You're going to have to give me a little room, Hiccup called out, to give my jewel-finding senses some space to develop. Give the nasty toad a little room, yelled the witch, but not too much room, just a tiny bit of room. A little bit more? No, not that much. As if things weren't complicated enough, the basket on Hiccup's yacht was very, very heavy. So heavy that it might have been filled with rocks and amber already. And Hiccup suspected he knew why. Those innocent blue eyes. When Hiccup was a tiny bit ahead so no one would hear, he pulled up his visor. Not without difficulty, the beastly thing still had a tendency to jam, and whispered softly out of the corner of his mouth, "'What are you doing in there, Kamikaze? I told you to escape.' And how did you know this was my sand yacht? You wrote the hopeful puff in two on the back of it, explained the basket, adding hastily, and I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of this Kami what's it? Kamikaze, I know perfectly well it's you in there, hissed Hiccup. Why didn't you escape with the rest of your escape team? I've trained the team well, Kamikaze whispered back. They can take the Eggingard kid to the Wanderers without me. If you think I'm going to half turn my back on you again, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third, you've got another think coming. From now on, I'm never letting you out of my sight. What's going on? It was very shrieky out there. It's a long story, said Hiccup. I have to find the jewel in three hours or the witch will kill everybody. But I'm not sure the jewel is out here, said Kamikaze in the basket. Try telling the witch that, said Hiccup. So, do we attack? said the basket after a while. I've got two drawn swords in here and a dagger between my teeth. That may not be enough, admitted Hiccup, looking at the hundreds of following sand yachts, the thicket of swords, the rocket launchers, the warriors with their killer eyes all trained on him, the north bows stretched to breaking point. What's the plan then? asked Kamikaze. Hiccup sighed. The truth was, at that particular moment he was all out of plans. The enormous wilderness of the sands with no jewel in them stretching in front of him and the army of heavily armed people bristling with the worst in weaponry that the human mind could dream up all edging threateningly up behind him were slightly sapping his creativity. He had that feeling of dread again, sitting in his stomach like cold porridge. I'm not sure, muttered Hiccup. Knowing that dreadful trickster of a grimbeard, there is probably no jewel for at least six miles in any direction. It's probably at the other end of the beastly archipelago. So you admit it, said Kamikaze, delightedly. Steady, don't let that tricksy little rat out of your sight, whispered the witch Excelinor from behind Hiccup and the sand yacht. Keep your arrows steady now. 
Have you found it yet, you disgusting little shrimp? And then something truly extraordinary happened. You have to see it through the witch's eyes and the eyes of the hundreds and hundreds of slaves and warriors of the Wilder West gathered there on the sands. To them, it must have seemed like some sort of miracle, some kind of supernatural magic. There they were in their thousands, bristling with armour and with all their swords pointing at Hiccup, the guards with their sand yachts with super-huge sails that could easily outrun Hiccup's battered old sand yacht, particularly because he was weighed down by Kamikaze, but of course they didn't know that. There was no way that Hiccup could possibly slip through their fingers. Absolutely no possible way. But then, one second he was in front of them, oaring his sand yacht on its raggedy, slightly erratic progress, wobbling heavily to the left. And the next, there was a rush of wind above their heads, a sort of blurring of the air as if a sudden very specific mist had come down. And then, there was a short, sharp cry, and the next moment... It was as if Hiccup, sand yacht, basket and all were swallowed up in one gulping swoop by the very air above them. It was unbelievable. One minute he was there, the next he was gone. The crowd with their weapons and their axes and their swords looked at the spot where he was last seen with goggling eyes and jaws agape and huge gasps of wondering, disbelieving, gobsmacked amazement. He's gone, said Gumboyle slowly. He's completely vanished. No! shrieked the witch. No, 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 no! As Gumboyle hastily oared the witch's sand yacht to the absolute spot where last he was. It's not possible! It's just not possible! King Alvin's royal sand yacht came to a gloomy, swishing stop beside her. I did tell you, mother, I have a long history with this brat. And we should have hooked him to death while we had a chance. I've been keeping my hook especially sharp on purpose. There is a kind of satisfaction that comes with being right, even when it is to your disadvantage. And now he even has the map, said Alvin, with a kind of grim, gloomy smugness. It's not possible, screamed the witch. He must be here somewhere. Dig! Dig! You fools, dig! The witch sprang animal-like from her sand yacht and began to dig herself with her iron fingernails, raking up the sand in great handfuls like some desperate, exasperated dog, as if in some extraordinary way Hiccup could have spirited himself below the sand, sand yacht and all. The warriors and the slaves rushed to help her with their spades, digging yet another hopeless, pointless hole like so many of the other hopeless, pointless holes that they had dug in this bay. Suddenly, the witch paused in her hopeless digging, hands full of sand, and sniffed the air and she began to jump on all fours, and down to all fours again, like a cat, leaping, and at the top of each leap she clawed the very air with her bony hands, as if she could scratch the boy out of the sky itself with her long iron fingernails, and bring him down with her puny arms. He's up here! I know it! I know it! I can see it with my true blind eyes! I see him! she screeched. Quite an impressive effort for an elderly woman. And the crowds of warriors and curious slaves watching this on their sand yachts began to whisper to each other, Oh, she's lost it now. She was always on the edge, but now she's gone completely bananas. And then, because the Vikings are a superstitious lot, and impressed by anything that looks magic, did you see the boy, though? Completely disappeared into thin air. I've heard he did the same thing a couple of years ago in the Fortress of Sinister. He flew, flew in the air, with no dragon, no anything. No, absolutely, on my best blue helmet he did. Do you think he really could be the... Silence! roared Alvin the Treacherous, sensing the whispering. Silence! The next traitor that talks, they shall be talking to Hookie here, who is itching for blood as it is. Silence on the red sands. Half of you get down on your knees and dig, howled Alvin the Treacherous, and the other half jump in the air for the boy in case he's still up there. Slowly, the peoples of the archipelago began to obey. And if the great god Thor had been looking down at that moment, perhaps he might have reflected with an ironic smile at the state that the proud, independent peoples of the archipelago had got themselves into. Hundreds upon hundreds of them, digging a pointless hole in the middle of the sands, or jumping fruitlessly in the air, while the winds blew all around them, and the sands stretched away forever. Sixteen. The Triple Header Deadly Shadow It was a very satisfactory moment to see the effect of Hiccup's magical disappearance on the witch and the crowds of the Wilder West. However, unfortunately, as you will have guessed, Hiccup's magical disappearance wasn't so very magical after all. 
He had, in fact, been abducted by the triple head or deadly shadow dragon, who was working as an assassin for the Dragon Furious. The Wodens Fang and Toothless guessed this, of course, cowering and peering gloomily out of the net, swinging from the back of Alvin's royal sand yacht. You see, I told him, whispered the Wodens Fang, I warned him about that dragon. It's only paranoia if things aren't out to get you. At least he's wearing his helmet. Yes, said Toothless, sadly. But what is he going to do without uh, the Toothless to look after him? Hiccup needs Toothless. I'm one of the lost things, and I'm the best one. Oh, squealed Kamikaze from the basket. You have thought of a plan. I can feel it. I knew you would. Actually, Hiccup was trying to work out what just happened. They were in the claws of something that appeared to be invisible when Hiccup looked upwards, but Hiccup knew it must be just excellent camouflage. It could be a stealth dragon. Hiccup had come across those before. And then, with a very sick feeling, Hiccup remembered how the Woden's Fang had been warning him for ages that they were being followed by something that the Dragon Furious had sent to kill him. How the bed last night had looked as if something had attacked it. This isn't a plan, said Hiccup in a petrified way. At least it may be a plan, but it isn't my plan. It's the Dragon Furious's plan. We've been abducted by some kind of camouflage stealth dragon thingamy that the Dragon Furious must have sent to kill me. Oh, great, sang Kamikaze, popping up from the basket enthusiastically like a wild blonde jack-in-the-box. I love stealth dragons. So do I, said Stormfly, emerging from the basket after Kamikaze and turning a beautiful flirtatious pale pink. I don't think you're going to love this, stealth dragon, Hiccup assured her through chattering teeth. Kamikaze put up her finger. I'll get my emergency battle axe then, she said, popping down into the basket. I brought it along just in case, and I've got a spare sword for you. Kamikaze always came well armed. And then you can take one, Ed, and I'll take both the others, because I'm the girl. You see, you did need me. I knew you would. Oh, this is exciting. It's just like old times. Hiccup didn't like to rain on Kamikaze's parade, but there wasn't much chance of the two of them fighting it on their own. He felt a little sick as he looked down over the invisible fist clutching the crushed sand yacht, down, down at the red sands far below. Being abducted by a dragon rather than flying it himself always made his ears pop. He didn't know why. They weren't flying particularly high, but it was just one of those weird things. He took the sword that Kamikaze was handing him in a shaking, clammy hand. Here we go, he thought. The deadly shadow landed and held Hiccup and Kamikaze and the crushed sand yacht in one transparent claw. Above them, the mighty beast towered. Let us go, you great see-through coward, yelled Kamikaze. Let us go so we can fight like Vikings, you window-featured triple-headed lizard brain. When it landed, the deadly shadow saw no need for disguise any more. The camouflage faded from its chameleon skin, and for the first time, Hiccup saw what species it was. Uh-oh, they were in real trouble. He'd never seen one of these before, but he knew this was a disaster. It was a deadly shadow, and a triple header at that, and deadly shadows shot lightning bolts as well as flame. It was a breathtaking sea green when it wasn't camouflaged, and at least three metres tall and nine metres long. Way up in the six cheeks of its three heads, you could see the faint bright yellow that told you that they contained poisonous ducts. Like a creature this powerful really needs poison as well, thought Hiccup, slightly hysterically. That's just overkill. Wow, breathed Stormfly, batting her naughty eyelashes at the deadly shadow. You are a magnificent creature, aren't you? Hiccup was trying to think of everything he knew about deadly shadows, but all he could think at that particular moment was, Oh dear, he looks cross. Woof! The deadly shadow leapt, and suddenly he was pinned to the ground, the breath being squeezed out of him. Hiccup and Kamikaze gasped for air. The creature opened its great jaws, and from all three of its heads there came a scream at so deep a pitch and so loud, and coming from so many directions at once that the noise seemed to blow poor Hiccup's hair back and entered his entire being, and his whole skull rang with the noise as if it were being used as the clapper of a bell. Hiccup and Kamikaze may have passed out for a moment. When Hiccup came to, the dragon's three jaws were stretched wide in front of him, and Hiccup could see down in the depths of the throat of the one nearest to him, the muscles working, and he knew that this time the heads were going to shoot fire out of the fire holes, and this was going to be the end. He would almost be relieved if it was, because at least it would be quick, and he wasn't sure if he could stand another blast of that roaring. And just as he had closed his eyes and tensed for the final moment, one of the heads must have shouted, Stop! Everything stopped. Cautiously, 
Hiccup opened his eyes. His head was still ringing. Six green eyes looked down at him in a sort of stupefied amazement. The dragon itself seemed to have gone rigid with shock. And then the pink forked tongue flicked out of the mouth of the nearest head. Hiccup flinched, but it prickled downward, and sensitively, gently, it lifted the lobster necklace that was hanging around Hiccup's neck, and the six eyes peered closer, closer, as if they could not believe what they were seeing. The red rage vanished from those six eyes, like the mist disappearing into nothing. A great calmness and stillness came over the dragon standing over Hiccup as he looked into Hiccup's eyes, as if the great three-headed animal was looking back through time. One of the heads spoke in a thrilling echo, so deep that it seemed to reverberate in Hiccup's heart. It was the unbearable longing with which it spoke that was so moving. He is wearing the lobster necklace said the middle head of the deadly shadow. He is, hissed the others in reply, and all around Hiccup's head they hissed like a nest of joyful serpents. He is, he is. Seventeen. Did I already mention that the past has a way of catching up with the present? It was a gift, said Hiccup. All three heads of the deadly shadow started in surprise, for it is unusual for a human to speak Dragonese. And then the three heads spoke eagerly, again with that unbearable note in their voices, as if they had been longing for something for a very long time, and were thinking that the something they had long past hoped for was about to be snatched from them. So you are not the owner of this necklace? Who gave it to you? Where are they? Are they alive? The questions came from three directions at once, and delivered in those strange, confusing voices it made Hiccup's head reel, as if the heads were speaking in some echoing, confusing cave. He was my friend. He is alive. I hope he is alive. I am looking for him, pleaded Hiccup. That's why I am here. Now the voices were stern, with an edge of menace. But you did not steal it. You are telling the truth. The boy who owned this necklace is alive. Hiccup swallowed. I really, really hope he is, because he is my best friend said Hiccup. At that moment, Hiccup could see Fishlegs so clearly in his head, skinny Fishlegs with his sarcastic sense of humour and his glasses askew. For a moment, it was as if he really was standing right there beside them, about to make some remark about the general all-round terrifyingness of the deadly shadow himself. Look at us, hissed the heads of the deadly shadow. Look at us, look at us, look at us. The hissing was all around him. The three heads were whirring round him, confusing him, sliding back and forth and in and out of visibility. They were like a maze of mirrors. Where had he heard that phrase before? Hiccup had trained himself to hold a dragon's gaze. No easy feat, for a dragon's gaze is hypnotic. If you hold it too long, you find your will bending to theirs, or you are sick or pass out. Certain dragons have a gaze that is almost like a truth drug. It seems to drag the truth out of you whether you want it to or not. And, of course, triple the eyes, triple the strength. Hiccup forced himself to look into the dragon's six great glistening eyes, which were now flecked with the reflection of the sky, and it was like they were boring right into his head, into his very mind, and wandering around in the mazy passages in there. And then there was a sucking sensation, as if they were dragging the thoughts out of him. Not surprisingly, within seconds Hiccup felt dizzy, then sick, as you would if you had somebody wandering around inside your own brain, until he had to close his eyes before he passed out. The dragon unclosed its fist of sky from around Hiccup's limp body, and from that of Kamikaze, and the hand that was only minutes before squeezing the life out of them and preparing to kill them, laid them gently, protectively, on the sandy grass. "'What in the name of Thor and Woden and Freya's ickle pretty plats is going on?' wondered Kamikaze, trying to get her breath, holding her head and gazing at the deadly shadow in awe. "'I have absolutely no idea,' gasped Hiccup, "'but it's something to do with fish legs and this lobster necklace he gave me.' "'But we're not safe yet,' he whispered. Hiccup knew this instinctively. "'The deadly shadow has not yet decided what to do with us.' The deadly shadow strode around them, circling like an invisible tiger." Deep in its throats was a noise that, in a less magnificent, noble, wild creature, might have been purring. But that was not a happy purring. It was a purring that Hiccup knew well. That was a considering purring. Toothless did exactly the same thing when he was trying to decide whether or not to do something. Hiccup and Kamikaze sat absolutely still in the sandy grass. 
Even Kamikaze knew not to speak, and that their lives were in the balance. Round and round them the creature paced, the three heads arguing with one another. You couldn't see it, but you could hear it, feel it, the moving air, the great dragon footsteps all around them in the grass. There were fifteen circles of great dragon footprints around them before the deadly shadow stopped circling and brought its three heads very close to Hiccup, the heads now visible and waving like snakes in front of a snake charmer. The middle head spoke. We have been at war with ourselves, said the middle head in that doomy, echoey miasma of a voice. Hiccup nodded his head respectfully. For there are two reasons why you are here. Two quests... The first is, as you say, you are looking for your friend, who you really believe is alive. The first head gave what might have been a snarl or a snort of appreciation and sent a bolt of flame down into the sandy grass that made Hiccup and Kamikaze jump. You spoke the truth, said the middle head, but the dragon furious spoke the truth too. There is a second quest, said the middle head. You seek the dragon jewel. This is a dangerous quest and one that could have dreadful implications for the entire dragon race for the dragon jewel is no ordinary jewel. If it is found, it has a secret. And if a human knew that secret, he could use the power of the jewel to kill not just one dragon, but all dragons. He could make us extinct, obliterate us forever. But you seek it nonetheless. This time, the third head gave what was definitely a snarl, more than a snarl, a roar, and the bolt of flame that it sent out missed Hiccup by inches, and only because the middle head anticipated it and gave it a knock to the left. We have a dilemma ourselves, said the middle head, for we have made two promises, one to the dragon furious, which was to kill you, the other to someone else, a long time ago. Innocence here on my left, the left head bowed, would help you find this friend of yours, who means a great deal to us, On the other hand, arrogance here, the right head bowed and snarled, would kill you. I have the casting vote, said the middle head. It paused and then continued slowly. Because the first promise that we made has a prior claim, we will help you. Hiccup gave a sigh of relief. The result really did seem to have been in the balance. Thank you said Hiccup, bowing his head. All I would say is that there are others who seek the jewel, and they would use it to destroy. Ah, said the middle head, sadly, but they would never find it without your help. The deadly shadow knelt down beside them, inviting them to climb on its back. Come, said the middle head compellingly, take me to this friend of yours. Hiccup's stomach turned to jelly. Was it possible? Here was a bewildering turn of events. The dragon that was just trying to kill them was now trying to help them. For one second, Hiccup wondered if it could be a trap, that the deadly shadow could be about to take them to the dragon furious, but it could do that anyway without asking their permission or saying pretty please. "'What are you doing?' asked Kamikaze, open-mouthed as Hiccup climbed aboard the shining impossibility of the deadly shadow's back. "'That dragon just tried to kill us!' "'It seems to have changed its minds,' said Hiccup. "'Are you coming?' Nobody changed her mind quicker than Kamikaze. You betcha, said Kamikaze, thrusting both of her swords and her emergency battle axe in her belt. She scrambled up after Hiccup and settled down behind him, beaming all over her little monkey face. She gave a sniff of satisfaction and stroked the shining back. I told you, I love stealth dragons. Oh, so do I, squealed Stormfly, turning a passionate pink and flying in and out of the three heads in a flirtatious fashion. It's not a stealth dragon, it's a deadly shadow. By the way, said Hiccup, addressing the middle head of the deadly shadow, if your brothers are called Innocence and Arrogance, what is your name? Patience, said the middle head, because that's what I have to have. And the deadly shadow took off. Eighteen. Searching for fish legs. At that moment, Hiccup didn't know why, but Egingard's story came into his head. Fly east, Hiccup said, to the evil reaches. We're looking for a rock shaped like a witch's finger. The deadly shadow flew east. Hiccup did not want to find the rock shaped like a witch's finger, but he had to look. One of those treacherous sea mists was blowing in from the east, so the dragon had to swoop low over the red sands. For a long time he flew. Surely it was too long for anyone to yacht that far. Looking down over the deadly shadow's shining shoulder, Hiccup saw what he dreaded to see. A crooked, jagged rock, shaped like a witch's finger, pointing upwards to the sky. And a little way away, 
was the speck of a yacht on the sand. Down, Shadow, down, cried Hiccup in terror. Down they flew, and as they grew closer, Hiccup could see, with a plummeting of his stomach, that the yacht was not upright. It was turned over on its side. Desperately, he looked to the horizon to the left, to the right, his eyes already blinking with tears. No sign of an untidy, daddy long legs, fish legs figure anywhere. Of course there could not be, because suddenly the truth broke upon Hiccup, the truth that maybe he had known somewhere all along. The story that Egengard had told him two nights before, the story about the monster and the slave boy, that story was not a story. It was true. And the reason that Egengard would have known it to be true was that she was there. She was there. She was with Fishlegs when the monster struck and when that dreadful creature pulled Fishlegs beneath the sand. It explained why she was so fearful, so scared of the monster but not of anything else, why she had told him the story as if she had to tell it to get it off her chest. It explained everything. Nineteen. The Monster and the Slave Boy The deadly shadow landed lightly on the sand. Hiccup scrambled from his back and ran to the confused mess of belongings. Maybe it wasn't fish legs. Perhaps it was some other poor soul. It could have been anybody after all. They lost people to the evil reaches every day. But when he reached the sand yacht, Hiccup spotted something half buried. With a shaking hand, Hiccup drew it out. The crushed, mangled remains of something. The something was Fishlegs's precious rucksack. He had made that rucksack out of the lobster pot that he had been found in when he was a baby, and it contained the few belongings that he had owned in the world. Just to be absolutely certain, when Hiccup picked it up, a smashed bottle of old Wrinkley's asthma potion fell out, and the potion leaked like blood staining into the sand. Hiccup tried to reshape the crushed, mangled remains of the lobster pot cum rucksack back into its original shape. This was it, then. This meant that Fishlegs really was dead. There was no hiding from it anymore. The story of the monster of the Amber Slave Lands had been true, after all. It had been true, and it had happened to Fishlegs. Behind Hiccup crept the giant, shining heads of the deadly shadow. The poor animal seemed crushed. He had hoped against hope, and now those hopes had been crushed again. The three heads sniffed the lobster pot. What was his name? asked Patience. Fish legs, said Hiccup, crying. Fish, Fish legs. legs, they hissed, waving like they were being snake charmed again. Fish, Fish legs. legs! Fish legs! Fish legs! Fish legs. legs! They chanted, performing a sad dance around the lobster pot. They seemed to recognise the lobster pot, strangely, and they drank in the smell of it like it was the smell of the past. There is nothing more evocative, nothing that brings back memories like smell. Hiccup held it up to the heads, unable to stop crying. I shouldn't have let him give me the lucky necklace, sobbed Hiccup. I shouldn't have let him give away what little luck he had. He may not be dead, said the left head, Innocence, hopefully looking around. There are many islands around here. Maybe he got away. Perhaps he found one of the islands. Maybe he's still there. Oh, snorted Arrogance. You're deluded. Always looking on the bright side. He's clearly dead. At that, Hiccup felt overwhelmed. He sank down, crying on the sand. The deadly shadow cried too. Even Kamikaze and the Stormfly cried, and they never cried. Hiccup could feel the wet sand below him the red of the asthma potion that he had broken seeping into the front of his dragonskin fire suit. He cried until he was a little empty, cried-out rag lying on the sand, the front of him now stained red. A light rain was falling on him now. He could feel the sand below him getting a little wetter, as if the tide was going to rise. Go back! Something inside was speaking to him. Go back and find the jewel. Become the king! Do it for fish legs and everyone like him. Defiantly, Hiccup dried his eyes with the edge of his sleeve. He put the broken remains of fish legs lobster pot on his back and staggered blindly towards the deadly shadow dragon. Without a word, Kamikaze was doing the same. But then they stopped dead, for the deadly shadow was having an argument with itself again. If this fish legs is dead, hissed Arrogance, then we no longer need keep our promise about the lobster necklace. But Fishlegs may not be dead, said Innocence. 
Neither arrogance nor patience looked very convinced by this argument. And this boy is a friend of this fish legs, argued Innocence. Patience was still undecided. The boy seeks the jewel, hissed arrogance, and the jewel must never fall into human hands. If we kill him, at least we keep our promise to the dragon furious and the jewel will be safe. For look, the human race is not capable of using such power wisely. In the end, it can only destroy. Now arrogance knew he had won the day. The three heads narrowed their eyes and turned towards Hiccup. Uh-oh, said Hiccup. The three heads were lowered, dangerous. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. The deadly shadow crept forward and fell to the ground with a shriek. Twenty. Oh, dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And that doesn't really cover it. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. You would have thought that you had heard the worst of it, wouldn't you? That Hiccup had had all that he could take but oh dear. It's the little details we should not forget. The little things that catch us up and trip us. The warriors of the Wilder West always set the dragon traps in twos. So that if some other poor dragon landed beside to help another, then it would get caught too. The second trap snapped shut, catching the deadly shadow in its cruel jaws. The deadly shadow put back its heads and howled, the truly dreadful howl that a dragon howls when it is caught in a trap. It is an awful sound, for a dragon is a wild creature of the air, and so its horror of being trapped is such a ghastly wail of ultimate despair it is almost unbearable. These howls were multiplied three times, and the dragon sent out great bolts of lightning all around it, north, south, east and west, with such randomness that Hiccup and Kamikaze had to duck behind the sand yacht. Not that this would have been much good to them if the deadly shadow had scored a direct hit with a lightning bolt, but it's a sort of automatic reaction thing. The dragon howled and thrashed, but it could not work its foot free. Hiccup put his head above the edge of the sand yacht and shouted, I can free your foot from the dragon trap if you let me come near and then ducked as a lightning bolt came singing over the top of his head, and there was a smell of burnt hair. There was silence for a second, apart from the sound of the dragon heads arguing among themselves. At last, Patience called out, Come close, then. Hiccup stepped gingerly forward. The deadly shadow was lying on its side. It was trembling. Hiccup swallowed as he saw the trap. It was immense, and one of the most complicated he had ever seen, a fiendish contraption of clockwork complexity. It was far more complicated than it even needed to be to do its dreadful work, almost as if its maker had been showing off when he designed it. Hiccup stroked the dragon's shining side soothingly. I can do this, he said. I can do this. Thank Thor he had spent the last six months learning how to undo dragon traps. Hiccup took off his waistcoat and knelt by the trap. Kamikaze drew both swords and started pacing around the deadly shadow, just as he had paced around Hiccup and Kamikaze earlier in the day. 21. A Story from the Past The deadly shadow was lying very still. The first head looked up, though, and spoke to Hiccup, who was working on that dragon trap quicker than he had ever worked before. While we are waiting, said Innocence, let me tell you the story of the necklace you wear around your neck, and then perhaps you can tell it to Fishlegs if you find him again. He cannot find him again, said Arrogance, flatly. The Fishlegs boy is dead. Let him tell the story, said Patience longingly. Tell it. Tell it, Innocence. Tell it one last time. I want to remember. So Innocence began to speak. Never had a story been told in stranger circumstances. The beautiful three-headed dragon caught in a trap, the red sands and the sense of danger all around, Hiccup working, working to free the dragon. But in fact, the story had a kind of calming influence on Hiccup. It steadied his shivering hands, his hands that needed to be steady to unlock this trap. The comforting, reverberating echo of Innocence's voice had a relaxing effect, like that of some sort of soothing drug. It was almost as if Innocence was telling the story somewhere safe, by some Viking fireside, and not in a moment of desperate peril out on the Red Sands, deep in the territory of the monster of the Amber Slave Lands. The Story of the Lobster Claw Necklace 
Not so long ago we had a human that belonged to us, began Innocence, a human of our very own. Our mistress was a happy young girl, continued Innocence, half murderous, half berserk. But you never would have guessed the berserk bit. Arrogance interrupted, getting suddenly into the mood of the story. She was so kind and gentle. Her name was Termagant, said Innocence, but it didn't suit her. She wasn't what you might call a natural murderess, and she found the life of a chieftain's daughter and her fiercely ambitious father, Chief Moody the Murderess, a bit difficult to handle. So she often used to escape from her father's village on my back, and we would come out here to explore the islands. This was our secret place. We were already a fully grown riding dragon when we met her, but with her we felt young again, even arrogance. She wasn't like all the other murderers who beat their riding dragons and kept them prisoner. Termagant was different. It seemed like she and us were the very same being, as if our wings were her wings, as if her heart were our heart. All was happy when she was growing up, but at that time we did not yet know of the human failing of falling in love. Termagant fell in love with a poor wandering fisherman, very handsome, but not the chieftain's heir her father would have had her marry. Moody wanted sons of chiefs with golden axes, not a poor fisherman, however handsome and lovable he was. Worse still, she married her fisherman despite her father's anger, and worse still than all of that, the sea had its way, and one day her husband's fishing boat went out in the middle of a storm and sank to the bottom of the ocean. What is it with you humans and love? growled Arrogance. It's a serious design flaw. My mistress was so very, very unhappy. Better to have never loved at all than to shed the tears she shed. The only thing that kept her going was that she was carrying her husband's baby. She would lie, curled up on the window sill of her father's house, with her head upon my flank, telling me what this dream baby would be like. He would be tall and handsome like her husband. He would be a poet like herself. He would be a hero, of course, but not a boor like her father. He would be brave and fearless and yet kind to animals. Oh, such dreams she had for that baby. But dreams and reality can be different. And most unfortunately, when the baby was born, it turned out to be what the humans call a runt. There's a saying you humans have. What is it? Only the strong can belong, said Hiccup, through white lips, fiddling with the locks on the dragon trap. Throw out the freak or the tribe will be weak. It kind of varies from tribe to tribe. That's it, said Innocence. I never will understand you humans. Well, Moody the murderess was most hopping mad. He said it was a sign that fate disapproved of her marriage. He told her he would have to put the baby in a lobster pot and set it out to sea, according to tradition, and the gods would see whether it lived or died. Mostly it died, of course. It was very, very rare for a runt to survive to adulthood. Now, if Termagant had been stronger, she would have fought her father outright. But grief and the birth of the baby had made her weak. She made as if to obey him, but secretly she asked me to follow the lobster pot once it had sailed out of sight of the beach and her father's stern eyes, and pick up the baby and take it here to Hero's End. I will come out and find you when I am strong enough. Will you make me a promise, Shadow, said my mistress. Promise that you will keep my baby safe until I can come and join him. We could not make the human words, but we bowed our heads and bent down low in front of her to make the promise. By our bright green blood and shining claws, we will keep your baby safe, we whispered in dragonese, as solemn a promise as a dragon can make. Termagant was weak, but she smiled and stroked our heads. I trust you absolutely, she said. Later that afternoon, she stood on the shore of the beach, poor Termagant, supported by her stern father. Because she was so weak, she could barely stand upright. All around her were the silent and solemn members of the murderer's tribe. From around her own neck, she took a necklace made out of a simple lobster claw. Around the baby's neck, she placed the lobster claw necklace, just like the one you have around your own neck. It was the very same lobster claw that the baby's father had given her as a love gift on their marriage, for he could not afford gold or amber. The baby looked up at his mother with adoring eyes, 
and smiled a shy smile. He tried to put his little hand up to his mouth with fragile, jerky movements, but he had to make a few attempts before he got it in the right place, and when he did, he sucked thoughtfully on his knuckle. She stroked his cheek and kissed him again, drinking him in with her eyes as if she might be seeing him for the last time. Remember, she whispered, we listened hard for what mothers say to their babies when they are about to be parted. Well, that is worth listening to. Hold on to this necklace and remember how much I love you and that we will meet again one day though destiny made us part. This is only a little absence, a temporary parting. I will come and find you on the sweet island of Hero's End and then we will be together forever. She closed the baby's other little fist around the lobster necklace and then, with shaking hands, she wrapped the baby tight and laid him in the lobster pot tucking the blanket around him carefully so he wouldn't be cold, and she pushed the lobster pot out to sea. The murderers lit their flares to honour the moment because it was sort of a funeral, although the baby was still living, and, as was traditional, they fired burning arrows that landed harmlessly on either side of the baby's little craft as it drifted gently out to sea, and the baby took his knuckle out of his mouth and made a gurgle of delight reaching out his arms as if he thought he could touch the beautiful flaming arrows as they rained down all around him. He did not know this was supposed to be his funeral, but looked about him expectantly, at the beautiful blue sky above, at the bright and interesting world that awaited him, the slow arcs of seagulls flying way, way up high overhead, until the very, very gentle rocking of the pillows of the waves below him made his eyes slowly close and lulled him to sleep. The murderous tribe were proud, sad and solemn on the beach. Termagant was crying hard, and as the little lobster pot crept further and further out to sea on the back of each gentle wave, she staggered up the beach back to the murderer's village, supported by the arm of her proud, unbending father. The murderous tribe followed. We had been sitting there all this time, a great camouflaged statue, noticed by none, lying at the back of the beach. Now was our moment. We leapt into the air over the heads of the departing crowd, invisible to their eyes, although a few may have looked up as the breeze from our wings caught the hairs on the back of their necks. Termagant looked up. We saw her look up, and she smiled through her tears, and she stood straight up. Though it was hard for her, she was so weak, and made the Viking salute, and cried out, Remember, we'll meet again. Moody looked up too, surprised, but all he saw was the clouds and the winds and the screaming seagulls. Over their heads we flew, off towards the little speck of the baby, far out to sea now, and only a tiny speck on the horizon. We can still see the sea now, said Innocence. I can see it, said Patience, looking back into the past. I remember it like it was yesterday. Me too, said Arrogance. Flat as glass it was, said Innocence and the baby was quietly sleeping in his little lobster pot, drifting eastwards. Nearer, nearer we got with our quiet ghost wings, flying high over the bay. Our dragon eyes are as acute as our dragon ears. Nobody's senses are more acute than a deadly shadow's. We were still far away, but we could see way down below us that there was not even a lap of water coming over the edge to wet the blanket that wrapped him. He was sleeping so peacefully with his little fist still clutched trustingly around the lobster necklace. It was a summer's day, but even summer's days in the archipelago can be changeable, and as we came out of the shelter of the bay, out of nowhere, it seemed, the treacherous archipelago wind blew in a southern storm, and a thick, smoky sea mist so dense it was like a white blindfold. In a couple of flaps of our wings we had lost sight of the baby. We lost sight of everything. Even our dragon eyes cannot see through mist. They cannot hear a sleeping baby. Both patience and arrogance groaned at the memory. We panicked. The baby, the baby. We screeched in alarm, trying to wake the baby up so at least we could hear him crying. But the baby did not wake up. We flew desperately from left to right, but it was no use. We did not know west from east or east from west. For an hour we flapped, so disorientated, so panicked and terrified that we plunged from time to time into the ice-cold sea. And when the mist rose, when the mist rose, the baby was gone. 
there was an awful silence. We looked for the baby for the next two weeks, whispered Innocence. We searched every cove, every possible beach where the wind might have carried him to safety. And then one dreadful day we found the blue and white blanket floating in a bay far, far to the east. We took it as a sign that poor Termagant's baby had gone to the bottom of the sea, like his father before him. What happened to the mother? asked Hiccup. The three heads sighed a sigh of infinite sadness. We crept back to see her. We did not want to go. Just one sight of us and she would have known the terrible news. But she had not made it through her illness. She had already died. But at least she died believing that her baby was safe with us on Hero's End. And that would have made her happy. Termagant died. Our grief was so terrible, said Arrogance. It was as if the sun had gone away. So what happened to you after that? asked Hiccup. We could not go back to Hero's End, said Patience. We felt so guilty. She trusted us absolutely, and we had broken our promise. We flew up into the murderous mountains where we had spent our childhood, and we tried to forget her. We tried to forget everything and live our life as a wild dragon again. Thirteen years is a long time. We began to forget and then we heard the call of the Red Rage and joined the Dragon Rebellion. That helped the forgetting all right. It was only when we saw the lobster necklace again around your neck that we remembered. 22. What happened next? There was a pause on the Red Sands as the dragons finished telling their tale. Well, I will tell you, said Hiccup. What happened to the baby after you lost sight of him? He was washed up on Long Beach, and the tribe built a hut for him to live in. A long-eared caretaker dragon looked after him, and he turned out to be my best friend, Fishlegs. You see, said Innocence, I always said how he must have survived, and you two never believed me. The three heads sighed. I have to say, admitted Arrogance, I never dreamed that there could have been a happy end to that story. There's always hope, said Innocence. The deadly shadow's three heads were lying on the sand, looking back into the past. And then, quite suddenly, Hiccup thought that the sand below his knees was feeling just a little wetter than it had before. He looked at the horizon. The tide was coming in. Patience put down his head and nudged Hiccup's head upwards so that he looked at him. He put one paw on one side of Hiccup's head and looked straight into Hiccup's eyes. They were so close that you could just see the vague outline of the irises, the black of the pupils kind eyes. I think perhaps you should leave us now, Patience said casually. The monster is coming and the tide will come in, and so this is your last chance to go back on the sand yacht. The monster will not eat dragon flesh. We are too tough for it. How strange dragons are, thought Hiccup. This one can move from cruelty to selfless kindness in a heartbeat. Leave us, said Patience. Leave, leave us. us, repeated innocence and arrogance. We won't drown, Patience assured him. We have gills. Hiccup dropped his head from the mesmerising, hypnotising gaze and carried on working at the dragon trap. You lie. You're not a sea dragon, said Hiccup shortly. Trust Hiccup to know his dragon species. You're an air dragon. Those gills only work up to a certain point. But after a minute, he called out to Kamikaze, who was patrolling around them with her fiercest bog burglar expression, two swords drawn. Kamikaze, he said as casually as he could, maybe you ought to go back on the sand yacht and fetch help. What kind of an idiot do you take me for? Kamikaze yelled back, extremely affronted. I'm not a five-year-old, and I'm not leaving until you're leaving. Hiccup worked on, shivering now in the cold wind, fingers numb, his dragon suit pathetically stained with red. On, on Hiccup worked. Ten minutes had passed. The sand was definitely wetter now. The sea on the horizon was gleamingly near. Fifteen minutes gone. But he was so close now, he could feel it. So close, and... Oh, joy! The pieces of the locks fell apart in his hands, and the trap sprang open. It's such a wonderful moment when that happens. Just in time, Hiccup gasped. The deadly shadow let out three roars of triumph, beat his mighty wings, and launched into the air and hovered there. He reached out to pick up Hiccup off the sand. Hiccup reached out his own hands towards the now airborne dragon, and he felt a horrible, clammy something grab him with dreadful force around the ankle. Hiccup! screamed Kamikaze as a gigantic dragon claw with huge eyes on the end of it dragged Hiccup down, 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 below the sand. Twenty-three. 
2023. Some dragons really are monsters. If you or I had felt a claw creep around our ankles in such a situation, we would have screamed. But Hiccup had been in so many terrifying and dangerous adventures in his short life that he did not scream, for he knew he did not have time. He took a great breath of air instead and held his nose as the unknown creature dragged him downwards through the sand. Down, down, down. Just as Hiccup thought he was going to pass out, the creature pulling him below seemed to break through some sort of wall, and Hiccup landed with a bone-crunching jolt on something hard, and his hand flew off his nose, and he took a great involuntary breath. Not of sand, but of air. Rancid, stuffy, dank air that caught in the throat like slug breath, and he coughed and gasped, sand pouring out of his ears and from his hair. As he tried to open his eyes, gritty with grains of sand, he could see blurrily through streaming tears, sand still pouring down from a hole. But the monster with the eye claws was shooting flames upwards in continuous bursts of hot, then freezing flame. This turned the sand pouring through into something that looked like glass, sealing the hole. They seemed to be in some sort of cavern, and the monster moved its head this way and that, reinforcing the glass walls of the tunnel. The flames stopped. Hiccup could hear the Woden's Fang's little quavery voice in his head. No, no, Hiccup. Dragons are not monsters, you know. But the thing is, just as some humans can be evil, some dragons really are monsters. You should never judge a book by its cover, but on this occasion, Hiccup felt he was on fairly safe ground. The monster's primitive and ghastly appearance told him there would be no point reasoning with it, however optimistic the Woden's Fang might be about the possibility of dragons evolving consciences and complicated things like that. This monster couldn't evolve a conscience in the next 30 seconds, and it was unlikely to be a sympathetic audience. There is such a huge variety of dragon species, you see. Some dragons, sea dragons like the Wodensfang, have copied humans to such a large extent that they can use language fluently. They're able to reason, to think. Others that Hiccup had come across, like dark breathers and monstrous strangulators, are not capable of complicated thinking processes. These are dragons that have spent most of their lives underground or in the depths of the ocean. All that time alone in the dark does not help the development of an appreciation for the finer things in life. A year of living on his wits had sharpened Hiccup's ability to weigh up deadly situations like this in an instant. He couldn't reason with this dragon, so he would have to fight it. He thought fast, very fast, as he scanned his enemy. Fifteen feet of well-armed, muscled dragon. Ten eyes, huge claws an interesting, snaky aspect that suggested it might be related to a slitherfang which also lived under the sand. Quickly glancing the other way, he assessed his chances of escape. The cavern was bare with only one immediate escape route, and judging from the bulging leg muscles, the monster would reach it first. This was a tricky situation. His only chance was to hope that this creature really was a primitive relation of a slitherfang and to use his knowledge of slitherfangs to fight it. Racking his brain, Hiccup tried to remember everything he could about Slitherfangs. What did he know? What had he written about them in his notebooks? The monster had a small weak spot right in the middle of its forehead. There was only one way he could reach that small, vulnerable spot, given that the monster was so heavily armed with talons and teeth. If he could get the creature to believe that he was dead, it would want to swallow him immediately. He would then have to allow the creature to swallow him whole and look for the opportunity to attack the creature's only vulnerable spot. He'd have to be patient. He'd have to let the monster swallow him at least up to the knees so that it would be harder for it to react when Hiccup reached down and plunged his sword into the weak spot. Thank Thor he had a sword on him, or rather, thank Kamikaze. If she hadn't stowed away in his sand yacht and given him her spare sword, he wouldn't even be able to carry out this totally desperate and ridiculous plan. The success of Hiccup's plan depended on one crucial point. The creature would have to swallow him from the right end, that is, starting with his feet. There wasn't a lot he could do if it started swallowing his head. There was a 50-50 chance, which isn't normally a good proposition when your life depends on it, but sometimes you just have to give yourself up to the fickle hand of fate, the toss of a coin. It wasn't very hard for Hiccup to pretend to be dead, frankly, for he very nearly was dead. He made himself go limp, even though every nerve in his body was screaming at him to run away. He forced his body to go limper and limper and his head to loll backwards. He kept his eyes open, just the tiniest, smidgiest of cracks, so that he could see what was going on. He forced himself to lie still, as he felt something yucky slide up over his body. 
It took all of his powers of concentration to stop himself from moving, from jumping up, from shaking off the sand that was gritting all over his body and that disgusting dragon hand that he could see through the cracks of his eyelids. He had to stop himself from crying out in horror at the sight of the two monstrous claws, five fingers, each with an evil dragon eye perched on the end just above the talons. The dragon's face was blind, with two ghostly hollows where its eyes should have been, but the ten dragon eyes were blinking down at him from the end of the creature's claws. Blink. Blink. They were shark's eyes. Dead. The creature felt its way along Hiccup's body. Its long tail had wrapped its way round Hiccup's torso and was squeezing the life out of him. Maybe I am dead after all, he thought, semi-dreamily. It was almost as if his spirit left his body for a moment to look down on his own unconscious body as it lay strangled by the horrible monster in the glass maze, squeezing, squeezing. All twenty eyes stopped at Hiccup's chest area. You have to remember that when Hiccup had prostrated himself on the sand earlier on, he had soaked himself in the broken bottle of Old Wrinkly's asthma potion, and that potion was a deep crimson red colour, exactly the colour of human blood. So he really looked a very limp and gory sight indeed, covered from top to toe, but particularly on his front, in lashings and lashings of bright red blood. The monster gently wiped the sand off him, and even the monster knew that humans could not lose this much blood and live. He's dead mused the monster to itself, very disappointed. He won't squeak for me, however hard I squeeze, and dead men start to smell. Like many underground creatures, Slitherfangs like to keep a tidy burrow, and dead things do indeed smell, a smell that is magnified if one is buried suffocatingly some way underground. I'll have to eat it right now and here, the monster decided. So the first part of Hiccup's plan was a success at least, although it might seem to be a strange sort of success. The monster thought he was dead and had decided to eat him. The monster, who was a picky eater, blasted Hiccup with seawater to get off all the sand, too gritty, rolling him over and over. And then the monster began to coat him with some revolting greasy substance to make him go down the easier. Aha, thought Hiccup with infinite relief. I was right. It is like a slither fang. It wants to swallow me whole. That was a weight off his mind, because it would mean there would be no teeth involved in the process, no chewing. And then the monster picked up Hiccup by one leg and blasted the ground underneath him with fire and seawater to make a nice clean glass surface to eat off, because, like Slitherfangs, it seemed to be very pernickety about such things, and laid him down carefully, arranging his arms by his sides. Then there was a pause, during which Hiccup was absolutely dying to open his eyes, and a horrible, horrible moment when he could feel the monster sniffing, sniffing at his ears. It's going to start at the wrong end, thought Hiccup, desperately trying to think of a plan on the spur of the moment that would work on killing a dragon that was swallowing your head. But just as he was about to do something stupid, like try and jump to his feet, he felt a sort of snuffling on his right big toe. The monster had changed its mind, what there was of a mind, of course. Now why did the monster change its mind? I'll tell you why. Because Hiccup was wearing his helmet. It didn't want to start at the end with a long, broken, tickly thing on it. Well, the Warden's Fang and Toothless will be pleased about that, thought Hiccup slightly hysterically. They're always telling me not to forget the helmet. There was a click, click, clicking noise. Hiccup could not resist opening his left eyelid the smidgiest of a smidgen. He had seen many a strange and terrifying sight in his life, but this was one of the strangest and most terrifying squinting down his own body, lubricated in a strange luminous material like a liquid shroud. He could see his own feet, and beyond them the monster's head, opening its mouth and dislocating its jaws so it could take in Hiccup whole. It began to swallow. It is difficult to describe the sensation of being swallowed by a dragon. There really is nothing quite like it. Apart from anything else, it makes the most disgusting sound, like a very rude, liquidy, slurping noise, and the feel of the suction pulling on your skin as the mouth closes round your feet and makes its way up your calves is both revoltingly wet and also slightly painful. It was really very difficult for Hiccup to stop himself from trembling and keep his arms rammed to his sides. Up! The mouth moved, and Hiccup's feet began to burn like he was on fire as the dragon's digestive juices began to work on him. Very, very slowly, the creature's mouth moved around his calves, inching its mouth over his limbs painfully, bit by bit. Oh, Hiccup couldn't wait much longer, but he knew he would have to. The dragon had to reach his knees at least. He sneaked a peek downwards. 
The animal had its arms stretched wide to steady itself so its eyes couldn't see him if he suddenly sat up, but he had to wait until just the right moment. It was agony by the time the mouth reached his knees. Hiccup had the horrible feeling that his toes might be dissolving. He had lost the feeling in his right foot, but he had to strike at exactly the right moment. As the disgusting monster's mouth crept over Hiccup's knees, Hiccup slowly, carefully wriggled his left hand around the handle of Kamikaze's spear sword. The monster tensed, perhaps sensing the infinitesimally small movement of his prey. It lifted up its arms. All ten eyes were focused on Hiccup. Was it Hiccup's imagination, or did they see something there? Did they see something that made the monster start and the eyes open wide with amazement? And then, as their talons poised to strike, the eyes on the talons opened wide with fury and turned green and then black as they suffused with blood. Hiccup only had one second, one chance. He sat up in one quick cat-like movement, reached out and plunged his sword right in the middle of the creature's forehead. For one awful moment, Hiccup thought he might not have hit the right spot. Both the creature's arms sprang up and out. Hiccup hauled desperately on the sword to try and get it out again so he could strike once more, but... Squirch! There was a small popping noise as the weak spot burst and whoosh! Out of the mouth, Hiccup shot, because as the monster died, it let out a great shooting burst of sand and seawater, and Hiccup raced on his back across the slippery glass floor, landing upside down at the end of the cavern in a swooshing tide of brine. Even upside down, Hiccup could see that the creature was dead although it was still quivering and jerking all over. But Hiccup didn't even stop to check. He was so desperate to get the creature's digestive juices off him. He rolled and rolled in the seawater, rubbing and rubbing at his feet in particular, which were still burning like they were on fire. Eventually, the burning died down until it became almost bearable. The creature was lying quite still now. Hiccup's poor feet were in a very bad state, though he could see even in the dim glowworm light and the little toe on his left foot would never be the same again. It had shriveled into nothingness like a scraggly little pink worm with a stuffing taken out of it, and he couldn't move or feel it. But at least it wasn't Hiccup's head that was a scraggly little pink worm. That would have been a disaster. However, as he looked round the underground cavern, Hiccup realised he was still in a serious fix. He was in a glass cavern underneath the sand and presumably up there on the surface the tide had come in and so he was underneath the sea as well. How was he going to get out of here? But even as he was looking around at the extraordinary glass cavern and the tunnels that ran off it, he had a tingling at the back of his head as a thought fell into place. He reached into his fire suit and took out the raggedy remains of the map. It was looking a little worse for wear, that map, because like Hiccup himself, it had had rather a hard time of it. It was burnt, torn by poison fingernails and covered in seawater and dragon digestive juices. Maze of mirrors. Oh, for Thor's sake. The red herring at the top of Grimbeard's map now seemed to be winking as well as laughing at him. The jewel was here. Of course it was. 24. The wink of a red herring. You know how it is. You search high and low in the archipelago for something, and it's only when you're looking for something else that you accidentally find it. Limping and slithering on the wet glass, Hiccup went through the exit of the cavern and followed the route shown on the map through a warren of tunnels, following until the lair of the monster opened out into a great glass chamber. And Hiccup let out a cry of wonder. There it was, the maze of mirrors, the creature's secret chamber of treasures. How could such a primitive creature create something so very, very beautiful? Maybe the Woden's Fang was right. There must be poetry, even in monsters, for the glass in that chamber was woven with such artistry and polished so fine that it had turned into mirrors. The ceiling was woven with glass like a spider's web, and then in the centre of the chamber was column after column of mirrored glass, as beautiful as columns on a Roman temple. When you got closer still, you could see, encased in the glass, the monster's treasures that must have been stolen from generation after generation of poor Viking amber collectors. The monster must have attacked Romans too, for there were gorgeous Roman silver cups floating in the columns like flies in amber. And speaking of amber, there were quantities and quantities of the stuff studded in the glass columns. 
the colour of honey, the colour of gold, the colour of fire, some with little creatures stuck in the golden liquid. But Hiccup ran through that maze without even stopping, guided all the way by Grimbeard's map. It was very confusing, just as confusing as looking into the eyes of a triple head or deadly shadow, for some of the columns were glass and some were mirror, and it was very difficult to tell what was see-through and what was a reflection. He couldn't have found his way without the help of the map. On he slipped and slid through that sliding mirror maze, searching, searching, for he knew what he was looking for now, and heart lifting with hope, he found it. Wonder of wonders. Water into stone. A single glass column, shining pure as a drop of water, and right in the centre, suspended there as if it were floating, a little higher than Hiccup's eye level, was the dark red heart, the dark red jewel, the dragon's jewel. The jewel that spelt the destruction of the dragons and the human's only hope. The jewel was hanging on a necklace, encased in the glass in such a way that it was as if the necklace was hanging on the neck of an invisible ghost. And as Hiccup circled round the column, nose pressed to the glass, his imagination filled in the torso of a gigantic bearded man, Grimbeard the Ghastly. As Hiccup circled the column, he could just make out on the golden backing of the necklace the scratched initials G. G. Hiccup felt in his waistband for Kamikaze's axe. He took it out and took a good aim at the column of glass about a foot or so below where the jewel was suspended, swinging at it with all his might, as if he were swinging at a tree in the hooligan forest. The first swing took a big glass chunk out of the column, the second a larger bite, and on the third swing of the axe, Hiccup ducked as the entire column of glass came down with an almighty musical crash, tinkling little pieces raining down on him, and the echoes ringing out in that gigantic underground mirrored cavern like a pealing of bells. Before Hiccup reached out to take it, he hesitated. What if he were to take the jewel, and it were then to fall into the wrong hands? But what if he did not take the jewel, and there was nothing then to stop the anger of the dragon furious? He put his head in his hands. How I wish that I were not the one who finds the lost things, thought Hiccup passionately. Why does it have to be me who makes these choices? Most of us are lucky not to be kings and heroes because we do not have to make the choices that kings and heroes have to make. Hiccup chose to take the jewel. Hiccup tore a piece of his shirt and wrapped his hand in it so he could draw the jewel out of the mound of shards of glass. He held it up so that the light shone brilliantly off the golden amber depths and carefully swept off the powdered glass with one finger before putting the amber jewel around his neck and dropping it down his fire suit so it wasn't visible. And then he said, Thank you, Grimbeard the Ghastly. I don't know why he said it, for there was no one there, of course. But there was a beat of about two seconds, and the hairs on the back of Hiccup's head stood up. Hiccup, said a faint, spooky, echoing voice. Hiccup. Oh, for Thor's sake, what was that? It couldn't be the voice of the dragon furious, could it? Hiccup's mind went back to the dragon chasing him through the cave warren of the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. No, it couldn't be. But so spooky, so echoey was the voice, that for one mad minute Hiccup thought it might be the ghost of Grimbeard the Ghastly come back to haunt him for taking his duel. Hiccup, Hiccup, answer me, Hiccup. And then Hiccup stopped dead and started to run back through the cavern, checking column after column. Hiccup! Hiccup! The voice was weak, despairing. There, in one cloudy glass column, was the outline of a human boy. A boy like himself. Was it just a trick of the echoing mirror maze? Hiccup pressed his palm against the glass. And as if the boy were a mirror image of himself, a hand on the other side of the glass pressed back, hand to hand. Gently, Hiccup pushed his forehead with the slave mark on it on the glass. And as the boy inside the column dropped his head forward too, the two slave marks touched on either side of the glass. The boy was fish legs. 25. I don't think I'm dead. 'es weary face was looking back at him through the smoky glass of the column. "'Oh, Fishlegs!' cried Hiccup. "'I thought you were dead!' "'No,' said Fishlegs. "'I'm not dead. At least, I don't think I'm dead.' 
His voice was very, very weak. Though, I have to admit, I'm not feeling at my most lively. What with one thing and another, I've had better weeks in the archipelago. Hiccup laughed shakily. No, you're not dead, Fishlegs. You're in the lair of the monster of the Amber Slave Lands. The monster likes eating fresh meat, so it must have been keeping you alive. Ah, oh, said Fishlegs. I knew I had a feeling I wasn't in a great situation. Lean against the other side of the column, Fishlegs, Hiccup ordered, and he began to swing his axe, gingerly cutting through one side of the glass column, being very, very careful, for he did not want to hurt Fishlegs when it broke. Thor's birthday, it was cold down there. Hiccup shivered as he swung his axe, the damp seeping through his sandals, the cold of the underground glass tunnels penetrating right into his heart. Put your hands over your head, Fishlegs, whispered Hiccup. He didn't know why he was whispering. The monster was dead, but it was spooky down there. In the dark, in the cold. <laughs> Two more swings of the axe, and the glass column encasing fish legs fell away. His friend was standing there, curled over in a slight ball, his hands over his head. Slowly, he brought down his arms. It was as if Hiccup was bringing a frozen statue into life. A bedraggled, weary figure he was. Tear-stained, rags flapping around him like the tatters of a scarecrow, ripped to shreds, nearly blue with cold, his smashed glasses falling off his nose. Hiccup was the very mirror image of him. Neither of them were Vikings now. Lost tribes, lost dragons, lost everything. Hungry, thin as brooms, the slave marks proclaiming their slavedom. Both runts, the two boys stood looking at each other, swaying on their feet. Fish legs was as cold as ice, and Hiccup rubbed his purple arms, trying to get his circulation going. "'What are you doing here?' asked Fishlegs through chattering teeth. "'Looking for you!' "'But I'm not important,' said Fishlegs weakly and drearily. "'You ought to be on your quest, your destiny. What about the dragon jewel?' "'You are important,' said Hiccup, urgently trying to bring him back to life by rubbing his arms, his chest, anything to try and warm him up. "'Your lobster claw necklace saved my life!' Really? said Fishlegs. He opened his eyes in disbelief. My necklace saved your life. So Hiccup told Fishlegs the story of his mother, Termagant, and the stealth dragon, and the lobster pot lost in the mist thirteen years before. Who says stories cannot bring things to life? That story brought Fishlegs to life, all right. He turned from grey to a pale pink, and his heart beat so faint, flickered back into a steady rhythm. So my mother, she did love me after all, said Fishlegs in surprise. She wanted the best for me. She wanted to meet me again on Hero's End. And she would have done, said Hiccup, if she had lived. And the deadly shadow dragon who was sworn to look after you is now your deadly shadow. Fishlegs had spent his whole life having the worst of everything. He had the embarrassingly vegetarian hunting dragon, the riding dragon that was the size of a Shetland pony. He had been bottom of the class in absolutely everything, plus he had eczema, asthma, knock knees and short sight. So it was a pretty amazing moment to discover that somewhere out there is a triple-headed, armed-to-the-teeth, ridiculously cool deadly shadow dragon that had sworn to look after you and lay down its life for you. For the final boost, Hiccup drew out of his waistcoat the dragon jewel. It shone like a warm golden star in the darkness of that glass cavern. Oh, breathed Fishlegs. He put out a hand and touched it. The dragon jewel, whispered Fishlegs. He looked up at Hiccup and smiled with excitement for the first time in a long time. Hiccup, this really has got to mean that you are the king. Hiccup smiled back awkwardly. Well, it means I'm pretty good at finding the king's lost things anyway. But don't forget, you were here first. Fishlegs stroked the dragon jewel for a few moments, and then slowly he got to his feet. Right, said Fishlegs. He pushed his smashed glasses determinedly and securely onto his nose. Now we have to get out of here. I just can't miss everybody seeing me on the back of a triple head of deadly shadow dragon. I'm sorry, it's just too good a moment. Hiccup grinned and took out the blasted, ragged, burnt and soaked remains of the disintegrated map to look for the way out. The two boys walked through the tunnels until they found the one that Grimbeard had helpfully marked as the exit. And as they walked, the tunnels seemed to be leading higher and higher, and there was a strange light that wasn't the light of electric squirms or electric stickies or glowworms, which had lit the cavern below. And suddenly the light felt as if it were all around them. And on the other side of the glass, there were suddenly fern shapes moving and waving. Seaweed. The glass tunnel had emerged out of the sand, and they were under the sea at the bottom of the ocean. 
Great drifts and shoals of fish drifted past, swimming in and out of the seaweed. Gentle jellyfish softly floated by, and as the tunnel moved up, it left the seabed like a great glass snake, and they could see crabs scuttling below them. Whoa! Fishlegs pressed his nose up to the glass. The tunnel went up sharply, and they slid so much they couldn't get a grip. Hiccup had to carve little nicks into the glass so they could get a foothold. They were just in time as it happened, for the tunnel had one little loop that the sea had not yet covered. Once the tide covered it and the tunnel was entirely underwater, they would not have been able to break the tunnel without the ocean rushing in and drowning them. But there it was, one lovely little loop that was surrounded only by pure air. Hiccup broke the tunnel with his axe, and carefully they climbed over the broken shards and into the surrounding ocean. It was cold, that sea, and as they looked around them, they were just two little heads bobbing beside the broken tunnel in the middle of a vast expanse of ocean. Sea, 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 as far as the eye could see. The tide had come in completely. They had walked even further than Hiccup thought, a mile, maybe more, into the open ocean. To the west, Hiccup could see a little smudgy grey outline that must be land. The land of the island of Swallow. I'm never going to make it, gasped Fishlegs. He was already turning blue again. You will make it, said Hiccup between chattering teeth. Swim! And he began to swim himself, towards that smudgy grey outline on the very distant horizon. Swim, swim, swim! You must make it! But the vast echoing sea was so large, and they were so small and the distant landmass was so very, very far away. Twenty-six. A ghost from the past. Sometimes our little human splashings are not enough. However hard we try, however strong our heroic human wills, and us humans have such a capacity, such a heroic capacity for believing that the impossible might be possible... Sometimes our ridiculously puny human arms are too weak. Sometimes the world is just too big for us, the hurricane too wild, the sea so huge that it wears out even the bravest of hearts, the strongest of wills. So it would have been with fish legs and hiccup. I have to tell you, they would have drowned that day in the seas around the Amber Slave Lands, despite everything, despite their miraculous escape from the maze of mirrors and the lair of the Slitherfang. Hiccup would have sunk to the ocean floor with the dragon jewel around his neck, and this story would have had a very different kind of ending. If it hadn't been for one thing. That one thing was flying right now on invisible wings, above the oceans of the Amber Slave Lands, searching, searching. A ghost from the past. A ghost that was hoping to make amends. A ghost that was never going to give up because of the promise he made to Fishlegs' his mother. The deadly shadow would not give up. There is always hope, whispered Innocence. Remember the last time this happened we gave up and Fishlegs was still alive. You have to learn from stories. We will not give up this time. Even the boundless optimism of Kamikaze riding on the back of the deadly shadow was fading. Of course it was. For had she not seen with her very own eyes Hiccup dragged down under the sands by some terrifying eyes-on-claws monster... With a howl of terror, the deadly shadow had dug at the spot with his great claws, and she had dived down and joined in with her own pathetic human hands, digging, digging, digging at the spot they last saw him. But sometimes the world is too big even for dragon claws. The deadly shadow was an air dragon, not a sea dragon, not an earth dweller. He was not built for burrowing. He could not follow Hiccup underneath the sand, however hard he dug. But on, on, he and Kamikaze dug until the great tide swept in and swallowed up their pathetic diggings, their pointless hole, and turned the world to water. Hours and hours they searched, the world now turned to ocean. I do not know what moral you can take from this apart from one. They carried on, even though all hope was lost, for it was impossible that Hiccup should have survived being buried deep under sand and under ocean. But perhaps he wriggled out to the monster's claws at the last moment, said Kamikaze to the deadly shadow. Trust me, guys, I have seen Hiccup survive so many other impossible situations. But yet again, this seemed like even more of an impossible situation to survive than the last one. Nonetheless, they carried on, and it was good that they did. For as we know, despite all odds, Hiccup had survived, and he and Fishlegs needed them now. The deadly shadow had gone back in time. He had forgotten that thirteen years had passed. It was as if it were that very same day that he promised his human termagant, by our bright green blood and our shining claws we will keep your baby safe. Just such a day it had been, a day of blue with just a hint of clouds on the edge of the world. We promise, we promise, 
patients muttered to the others in Dragonese, We promise, Tamagant, we will keep your baby safe. We, we promise. promise. We promise. Arrogance and innocence whispered back. Swooping over the blue expanse of ocean, the endless waves that stretched forever, they searched for a little lobster pot bobbing on the waves. Their six deadly shadow eyes, the sharpest eyes in the world, the eyes that can see a nano-dragon moving from a distance of half a mile, clicking, clicking, scanning the ocean, their senses all alert. Then, with panic rising, they could feel the clouds moving in, suddenly a mist beginning to form. Surely history could not be about to repeat itself. Surely this was a day of second chances. They swooped down further, desperately looking for the little lobster pot. And the deadly shadow found it. Way down below, a flicker of movement, a smudge of pink, of human life, a tiny wriggle on the endless stretch of blue. Down the deadly shadow swooped, joy leaping in his camouflaged breast. And as they soared closer, Kamikaze could see it too, and she let out a joyful whoop. A smashed and broken lobster pot attached to the back of a boy swimming. A boy with a lobster claw necklace around his neck. The boy was supporting another boy with broken glasses. And even at the height it was flying, the dragon could see in the face of that boy the smudged and vague outline, the wet bedraggled memory of a human it had loved. Termagant's child. We'll, we'll meet, meet again, again Termagant. We'll, we'll meet, meet again. again snorted the three heads of the deadly shadow triumphantly, shooting out bolts of lightning as he swooped ever downwards. We're being attacked, whispered Fishlegs, shielding his eyes and looking upwards as the deadly shadow made a rather clumsy crash landing beside them due to overexcitement. Hiccup and Fishlegs were nearly dead, and the shock of a highly camouflaged dragon landing nearly right on top of them out of the blue practically finished them off. But as they gasped and coughed up water, the dragon plucked them out of the sea and deposited them on his back, still gasping and coughing up water, but alive. I don't believe it, crowed Kamikaze with shining eyes. I mean, I do believe it, because you've done it so many times before, but this time I really do not believe it. Hiccup smiled, because he didn't really believe it himself either, what with one thing and another, and, panting, he drew the dragon jewel out of his waistcoat. Well, of course, Kamikaze couldn't believe that even more than anything else. She made him take it out and put it back again, and he let her hold it, and she turned it over and over, saying, I do not believe it! I do not believe it! How do you do it? What are you going to do with it? asked Kamikaze. Hiccup sighed. I'm not quite sure, he admitted. I have to think of some way to use it so that I can stop this war. Fish legs, said Hiccup, as the dragon took off into the sky. This is your mother's dragon, the deadly shadow. The head on the left is innocence, the head on the right is arrogance, and the one in the middle is patience, because that's what he has to have. Fish legs was sprawled on the deadly shadow's back, holding on for dear life, his clothes already steaming as the dragon's back was as warm as an oven. He felt his whole body coming back to life. How do you do? whispered Fishlegs. Excuse me if I don't sit up. I'm a bit tired. Something about this dragon made him feel secure. And even in his weakened state he struggled to sit up, the wind blowing back his wet hair, the slave mark burning bright on his forehead. So you are my mother's dragon? I was, sang the deadly shadow, but now I am yours, yours forever. I promise I will never leave you. I am at your service. I will serve you faithfully. From now until death, Hiccup translated. Wow! Fishlegs' his back straightened, his eyes shone. Things were looking up. He, Fishlegs, the ex-most despised member of the hooligan tribe, the slave, the orphan and runt, was now the proud owner of literally the coolest dragon he had ever seen. And my mother was a chief's daughter, asked Fishlegs. The best and truest human that I ever met, said Patience. She was a poet too, explained Hiccup, and half berserk, as we always thought. Even in his ragged, hungry, cold state, this put so much heart into Fishlegs. His mother was a poet. That must be where he got his bard skills from. His father was a hero. Well, that was a bit of a mystery, but finally he knew who he was. Relax for a second. If you want to end the story here please feel free. In a way, it would be best. For what could be a happier ending than this? The three friends soaring up into the clouds, the dragon jewel safe around Hiccup's neck. It has been a long, long day, and that really should be the end of it. But I have to confess, it isn't. 
So if you really do want to carry on to the bitter end, I suggest, dear listener, that you take a little break for a moment. Drink a large glass of water, have a nibble of something sustaining, with slow-release energy, a snack, perhaps with oats in it. Relax for a second. There. Then here we go. 27. The story ends as it began. This story, you see, began with Hiccup being ambushed by his mother, Valhalla-rama. And that is also how it ends. Nobody can track a deadly shadow dragon. Nobody except for Valhalla-rama. Nobody can see one so beautifully camouflaged, are they? But Valhalla-rama, that indomitable, breath-holding action woman, flew so high to such airy pinnacles of thinning cloud that she was looking down at them, not up, and she saw not the deadly shadow but the three little humans clinging to the back of nothing. The three friends did not see her coming. The deadly shadow's senses were dulled slightly, perhaps by the exhilaration of the moment and the fact that it was not expecting danger. Deadly shadows do not expect to be attacked because something so scary very rarely is. Perhaps arrogance caught a shining silver streak of movement, screaming just above his eye level that caused him to stiffen and look up. But it was too late. Valhalla-rama and the silver phantom, hiding high in a cloud bank, swooped down in a rocketing silver howl like a bright avenging fury, the unstoppable, relentless, screaming hand of fate. Valhalla-rama's metal arm reached out and she plucked her son from the back of the camouflage deadly shadow with the casual ease that she had plucked him two weeks before from the back of the windwalker. The Silver Phantom rocketed on towards Darkheart, unstoppable, uncatchable, for in open skies the Silver Phantom was the fastest riding dragon in the entire world. Guiding the Phantom with her knees alone, she held Hiccup with one hand, and with the other she took the dragon jewel on its necklace from around Hiccup's neck and placed it around her own. Hiccup, swinging from his mother's stern, unyielding arm, was as shocked as if he had been dunked suddenly in a tub of ice-cold water. And once he had got over that... He was angry. Oh, by Loki's little lunatic leg warmers, he was angry. What are you doing? Hiccup roared up at that unforgiving metal mask looming over him, looking sternly, unwaveringly down at her target of dark heart. I am not a child anymore. How dare you treat me like this? I mean, I don't expect you to be helpful or anything. Why would I expect that? You've never been there. Years and years of leaving my father and me on our own. Years and years and years. Not always answering my letters. Going away even when I beg you not to. Not listening when I speak. Purple in the face, kicking out with his legs, Hiccup yelled, I've got used to that over the years. I've had to get used to it. But the one thing I don't expect, bellowed Hiccup, the one thing I don't expect is for you to actually betray me. Is that really too much to ask? And there was a great deal more where that came from. For when 13 years of frustrated fury comes out, it tends to come out in a rush. But Valhalla-rama did not answer. She carried on, regardless, grim, unyielding. They blasted through the sky in a blinding silver rush of Hiccup's boiling anger and Valhalla-rama's righteous determination. Nothing was going to stop her. She was taking Hiccup back, back, back to face the music in the prison of Dark Heart. 28. Facing the Music and Alvin and the Witch Night had fallen in the Amber Slave Lands. Outside the prison walls, the air was screaming with dragons. The sentries along the walls were barely holding them back. The courtyard of Prison Darkheart was brilliantly lit with flares. In the centre of the courtyard sat Alvin the Treacherous and his mother, seated on twin thrones. Hundreds and hundreds of warriors of the Wilder West and slaves stood carrying flaming torches in their hands. The atmosphere was grim. Every soul in that prison was listening tensely to the dragon apocalypse outside. Alvin had called this grand meeting of soldiers, slaves, warriors and everybody in order to conduct a few executions to work off some of his anger at the loss of Hiccup earlier in the day. But they were interrupted in this amiable diversion by an unexpected visitor. Over those battlements flew the silver phantom, and on the phantom's back was Valhalla-rama the hero. Swinging from just one of his mother's metal arms was the infuriated Hiccup. Don't shoot! Hold your fire! cried Alvin the Treacherous, for he, with his quick one eye, had already spotted the dragon jewel burning bright around Valhalla-rama's neck. 
King Alvin's face lit up with sudden joy. Mother, he gasped, she's got the jewel. The white witch stood up a little higher, her hair trailing behind her in a blaze of glory. I knew it, she spat triumphantly. I knew all my calculations could not be wrong. The silver phantom circled round the courtyard once, twice, glowing bright as the moon. And then he landed on his back legs, placing Hiccup carefully on the ground before the witch, and Valhalarama leapt lightly from the phantom's back and stood there beside him. Hiccup threw himself away from her, shook her arm off him as if it were poisonous, still too angry with her to be frightened. The phantom was limping slightly from an arrow wound in his foreleg. The crowd was silent until they spotted the dragon jewel around Valhalarama's neck. The jewel! She has the jewel! We're saved! All around the courtyard, the crowd began to cheer. Valhalarama! Valhalarama! She has the jewel! Valhalarama was the most popular hero in the archipelago, even more famous than humongously hotshot or flashburn, and she had found them the jewel. Even the slaves were rattling their chains in appreciation. Valhalarama reached for her iron helmet and took it off, throwing it into the crowd so that all could see her face. A proud, white face, cut as if it were made of granite, daunting to look upon like a particularly stern cliff. And then she stood with her arms crossed in silence. Leave it to me, Alvin, hissed the witch, trying to see through that suit of armour, that granite face to what might be Valhalarama's weakness. Leave it to Mother. This is a slightly sensitive situation and it calls for a witch's tongue. It was a slightly sensitive situation. A mother delivering not only the jewel, but her son to his likely death. "'Congratulations, Valhalla said the witch, holding up one bony white arm in salutation. "'I have to confess, Valhalla continued the witch, "'I underestimated you. "'I did not tell you that the traitor of the Wild West was your own son, "'in case you let family feeling get in the way of your duty. "'I should have known that a great hero like yourself "'would put your kingdom above mere personal whims. Three cheers for Valhalla The courtyard rocked with applause. Valhalla said nothing. Give Alvin the jewel that will save us all, Valhalla said the witch, trying to sound casual as if it were not an order. But Valhalla did not give Alvin the jewel. Instead, she withdrew a single arrow from her quiver, an arrow with black raven feathers on it. She twirled it round and round on one finger. Faultfully. Valhalla said nothing, her hero's face impassive as she twirled that arrow round and round. There is a power in silence, especially when you have as charismatic a presence as Valhalla The power of silence is that it forces others to speak. The witch moistened her lips, her half blind eyes taking in the movement of the arrow. I see you have the arrow that an unknown soldier may have accidentally shot your silver phantom with, after the phantom so very kindly delivered us the map, said the witch smoothly. We are so glad that it did not hurt him badly, aren't we, Alvin? Alvin showed his teeth in a charming smile. My relief is beyond words. It was an accident. We were furious with the soldier in question. Indeed, he lost his life. I need not tell you, Valhalla that our promise that we gave you still holds, purred the witch. Alvin promises that if you give him the dragon jewel, he will use it merely as a threat. Not to destroy the dragons forever. Is that not so, Alvin? Word of a treacherous, smiled Alvin. Unless, of course, the witch continued sweet and smooth as butter. The dragon furious gives us no choice. She shrugged her shoulders, indicating the roar of the rebellion outside. Alvin is realistic, and he would have the strength to act decisively if he is forced. Look around you at the archipelago, our perfect world, burnt to a crisp by dragon fire. The dragons would kill us all. 
Hiccup could keep quiet no longer. He turned on the witch. It is you who have inflamed that situation, yelled Hiccup passionately. I have seen your dragon traps, destroying dragon eggs, killing them in their thousands with your explosive weapons. No wonder so many dragons have joined the rebellion. Hiccup's words rang out in the courtyard. And I ask you, what is this perfect world that you're talking about? Is it perfect to have humans and dragons dying in chains? Hiccup pointed at the silver phantom. Are creatures as beautiful as this to be made extinct for all time? cried Hiccup. Are dragons never to sail through the skies again on jewel-coloured airy wings or light up the world once more with the glory of their fiery breath? Are we to say goodbye forever to the magic and the dreaming and the flying of our childhoods? I say no! cried Hiccup, red in the face, shaking his fist. Dragons should be free, just as every single human being in this building should be free. All around, the crowd was murmuring to each other like an unhappy sea. Val Halorama twirled that black arrow in her hand faster and faster, listening intently with her head on one side. So speaks your son, Valhalla Hiccup the slave, sneered the witch, even whiter than ever. Like father, like son, for I know you will be shocked when I tell you, Valhalla your husband, Stoic the Vast, has also become a slave. The witch pointed out poor Stoic, who was looking at the ground. But still, Valhalla said nothing. Why won't she speak, thought the witch, feeling increasingly desperate. She sent out her words like poisoned arrows, still trying to find that fatal weakness in Valhalla's armour. I feel saddened for you, Valhalla, such a great hero as you are, sorrowed the witch pityingly, that your family has let you down so badly and brought disgrace upon their tribe and the kingdom. And now... The witch looked very crafty. But then I read your destiny when you were a little girl, and you were never meant to marry Stoic, were you, valhalla Stoic the Vast was never worthy of you, cooed the witch in her sweetest voice. valhalla face did not change. You could not tell for one second what she was thinking. Round and round the arrow whirled, faster and faster, as if it were a spinner in a game, and no one knew where it would stop in the end. If circumstances had not intervened with destiny, you would have married humongously hotshot the hero, a man of your own calibre, and if you had done so, none of this would have happened. The second best husband, the unfortunate runt son, the disaster that has hit the archipelago, sighed the witch. It's tragic, really. I cannot bear to think of your girlish disappointment, waiting and waiting for a hero who never came. The witch shook her head sorrowfully. A maiden's tears are so particularly touching. It positively melts my witch's heart to think of it. Excelinor paused. But then time moves on, does it not? I hear Humongous has married at last. A lady twenty years your junior. Valhalla did not react. The witch gave a cruel smile. What a shame destiny has taken such a crooked course. But now you have a chance to move on yourself and put things right, valhalla Look, see how fate has marked my son Alvin out as our saviour by giving him eight of the things already. The witch finished her speech with a final ringing flourish. You are a woman of sense and principle. You brought us the map because you knew that this was right and you could help us stop this war that has torn our perfect world apart. We want to put that world back together again, make it good as new, and who knows? Perhaps without certain things, it might be even more perfect. Complete your quest, valhalla fulfil your destiny, and give Alvin the jewel. For Thor's sake, surely the great metal she-mountain has to speak now, thought the witch. Has she gone dumb? The suspense is killing me. valhalla put up her mighty hand. At last, she stepped forward. She spoke. 
And herein again lies the power of silence. When a person who has been quiet speaks, people tend to listen. The crowd leant forward to make sure they caught every single word of what she was saying. The witch has said her piece, and now I shall say mine, said Valhalarama. I have been absent from the archipelago's history for some considerable time. What I am about to offer you is an explanation for my absence, and I am not explaining this to you, witch, or you, Alvin, or even to you, the assembled tribes of the archipelago. She bowed to the silent watching crowds, and those crowds include us, the readers, the listeners, the invisible watchers of this story. I am explaining this to my son Hiccup, said Valhalarama. She turned to her son Hiccup, who was still standing with his fists clenched, bursting with anger, and she looked straight at him. I have spent most of my life questing, said Valhalarama. When I was a child, my father, the soothsayer Old Wrinkly, foretold to me in secret that the archipelago would face a dreadful peril, and that the only one who could avert it would be a new king of the Wilder West. He told me the prophecy of the king's lost things, kept a secret only among the wise, so that the things should not be found by one who is unworthy. I was brave, I was intelligent, I knew that I was worthy. My father had brought me up as a hero and a potential king, and though my father's dreams went awry, as many parents' dreams do, secretly I dedicated the rest of my life to questing for those things. And perhaps sighed Valhalarama. If I am entirely honest, and since this is a moment for telling the truth, it was also because there is a wandering spirit in me, and I was too much a Viking to stay too much at home. My husband Stoic understood the importance of my quest to me, even though I never told him why I was questing or what I was questing for. I would call that real true love, said Valhalarama which is beyond the comprehension of both maidens and of witches. Nonetheless, I cannot begin to tell you how much I have sacrificed in the pursuit of my quest. Do not think that just because I have the soul of a soldier and cannot speak soft words, that it was not hard for me, or that because I left I did not love. Year after year away from home, away from my loved ones, my husband, my son... The monsters I have fought, the warriors I have battled, flying so far to the north, south, west and east, it felt like I must have crossed the whole world, sleeping in trees, in caves, in ice houses, wandering for so long on my own I nearly forgot my own language. Slowly, Hiccup's fists unclenched, just a tiny, tiny bit, for this was reminding him of the loneliness of his own quest over the last six months. But when the quest is for the future of the archipelago itself, said Valhalarama, terrible sacrifices sometimes have to be made. And in this case, the sacrifice was bitter indeed. For however hard I searched, whatever lead I followed, I did not find one single thing, not one. So when the witch told me that her son Alvin had eight of the king's lost things, why, this news took my breath away. I was stunned. What a very great hero this Alvin must be to have succeeded where all my strength and intelligence had failed. Reluctantly, I stood back for the king that fortune foretold and agreed to acquire the map for the king so that he could search for the dragon jewel. Yes, well, you were quite right, said the witch hurriedly. My Alvin is something special. But what you forgot to tell me, witch, and I'm sure it was an unintentional oversight, drawled Valhalarama sarcastically, was that it was my son, Hiccup, who found the things first. I was so busy peering for the things at the farthest corners of the earth that I did not notice what was happening right under my nose at home. While I was searching for those things with the utmost of my power and strength and brilliance, the things were making their way to Hiccup, quietly, effortlessly, and without him even realising. Hiccup may find the things, hissed the witch, but it is my son Alvin who ends up with them, notice. Valhalarama ignored the witch. I began to ask myself some questions when I had got over the headache caused by my son very understandably dropping a tree trunk on my head. 
Did Hiccup drop a tree trunk on your head? interrupted Alvin, cheering up for a second. Can I just say that that is typical, absolutely typical? The tree trunk rearranged my thoughts, said Valhalla along with the surprise caused by my phantom returning with a black arrow in his foreleg. I found myself thinking, why did the things find their way to Hiccup rather than to me? Was it because in my endless quest to save the archipelago, I had forgotten to ask the questions that make a king a king? And is it, in fact, the questions that are more important than the quest? Perhaps, here again, Valhalla sighed, I had to face the cold facts dropping on me like a tree trunk from above. Destiny had not chosen me for king because for all my intelligence I did not have the sympathetic mind that could ask such questions in the first place. You see, the hooligan tribe has never had slaves. But we have stood by and let other tribes take slaves. We have closed our eyes to the misery of places such as this, the great prison dark heart. We have pretended that they do not really exist. But my son Hiccup did not pretend they did not exist. Is that what a king is? And then, you see, there is the question of the dragons. My son put that rather neatly, don't you think? Which, said Valhalla proudly, are we to say goodbye forever to the magic and the dreaming and the flying of our childhoods? A childish question, perhaps, that could only be put by a child, for it is too late already, hissed the witch, her smile a death grin. The war has, regretfully, gone too far to save the dragons from extinction. It is, you see, a question of them or us. It may indeed be too late, admitted Valhalla grimly, her voice smooth and cold as steel, her eyes like bullets. But at least my son would try to save the glory of the dragons that I love. There are some dragons that are monsters, admitted Valhalla but then there are also some humans who are monsters. And at this point she paused and looked significantly at Alvin the Treacherous and the Witch. On the back of the silver phantom, I have flown so high that his wingtips seem to touch the very moon itself. Are dragons like my silver phantom to be destroyed just because there are some dragons out there that are monsters? Are we to be forever earthbound because the dragons are no more? Obligingly, the silver phantom slowly opened his bright wings to their utmost extent, and the rising moon lit up all of his delicate silver scales so that they shone like stars. The crowd caught their breath longingly, remembering flying through the stormy skies of the archipelago on the back of their own dragons. And while I am on the subject of the silver phantom, said Valhalla conversationally, stern eyes narrowing, fingers spinning, 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 spinning the arrow. I thought I might bring up something which has been puzzling me. This arrow that I have taken from my phantom's leg, that the witch claims was from an unknown soldier, is flighted with raven feathers and dipped in the poison of the venomous vorpent. I believe you keep ravens as pets, witch, and the poison of the vorpent is your poison of choice? Yes, I remember reading her destiny now, thought the witch with disagreeable surprise, and even at seven years old she was a wild but also repellently clever little girl. That must be where the horrible little hiccup brat gets his brains from, because it's certainly not from his idiotic father. A raven does make a lovely pet, admitted the witch, but I am trying not to use vorpent poison as much, actually. It isn't as effective as it used to be. You lied, witch, didn't you? persisted Valhalla This arrow belongs to your son Alvin, and it was he who shot my phantom. Silence. The witch's tongue had run out of lies. Valhalla turned back to the crowd. You do have a choice of kings here, peoples of the archipelago, said Valhalla Don't let anybody tell you that you do not have a choice. You can choose the lying witch's son, Alvin, the man with the golden nose, the blood-soaked hook and the empty heart. She pointed at Alvin, a splendid, muscly, emperor-like figure, it has to be admitted, and so bedecked with the lost things it was almost ridiculous. 
and you know in your heart of hearts what this man Alvin is offering you. Or you can choose my own son, Hiccup, who is not a runt, but something special, and who offers you the hope of a new and better world. She turned to Hiccup. Hiccup's anger had now entirely gone, and he felt a great calmness, as if some great weight had left him. I love you, Hiccup although my stiff lips will not let me make the kind words I hear other mothers speaking, said Valhalarama with difficulty. I cannot change or regret the wandering warrior I am, but by Thor's thunder, I can fight for you with all my warrior heart, and this is one thing that I truly excel at. The black arrow was now whirring so fast in Valhalarama's fingers that it was just a blur. The witch has spoken on behalf of Alvin, and I have spoken on behalf of Hiccup. And now we all have to make our choice, peoples of the archipelago, said Valhalarama. And this is mine. Valhalarama's choice was pretty decisive. So quick you could hardly see it, for a true hero's fingers can move as fast as thought. Valhalarama loaded that spinning arrow with black feathers and shot it straight at Alvin's heart. She took the dragon jewel from around her own neck and placed it around the neck of her son, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. Uproar in the courtyard. The witch shrieked. Alvin staggered, but the arrow did not penetrate the three chunky metal breastplates he wore under his royal garments. Alvin was intelligent enough to realise he had made a few enemies in his time. I'm fine, mother, he assured her, yanking out the arrow from the breastplates with some difficulty. He was purple with temper. But we need to stop talking now and kill everybody. I'm dealing with this, Alvin, spat the witch. It's a delicate situation. The king is fine, screeched Excelinor. She was rattled right off her perch now. You'll be relieved to hear that the king is fine. Nobody move. Nobody panic. We are completely in charge here. She put out her arms like giant bat wings, trying to regain control of the situation. Her voice dripped with acid. We will overlook your attempted murder of my son, Valhalarama, spat the witch. We are surprised, but we forgive you, because that is the kind of big-hearted tyrants we are. Speak for yourself, mother, said Alvin between gritted teeth. I'm going to kill her, and then I'm going to run her over in my chariot, and then I'm going to feed the little pieces of her to my favourite snake. I'm dealing with this, Alvin, screeched the witch. But let me tell you, this mutiny changes nothing, Valhalla Nothing! Your son, Hiccup, a king... Excelinor let out a high, derisive cackle. How can you insult the dignity of this crowd by even suggesting such a thing? Are we to be ruled by slaves now? Your son Hiccup is a slave, groaned out the witch, and there is nothing you can do to change this, Valhalarama. Great hero though you are, you cannot make the moving hand of time tick backwards. None of us can do that. The slave mark is a mark that none can remove. Again, Valhalarama did not speak. She had backed away from the witch towards Gumboil, who was holding a large basket full of weaponry and equipment. Valhalarama took something long and thin from that basket, something long and thin that ended in a metal sss, glowing bright and dark. She held it up so that all could see clearly what it was. The Vikings watched open-mouthed as Valhalarama the hero took the brand in her hand and placed it on her own forehead. The great hero did not even flinch. And there, on her white forehead, bright and dark, was the glowing mark. Unthinkable. Impossible. Valhalarama had put the mark upon her own forehead. She had turned the laws of the archipelago upside down and put the mark on her own forehead. 29. An Unexpected Development Outside, the Dragon Rebellion roared, but inside, 
the courtyard was spellbound with quietness. The witch was, quite simply, flabbergasted. She staggered back on her throne. What are you doing? stammered the witch, thoroughly confused. You have turned yourself into a slave. What does this mean? A mark is just a symbol, witch, said Valhallarama, and symbols can change. This is no longer the slave mark, but the dragon mark. I take this mark as a sign of my love and my faith in my husband and my son. And I call upon all those who would have Hiccup as their king to take the dragon mark with me. So, you have the situation under control, do you, mother? spat Alvin savagely. Is this your idea of control? It's preposterous, spluttered the witch. Ridiculous! The slave mark is the slave mark! It's been like that for hundreds of years. What do you mean, the dragon mark? You can't just change things like that. There's no such thing as a dragon mark! Valalarama just made it up! Hiccup could not quite believe what was happening. He looked around at the three Vikings' faces. Some of them were looking at the silver phantom. Others were looking at the floor. It was impossible to tell what they were thinking. Valhalarama was taking a huge gamble. It was asking way too much for someone to voluntarily take on a mark that had been considered the ultimate in shame for as long as they could remember, to put at risk his Viking honour out of mere concern for the fate of non-entities such as slaves and dragons, who would do such a thing, especially for someone like Hiccup. You see, sneered the witch, regaining her composure as she realised no one was stepping forward. Nobody wants your so-called dragon mark. Oh, your runty little son is a leader, Valhalarama. Well, that's a good reason why Valhalarama should have hung on to the dragon jewel and nominated herself as the true king, thought Hiccup. She's the kind of person that people will follow into battle, the kind of person people will lay down their lives for. But Hiccup had never been able to get anyone to come onto his team for bashy ball, let alone been the kind of person people risk their lives and honour for. I will take your dragon mark, came a ringing cry from the back. Thuggery the Meathead strode forward, all six foot three of him. Thuggery was the heir to Mogadon the Meathead. He was about sixteen years old, a huge, hulking adolescent who was thoroughly admired across the archipelago as the very pattern of what a young Viking hero ought to be. Many a Viking chieftain had wished their own sons could be a little more like Thuggery. Now his father Mogadon thundered out, Thuggery, I am ordering you as your father and your chieftain. Do not dare take that mark. But Thuggery strode forward nonetheless. The crowd stood back to let him pass. I am sorry, father, cried Thuggery solemnly, and he bowed formally to his father as a son should. But Hiccup is right. If the dragons were free, they would not make war on us. It is time for a new world, a better one. Thuggery stopped in front of Valhalarama, very brisk and soldier-like, and knelt and removed his helmet, as if he were becoming a warrior. Valhalarama put the dragon mark on his forehead, Hiccup for king, yelled Thuggery, jumping to his feet and punching the air. Well, only one person, scoffed the witch. You're not going to get very far with only one fault. Hiccup for king, roared a whole cohort of young meatheads, clearly friends of Thuggery. Suddenly, all around the courtyard, the young teenagers of the tribes pressed forward to get the mark. Kamikaze landed in the courtyard with fish legs on the back of the deadly shadow and had to push her way to the front and threaten several danger brutes to get her dragon mark first. Because even the young of the conventionally vicious tribes, such as the danger brutes and the busy thugs, were clamouring for the mark now. How was this possible? Well, a strange thing had happened during the year of Hiccup being an outcast. Hiccup had turned from the most unlikely, scrawny, puny little Viking ever into a romantic figure of rebellion. Many of the younger Vikings had been secretly following his progress as Hiccup set free dragon traps and eluded the forces of the Wilder West in yet another brilliant and hair-raising escape. They had been whispering in secret stories of Hiccup's adventures, and suddenly they were whispering them not as evidence of what a weirdo he was, how bizarre, how freakish, but of how clever, how extraordinary, how bravely unusual he was. 
Have you heard how he discovered the land that does not exist? They had been whispering. Have you heard how he defeated the sea dragon, the strangulator? How he tricked the Romans at the fortress of Sinister? How he stopped the exterminators at Lavalout Island? How he slipped through the witch's fingers once again in the land of nowhere? How he found every single one of Grimbeard the Ghastly's lost things, and Alvin only stole them from him? When you put it like that, it seems extraordinary that no one had noticed what a hero they had in their midst already. Short of going round with a big fat arrow on his head saying, here is the greatest hero you've had in the archipelago for centuries, there isn't much more that Hiccup could have done to make this blindingly obvious. But it can sometimes take a while for people to change their minds about things. Even Hiccup's ridiculous birthday, the 29th of February of a leap year, a source of shame to him for his entire life, was suddenly in his favour. And I've heard he's only four years old, they whispered in hushed respect. To have done all this when he is only four years old, why, it's superhuman. This is the way that legends begin. You remember what I said way, way, way back at the start of Hiccup's adventures, how this would be the story of becoming a hero the hard way. Now you can begin to see exactly how hard the way has been. Alone, Hiccup had stood up against Alvin the Treacherous and the entire weight of the tribes. Alone, he had stood up for what he believed in, for what he felt was right, even when everyone else thought he was wrong. That was something, in the end, that the Vikings could respect. And somehow, along the way, Hiccup, with his masked dragon-skin fire suit, his inventive equipment, his raggedy windwalker dragon, his championing of the weak and friendless, his weird little toothless hunting dragon, his actually really rather cool tattoo. But when you come to think about it, a tattoo in the shape of a dragon on your forehead is kind of cool. Somehow, with all these things, Hiccup had become... A hero. And not just any old hero either. The sort of person people will follow into battle and risk their lives for. A king. It wasn't just the young either. Even Mogadon the Meathead found himself looking anew at Hiccup and changing his mind. How is it that things can change so quickly as it seems in an instant? The fact is that things had been changing anyway without the Vikings really realising. The existence of Prison Darkheart had been an unspoken source of shame that the non-slave trading tribes had tried very hard to forget about. Most of the Vikings were fond of the dragons they had grown up with, and even with the war going on, the thought of a world without dragons was depressing and frightening. Plus, the witch and Alvin had already enslaved many friends and relations, and a large number of people in that courtyard had a vague anxiety that they could be next. So people had been changing their minds without really realising, and when things build to a tipping point, a revolution can happen in just five minutes. Mutiny! screamed Alvin the Treacherous. Loyal citizens of the Wilder West, arrest these traitors! Bury them in the deepest, darkest dungeon you can find, and throw away the key! Absolute chaos then ensued in that prison dark heart, as in one life-changing second, everybody tried to decide which side they were on, and, furthermore, work out which side everybody else was on, which wasn't so very easy on the spur of the moment like that. All the slaves were on Hiccup's side, of course, and some of the guards began to set them free from their chains immediately. Most tribes, like the bog burglars, peaceables and hooligans, were already thoroughly fed up with the whole treacherous regime. But the witch and Alvin still had plenty of supporters among the murderous and ugly thug tribes, the danger brutes and the berserks. I'm afraid there were plenty of vicious and heartless humans in that lot. And because there wasn't time for everybody who wanted it to get themselves clearly marked with the dragon mark so that everyone knew where they were, the ensuing battle very quickly became extremely confusing. The night air rang with the bright sound of sword on sword and cries of, What are you doing? I'm on your side. And, oh, I'm so sorry, I just assumed because you were a murderess that you'd be for the witch. And, oh, you did, did you? Well, let me tell you, some of us murderers are just as sensitive as the next guy. And so on. Firing arrows at a ridiculously systematic rate, Valhalarama fought her way to stoic side and, hi yeah! With one swing of her battle axe, she chopped through the chains that bound him. Hiccup was close enough to hear what his mother said to Stoic. You are not my first love, Stoic the Vast, said Valhalarama, 
but you are my last. Stoic's tired eyes lit up, and then Valhallarama grinned, just like she must have grinned once when she was a wild little girl. Welcome to the company of the dragon, Mark, chief. And she handed Stoic her second best sword. Stoic's chest swelled. The years fell off him. For Thor's sake, he was not an old man after all, a little past his prime, perhaps, but the best years of his life were ahead of him, and he could feel the dance of war beginning to tingle in his feet. Valhalla, my darling, said Stoic. That is a lovely thing to say, and you were magnificent as ever. Valhalla had drawn the Nevermiss, and the two of them rang their two swords together grandly, affectionately, as if they were lifting glasses in a toast. Roaring like a charging bull, Stoic launched back into battle, swinging his sword at Alvin's warriors, creaking a tiny bit at the knees, perhaps, but mostly like he'd never really left. Guards of the Wilder West, come fight for your king, screamed Alvin. No, yelled the witch, the Dragon Rebellion, don't forget the Dragon Rebellion. But the guards on the battlements left their positions on Alvin's orders, and the attack of the Dragon Rebels became louder and more furious, and there was a danger that at any second now they would break through and overwhelm the prison itself. 30. The Battle of Prison Darkheart No wonder they called this bay the Dragon's Graveyard. Indescribably sinister it was, this past and present battlefield, and the wind wailing through those dead dragon skeletons seemed to carry voices of a millennium of ghosts. Now the tide had risen again, and the living dragons were waking. The red sand below the sea was giving birth to live dragons, swarming in their thousands out of the scarlet sand below and bursting out of the bay, and none of them were Hiccup's favourite species. Serpent tongues writhed and twisted around the white dragon bones, shaking out their wet wings. Sand razors, hell's teethers, dark breathers and tongue twisters joining them from the forgotten forest and the open ocean. The darkest types of dragon species, the monsters, the ones that hated the humans most. They were chanting the beginning of the red rage and sharpening their talons on the bones of their dead dragon brothers. They saw the little human ants and their terrible weapons of exploding fire and spears departing from the battlements, and they knew their time had come. Make red your claws with human blood. Obliterate the human filth. Torch the humans like a wood. The rebellion is coming. Crouching in the centre of the ghastly graveyard of dragons' hopes and dreams and lives was the dragon Furious. It is difficult to describe the beauty of Furious. Now that he was no longer a captive, his skin, though scarred, had returned to its former glory. It was a blue, so blue that you have never seen that colour before. Deeper than the blue sky, more royal than cerise, brighter than sapphires. The humans are fighting among themselves, whispered Furious, and his eyes blazed with triumph. And I mean quite literally, blazed. An extraordinary feature of fully grown sea dragons is that their eyes can catch fire and smoke. Little bursts of bright red flame, as sharp as lasers, darted from the pupils. Attack! roared the dragon furious to his second in command, a great sea dragon called the Thunderer. Attack! And so began the battle for Prison Darkheart. For the first time in a thousand years, the dragons of the Dragon Rebellion flew over the undefended battlements, and into the prison itself. The humans fighting each other were now in disarray. They could not reach their exploding things. Their weapons of destruction were now being blown up by the magnificent winged serpents invading from above. Valhalla under attack from warriors of the Wilder West and dragons simultaneously, killed four sand razors that were launching themselves with sword-sharp wings pointed straight at her neck, and shouted, Companions of the Dragon Mark, retreat from the prison and make for the ships. Our stronghold shall be the Bog Burglar Islands to the west. Alvin and his supporters were now fleeing to the ships as well, and the witch was organising their own retreat to the Ugly Thug territories in the east. Everyone had to make their choice. West for Hiccup and the Dragon Mark, East for Alvin and the Witch. 
The Wodens, Fang and Toothless couldn't really choose, of course. They were going with Alvin whether they liked it or not, for they were swinging in the amber nets over Alvin's shoulder. We're going the wrong way, squealed Toothless. We need to go with her hiccup. This is a disaster. Toothless is the most important lost thing. Hiccup can't possibly do without me. The hairy, scary librarian seemed to feel that maybe he was quits with Hiccup, and he had a new score to settle now that he had realised the emptiness of a witch's promise. So he headed west to the Bog Burglar Islands. In the middle of the battle, Gobber the Belch passed Snotlout, deep in thought, looking to west and east. Snotlout couldn't decide which way to go. He knew what the witch and Alvin were now, and he hated them almost as much as they scared him. But taking Hiccup as his king, his despised little runt boy cousin, his pride revolted at the thought. Hiccup had stepped in to save Snotlout, but even that was kind of irritating. Snotlout, called Gobber. You can still fight for the right side, Snotlout. You are one of the best warriors I have ever taught. You remember the black star you won against Alvin at the Battle of the Lucky Thirteen? You'd be a tremendous asset to the company of the Dragon Mark. Come with us. Snotlout did not answer, and Gobber shrugged his shoulders and left him there. Snotlout reached into his pocket and took out the Black Star Medal, one of the highest awards for bravery the archipelago can bestow. He turned it over and over, trying to decide, west or east, west or east. Which way would Snotlout go? And that is where we will leave him, standing undecided in the middle of the battlefield, thinking. Valhalarama fought her way across to Hiccup. Duck! yelled Valhalarama. What? Duck! she yelled again, pushing him downwards and firing an arrow over his head that killed a swooping sand razor stone dead mid swoop. Okay, Hiccup, said Valhalarama. It is too dangerous for you to stay with us. Take the jewel and hide from both dragon and viking. Deadly shadow dragons know how to hide. Make your way to tomorrow for the crowning day, and your father, the company of the dragon mark, and I will meet you there. In the meantime, no one must know you are alive. But I haven't got any of the things, protested Hiccup. Alvin has everything apart from the jewel. The jewel is the most important thing of all, said Valhalarama. Be careful of it. Just before the great warrior turned away, back to the battle, Hiccup put his hand on his mother's metal arm. Even though he was particularly bedraggled after his long and tiring day, streaked with monster juices and ocean, he was somehow less small and unlikely than he had ever been before. He looked... Oh dear, what did he look like? It was all such a long time ago, but I think he looked a little more... grown up. Thank you, said Hiccup to Valhalarama. You have nothing to thank me for, said Valhalarama. I am your mother. Oh, and Hiccup. Yes, mother. Don't be too hard on yourself, Hiccup, said Valhalarama. And perhaps her smile was slightly sad now. If things do not turn out well in the end, I have learnt the hard way that heroes can only do their best. Hiccup climbed onto the deadly shadow dragon. Kamikaze, fish legs, come on, he shouted down. Are we coming too? asked Kamikaze. Of course you're coming, said Hiccup. I can't be an outcast on my own again. Besides, the deadly shadow isn't mine. It belongs to Fishlegs. There was one more thing to do. Hiccup steered the deadly shadow above the head of King Alvin, fleeing as fast as he could, step-tap, 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 through the battlefield towards the fleet. Over Alvin's shoulder, bump, 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 he carried the long poles of the librarian's heart slicers, holding the two little dragons, the Wodensfang and Toothless, who were peering out, terrified from the nets. The deadly shadow hovered, perfectly camouflaged, above. Hiccup leant down from the back of the deadly shadow and cut the nets so that the Wodensfang and Toothless flew free, shooting joyfully upwards, Toothless trumpeting his rooster crow of triumph. And in the very same moment... Alvin looked up, clawed automatically with his hook, and caught the chain of the jewel swinging from Hiccup's neck. Shoot him! screamed Alvin to his warriors. The camouflaged deadly shadow rose up in a rain of arrows. The chain on Hiccup's neck broke. Toothless and the Woden's Fang and the deadly shadow rose up to the battlements, arrows pouring upward after them, and... Got it! shrieked Alvin, catching the jewel in his other hand. 
So after all that searching, all that drama, all the gazillions of words of this quest, let's face it, the duel ended up in Alvin's horrible hooky hands after all. Annoying, huh? Just one second, one false move on the part of the hero, one lapse of concentration, that's all it takes for everything to fall apart. No! shouted Hiccup. It was a scary sight to see the witch's face as she saw the warm golden splendour of the dragon jewel dropping into the hook of her darling boy at last. The witch Excelinor let out a high, exultant cackle, and there, in the middle of the death and destruction of that battle, she spread wide her bat-wing arms in jubilant conquest. I knew my predictions could not be wrong, screamed the witch. I knew I had to be this brilliant for a reason. Thank you, all oh, powers of death and darkness in whom I put my trust. Thank you, oh, fortunes most foul and most glorious. See, she screeched, shaking her bony fist up at the heavens. See how we triumph. Let me see it, Alvin, my... My darling, let me have it. It was piteous to see the fragile amber beauty of that jewel glowing from within as if it were fire cradled in the vile, crooked hands of that fiend the witch. She kissed it with her dry lips, crooned over it with a wicked whisper, and here is what she hissed as she held it in her hands at last. Watch out, whispered the witch. Watch out. Small, innocent things growing in the sunshine. Watch out, you splendid dragons with your giant spreading wings. For we can bring you down now. You who think you are so mighty, we can tear you from the sky and watch you shrivel in the mud. She grinned, and that grin was truly terrifying. Watch out, dragons, whispered the witch softly, for the dragon's days are numbered now. Watch out, watch out, watch out. She handed the precious jewel back to her repulsive son, Alvin the Treacherous, and he put it carefully away in his armoured breast pocket. So Hiccup had found the dragon jewel all right, but it had not stayed with him very long. Alvin had the jewel now, and step-tap, 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 he hurried to the east, his mother bounding after him on all fours like a wolf skeleton come to life, and the ticking thing swinging from Alvin's waist, ticking out a new and twisted tune. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-toy. Toothless was happy, though, all unknowing as he was of the malevolent intent of the witch and her horrible son. The little dragon was just delighted to be reunited with his master once again. cock a do 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 crowed Toothless. Don't worry, uh, Hiccup. Don't uh, panic, everybody. Toothless is here, the most important thing of all. Toothless, the Woden's Fang and the Shadow rose up to the battlements of Darkheart as the great doors opened and the humans poured out to make their escape below. Above their heads, for the first time in a thousand years, the dragons took Darkheart. The dragon rebellion poured through the corridors of the prison. There were tongue twisters in the courtyard setting fire to the long tables. They tore down the towers, sending them tumbling and crashing into the dungeons where their dragon ancestors had been kept in chains for centuries. In the bay of the dragon's graveyard, the dragon furious crouched amid the chaos, his eyes scanning the skies above relentlessly in great searchlight beams, ignoring the Viking ships with their burning sails, slaloming through the dragon skeletons all around him, sending out their exploding things as they shot their way out in retreat. The boy, hissed the dragon furious. Where is the boy called Hiccup? The dragon furious was right, of course. The boy was there, soaring invisibly above the great dragon's head on the back of the deadly shadow. For one second, the dragon furious saw him. A burst of exploding thing fire must have caught the shadow off guard. For one moment he turned visible with the shock, and there he was, with Hiccup on his back, right in the dragon furious's searchlight eye beams. 
the dragon furious saw the deadly shadow. He was sure he saw it, and gave a cry of astonished rage. The dragon that he had sent to kill Hiccup, the dragon who claimed he hated humans as strong as acid, had turned his allegiance and was now helping the boy. How could this be? He had chosen this dragon most particularly for his hatred of human beings. He had chosen this dragon particularly because he was so like the dragon furious himself. But there was Hiccup, clearly outlined on the back of the shadow, kamikaze and fish legs beside him, three little hunting dragons hovering above like flies, and the three heads of innocence, arrogance and patience sending out lightning bolts in three different directions. How did the boy do it? What was it about him? The dragon furious spread wide his great blue wings and made a final despairing leap. One second, the hiccup boy on the back of the dragon was there. The next, the dragon turned the exact stormy grey of the sky. Dragon, boy and companions simply disappeared as the now invisible deadly shadow streaked across the sky. Dragon Furious's great jaws closed on nothing. His gigantic claws tore only on the air. He crashed back down into the dragon's graveyard, boyless and in despair. The dragon furious howled and plunged through the bay, flinging great boulders around, uprooting any living vegetation he could find, tearing up the airy grasses on the islands that contained no boy, his own tongue twisters and rage blasts of the rebellion whimpering like terriers and trying to stay out of the way. Finally, in one screaming blast of white-hot fire, the dragon furious incinerated the whole bay, annihilated it in the blaze of his defeated and baffled fury and then crouched down, panting in the middle of the blaze like a great blue cat, lying in the centre of the great nighttime graveyard of his fellow dragon's bones. Fear was in the blazing eyes now. Gone. The boy was gone. As the dragon furious's rage died down, he seemed to shrink in front of your eyes. That brilliant blue faded from his skin and became a more ordinary shade, he even curled up into a defensive ball like an ordinary fireside cat hiding his head in his dragon hands as if he did not want to use his own power of looking into the future. A human with a heart might have felt sorry for the great creature leaning his poor scarred head on the blazing fire of his own making like it were a pillow. One more chance gone, the dragon whispered, hissing to himself. Surely we cannot be facing extinction. Surely... That cannot be the dragon's fate at last. A great sea dragon, a thunderer, came joyfully to tell the news to Furious. The day is won, Furious! Dark heart is fallen! It was a glorious moment for the dragons. The Vikings had escaped. Just. The Vikings were lucky that any of them made it through the white-hot fury of the Dragon Rebellion assault that day. Only by valiant fighting, with the utmost skill of sword and shield and spear, did the Viking fleets escape, shooting and blasting their way through the numberless talons and teeth, the scorching devastation of the dragon's flames. Even then, it was with bloodied, burning boats, sails on fire, and many of their numbers lost. The company of the dragon mark made their way to the bog burglar islands, and the witch and her warriors to the ugly thug lands in the east. But the dragons had dark heart at last. So the Thunderer was surprised to find Furious in such abject misery. Furious, what is wrong? Surely this is our finest hour. You do not understand, growled Furious. The boy Hiccup has escaped. But one human boy, said the Thunderer in surprise. Surely one little human boy, so small, so pink, no talons, no fire... Surely one little human boy cannot matter so very much. This is no ordinary boy, replied Furious. And then he uncurled himself and rose up, slowly, dangerously, like a phoenix from the ashes. His body began to burn bright again. He must never grow up, vowed the dragon Furious. He must never reach the island of tomorrow. Never again shall I make the mistake of entrusting his killing to someone else. 
panted the dragon furious. This time, I will kill him myself. I shall seek him everywhere. I shall tear the world apart looking for him. Nowhere shall be safe for him. No cave, no cliff, no rock, no island. I shall turn this whole world to ashes looking for him. Hear the pledge of the Dragon Furious, screamed the Dragon Furious, his whole body screeching with fury, so much so that even his eyeballs began to smoke and pour out flame. And then he bent his head backwards, sending fire upwards with the scream like an erupting volcano. The boy shall never reach tomorrow. Thirty one. The Secret Hideout. Somewhere not very far away, I don't want to tell you exactly where because it is Hiccup's secret hideout and it really, really needs to be kept a secret. The Windwalker was lying in front of a cave surrounded by brambles. He had been lying there protecting the entrance for nearly three days now, and he was a bedraggled wet sight his ears drooping sadly, his spines all limp and floppy with loneliness as he listened to the sound of the dragon Furious's rage. And then he sniffed the air, he peered upwards, his ears pricked up in sudden apprehension. And so too would yours if a semi-visible cloud descended down out of nowhere and slowly turned into a terrifying-looking, heavily armed, three-headed, deadly shadow dragon. However, Hiccup peered over the side of the deadly shadow's wings and shouted down, Don't worry, Windwalker, it's only us. The Windwalker sprang to greet the horror of the deadly shadow descending towards him, flying round and round and round it in wild, excited joy. So late that night, the little cave, whose whereabouts shall remain a secret, was very full indeed, for even when the shadow camouflaged himself so well he looked invisible, he didn't get any smaller. He was a very large dragon, and once he was inside the cave, there was barely room for everyone else. The Windwalker had gone out every single day and caught plenty of fish in the hope that they would return. So that was a joyful and triumphant evening, with everyone back together again, recalling the triumphs and successes of the day. Yeah, yeah, yes, Stormfly, sang Toothless happily. Woden's Fang, the Desperado, and I uh, shot our way out of those amber nets. Pew, 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 with three bursts of our super strong flame and... And so on. Meanwhile, Stormfly flashed her wicked eyes at him and ate half his mackerel. Manners, sniffed the Woden's Fang disapprovingly. The ten companions stuffed themselves full with fish that night, ate until they could eat no more. What with the food and the emotion of the day, Hiccup and the others were almost drunk with happiness, in fits of laughter about the smallest things. In times of war and deadly peril, these moments of happiness are heightened. They become even more pleasurable, even more precious. Hiccup was one of the last to fall asleep but then he woke again at the sound of the dragon furious demolishing prison dark heart and turning it to rubble. That woke him, and suddenly all the warmth and the happiness of the evening seemed to disappear, to be replaced by a cold dread and a thumping of his heart. The others were all so exhausted, they were still fast asleep, but blink, blink, the twin eyes of the warden's fang opened on Hiccup's chest, and the eye beams shone comfortably into Hiccup's own eyes. The warden's fang seemed to guess immediately what Hiccup was thinking. He started chatting to cheer Hiccup up. You see, said the warden's fang, I told you your quest was quite simple. See what can be achieved if your heart is in your quest. You have found your friend. You have found the jewel. Um... Even though it has fallen into Alvin's hands for the moment, I am sure that it will come back to you again. The warden's fang tried to sound more sure of this than he was actually feeling. And you are no longer so alone. Look how full this cave is. You have your human companions now. He gestured with his wing to fish legs and kamikaze. Not to mention all the followers your splendid mother has brought you with her dragon mark, what a magnificent warrior she is, said the warden's fang admiringly. Anyway, said the warden's fang, as I was saying, the rest of the quest should be a piece of fish cake, 
Now all the lost things are found. All you have to do is present yourself at the island of tomorrow. Get yourself crowned king instead of Alvin the Treacherous. Learn the secret of the jewel and use it to persuade the Dragon Furious to call off this war. See what I mean? Easy peasy, Viking squeezy. Hiccup was not to be so easily comforted. You've forgotten a few important details, Hiccup reminded him. I just heard the dragon furious, and something tells me he's going to be impossible to persuade. And Alvin the Treacherous has nine of the lost things, which might make the tomorrow men think that Alvin is the true king. I only have one, and Alvin has the dragon jewel. And we know what kind of man Alvin is. He would use the jewel's power to destroy the dragons without even blinking. Ah, oh, but Alvin won't do anything with the jewel yet. "'said the warden's fang. "'Alvin needs that jewel to take to tomorrow "'if he wants to become the king himself. "'And only if he became the king "'would he learn the jewel's secret. "'We are perfectly safe. "'For the moment, admittedly.' "'Hiccup sat up on his bed of grass, "'filled with sudden, desperate anxiety. "'He looked straight into the warden's fang's brown eyes earnestly. "'Doesn't it worry you, warden's fang?' that I only had the dragon jewel for a few minutes before it fell into the hands of Alvin the Treacherous. The warden's fang said nothing. I've just been worrying and worrying about it. Do you remember the last time you trusted a human with the dragon jewel, Hiccup the First, and how eventually it fell into the hands of Grimbeard the Ghastly? What if this is history repeating itself? It does seem that I collect all these things, but they all end up in the hands of Alvin the Treacherous. Maybe you shouldn't be trusting me, warden's fang, said Hiccup. What if the dragon furious is right? He told me that I would be the one who sent the dragons into their final oblivion. Maybe that's because I'm going to collect all the lost things and then Alvin is going to use them to destroy the dragons. Hiccup covered his face in horror. I can't bear to think of it. But that is what the deadly shadow said, that Alvin could not get hold of the jewel without me finding it for him. If that is true, then is it all going to be my fault? It was a truly dreadful thought. A world without dragons. A world with no wind walker. No more flying on his back. No more soaring into the clouds in slow beats of the wind walker's wings. Up, up, up. And looking down on the islands of the archipelago, sprinkled way, way down below. A world without Toothless perching on your arm, giving you that naughty look, opening up his green-gauge eyes so innocently as he tells you that he's going to do something you wanted him to do. He purr, purr, promises, cross his claws and hope to die, and then flies off and does precisely what he wants. No, it was too horrible to think about. And all to be Hiccup's fault? No. And again, no. Never, never, never. But then again... Things can go awry, even if you have the best of intentions. Nonsense and fiddlesticks, replied the warden's fang. You are young. Leave these worries to us old creatures. I trust you, Hiccup. Besides, don't forget, Alvin the Treacherous doesn't have all the lost things. You still have one of them, one that you have always been able to hang on to. He pointed with his wing at Toothless. Toothless was fast asleep curled up reassuringly warm and solid and heavy and alive on Hiccup's tummy and snoring great grey smoke rings. So he made them both jump when he said loudly and clearly in his sleep, Yes, I am a lost thing, and I'm the most important one of all. Thank you. Manners. That made both Hiccup and the Wodensfang laugh, and Hiccup fell asleep at last. But it was the Wodensfang who could not sleep now. Eventually, he flew to the entrance of the cave and curled into a little wrinkled ball, looking up at the night sky. I have to confess, said the warden's fang to the stars. This is worrying me a trifle, too. What can I do to prevent this from happening? Am I right in trusting the boy? It didn't seem possible that a world without dragons could ever exist. Look at the world. Filled with dragons everywhere, dragons of all shapes and sizes. The great ones, larger than the big blue whale, half swimming, half flying through the oceans. The tiny little nano-dragons, hopping through the heather in their numberless multitudes. The cliffs and their mazy rocks beneath, just teeming, bursting, overflowing with the abundance of dragon life. 
Such was the generosity of nature and the multiplicity of dragon species. Surely it could never happen. The stars looked down on the warden's fang, winking at him, just as they had done for thousands of years. And, of course, the stars made no answer. So the warden's fang answered his own question. Perhaps I am a foolish, fond old dragon who never learns from his own mistakes. But I have to believe that the humans and the dragons are capable of living together. I have to hope that the impossible can be possible. I have to trust in the boy and hope for the best. Epilogue by Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. Last night I did not sleep well. I am an old man, and I dreamt I went back to the amber slave lands, flying over those windy sands like I was the deadly shadow, following a set of footprints across the desert desolation. At first I thought they were the footprints of the monster, and then I realised they were the footprints of my childhood self. Eventually, I caught up with him, a scarecrow of a boy, struggling defiantly across those dreadful sands. And in this dream, a great wind had come up, and all around him the blackened, burning remains of Hiccup's past went bowling past. The houses of the hooligan village where he grew up, the skeletons from the dragon's graveyard, all blown away by the winds of the war that Hiccup had begun. But the boy still walked onwards, towards tomorrow. What was it my mother Valhalarama had said? Don't be too hard on yourself, Hiccup, if things do not turn out well in the end. I know what awaits Hiccup on tomorrow. So in my dream I tried to shout to the boy I once was, Go back! Do not go to tomorrow. Stay where you are. But of course, my boyhood self could not hear me. Stop! I shouted in my dream. But how could he hear me above the roaring of the wind that was blowing away the world all around him? And even if he could, it is already too late for him to go back. The winds of the amber slave land have already blown in the rebellion. They have torched the little hooligan village where I grew up. No one could live in those black, smoky ruins. And even if he could hear me, would I really want him to do anything differently? Would I really want the ticking thing to stop, for time to stand still, for Hiccup never to grow up, or to be something other than the boy he is? This is all his, sorry, my fault. But if Hiccup had not acted as he did, there would still be slaves in the Amber Slave Lands, Egengard would never have made it back to the arms of Bear Mama. The Dragon Furious would still be in chains. The world would still be back in the terrible, barbaric times of slaves and tyrants and witches and monsters with no hearts. You see, it was not only Hiccup who was growing up. It was the entire world around him. And when whole worlds grow up, that can be painful and difficult. Was it all worth the archipelagoan flames? I do not know. You decide. But Hiccup could not be anything other than the boy he was, and so his footsteps do not stop. They walk on. With every step, he is a little older than he was before, walking slowly towards me and into tomorrow. The chapter in my life that Hiccup has just walked through has been a story of three mothers, Valhalarama, Bear Mama, and Termagant. Of how even when they are not there, when we cannot see them, when they are parted from us by quests or by slavery or even by death itself, they are still watching over us, yearning for us, loving us, though they lurk in the clouds as invisible to our eyes as the deadly shadow. Far away, by cold campfires, they are thinking of us, dreaming of us, loving us long distance. Fishlegs' mother could not come back to hold him. She had gone behind that glass wall of death, but still she held up her hand from behind the glass and pressed it up to Fishlegs' hand and willed him to be alive, to walk, to laugh, to love. 
as if she could breathe life into him, as if she could be there with him, as if she could pass through the glass with the sheer hopeless longing of her love. And perhaps she was still there to love him. Termagant's eyes had once shone into the six eyes of the deadly shadow. The reflection of those eyes now shone back into the eyes of fish legs, so it was almost as if, sometimes, she herself were looking back at him. When the shadow dragon pressed itself protectively against fish legs, it was an echo of the embrace that Termagant had given that same shadow dragon once long ago. The past never really leaves us. And now I am an old, old man. I hover over my childhood self as if I were a dead mother and I am anxious for Hiccup's future because I already know it and I want to protect the boy from pain. But I am happy too because I know the future is a curious mixture of joy and sadness. So suddenly I throw away my fear and I no longer shout stop. I am shouting something slightly different now. Walk on, Hiccup. Have courage. Walk into tomorrow. And I will meet you there at Hero's End. shall never reach tomorrow. Oh dear, now things are looking even worse than they were at the end of the last book, and the dragon Furious has sworn to kill Hiccup himself. What path will Snotlout take? Will he follow the witch, or will he go with Hiccup? How will the ten companions of the Dragon Mark stop Alvin now that he has nine of the king's lost things? They must all make their way to tomorrow for the final confrontation. Can Hiccup save the dragons from extinction? Watch out for the next volume of Hiccup's memoirs, How to Betray a Dragon's Hero. <laughs> You don't have to read the Hiccup books in order, but if you want to, this is the right order. 1. How to train your dragon. 2. How to be a pirate. 3. How to speak dragonese. 4. How to cheat a dragon's curse. 5. How to twist a dragon's tail. 6. A hero's guide to deadly dragons. 7. How to ride a dragon's storm. 8. How to break a dragon's heart. 9. How to steal a dragon's sword. 10. How to seize a dragon's jewel. 11. How to betray a dragon's hero. Learning to speak Dragonese. Toothless's guide to being p, -p, -p polite Moo lady, Yao Snodly Sniffer is Giganticus plus Warticus plus Wara I Pleasey Fur Sprouty Hug Dangles. Madam, you have a very large and lovely spotty nose, and what beautiful hairy arms. Toothless is a grief spotty me mischance fur fur flicker flame ta gob sprout. Twas a big time hiccup. I am so sorry that I accidentally set fire to your beard. It was a total mistake. Toothless mark to me mama most specially grief spotties. Toothless's runners pop in de cack cack de gore dragon, plus me press it much wide on de floor sheet. I make you my most heartfelt apologies. I seem to have stepped in gore dragon poo and trodden it all over your carpet. Ta ta toothless gogla ta scrugla we munch munch de salt sticks lonely wise. Tegla me ada. I can see you are having trouble eating all those oysters on your own. Let me help you. Nea, toothless na sa sa sporta da sprouty warm. Ta makami inta ungirly goo, 
Plus, me prefer my flame shooties cold over and me flip flaps lend into fork freezes. Thank ye, part a warm wishes. No, I will not wear that furry coat. It makes me look like a sissy, and I would rather my fire holes froze up and my wings turned into ice lollies. Thank you for your concern.